This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Chris Longknife, Mutineer, written by Mike Shepard, and read by Dina Perlman. Chapter One. There's a terrified child down there. Captain Thorpe's baritone reverberated off the hard metal walls of the Typhoon's drop bay. Marines, a moment before intent on checking their battle suits, their weapons, their souls for this rescue mission, hung on his every word. Ensign Chris Longknife divided her attention. Part of her stood back, studying the impact of his speech on the men and women she would soon lead. In her short twenty-two-year life, she'd heard a lot of fancy oratory. Another part of her listened to her commander's words, felt them roll over her, into her. It had been a long time since mere words had raised the hackles on her neck, made her want to rip some bastard limb from limb. The civilians tried to get her back. Chris measured his paws. He came in right on the downbeat. They failed. Now... They've called for the dogs. The Marines around Chris growled for their skipper. She'd only worked with them for four days. The typhoon had sortied on two hours' notice. Captain Thorpe had gotten them away from space dock, short half the crew, and without a Marine lieutenant to command the drop platoon. Now, a boot ensign named Longknife was surrounded by Marines, with three to twelve years in the Corps, champing at the bit to do something definite and dangerous. You've trained. You've sweated. The captain's words had the staccato of a machine gun. You've drilled for this moment since you joined the Corps. You could rescue that kidnapped girl with your eyes closed. In the dim light of the drop bay, eyes gleamed with inner fire, jaws tensed, hands closed in tight fists. Chris glanced down. So were hers. Yes, these troops were ready, all except one boot ensign. Dear God, don't let me screw up, Chris prayed silently. Now drop, Marines, kick some terrorist butt, and put that little girl back in her mother's arms where she belongs. Hoorah! Came back from twelve hyped men and women as the captain slow marched for the exit. Well... Eleven hyped marines and one scared ensign. Chris put the same angry confidence into her shout as she heard from the rest. Here was none of the calm, the cool of father's political speeches. Here was why Chris had joined the Navy. Here was something real, something she could get her hands on and make happen. Enough of endless talk and nothing done. She grinned. If you could see me now, father... You said the Navy was a useless waste of time, mother. Not today. Chris took a deep breath as her platoon turned back to their preparations. The smell of armor, ammunition, oil, and honest human sweat gave her a rush. This was her mission and her squad. And she would see that one little girl got home safe and sound. This child would live. As the memory of another child rose to fill her mind's eye, Chris stomped on the thought. She dared not go there. Captain Thorpe paused in his exit march, right in front of her. Eye to eye, he leaned into her face. Keep out of your head, Ensign, he growled in a whisper. Trust your gut. Trust your platoon and Gunny. They're good. The Commodore thinks you have what it takes even if you are one of those long knives. Show me what you've got. Take those bastards down hard. But if you're as empty as your old man, let Gunny know before you funk out on us, and he'll finish the mission. And I'll drop you back in your mama's lap in time for the next debutante's ball. 
Chris stared back at him, her face frozen, her gut a throbbing knot. He'd been riding her since she came aboard, never happy with her, always picking at her. She would show him. Yes, sir, she shouted in his face. Around her, the troops grinned, figuring the skipper had a few choice words for the boot ensign, none knowing just how choice. The captain snickered. A scowl or a snicker or a growl was all she'd ever seen on his face since coming aboard. Was there a different crinkle to his eyes, a new uptwist to his lips? He turned before she could read him better. It wasn't her fault father had signed all Wardhaven's legislation for the last eight years. She had nothing to do with her great-grandparents splashing the family name all over the history books. Let the captain try growing up in shadows like those. He'd be just as desperate as Chris was to make her own name, find her own place. That was why she joined the Navy. With a shiver, Chris tried to shake off the fear of failure. She turned to face her locker and tried again to adjust the standard issue size three battle spacesuit to fit. Six feet tall and too small everywhere else was her usual requirements for a suit. She'd never had a civilian suit that didn't leave her plenty of room for her pet computer to conform around her shoulders and down her arms. But those suits weren't semi-rigid plastisteel a centimeter thick. Nellie, worth more than all the computers on the Typhoon, and probably fifty times as capable, was a problem in battle armor. Marines were expected to be lean, as well as mean. Nothing extra was allowed anywhere. Chris tried slipping the main bulk of the computer down to her chest. She didn't carry much there, and most marine males seemed to be a bit bulky in that spot. Resealing herself in, she rotated her shoulders, bent, then stooped. Yes, that worked. She put on the helmet, rotated it until she got a firm click. With the faceplate down, the suit was a bit warm, but she'd been hot before. Chrissy, can I have an ice cream? Eddie wheedled. It was a hot spring day in Wardhaven, and they'd run to the park, leaving Nana well behind them. Chris fumbled in her pocket. She was the big sister. She was expected to plan ahead now, just like big brother Hanovi had done for her when she was just a little kid. Chris had enough coins for two ice creams, but father insisted that planning ahead included making things last. Not now, Chris insisted. Let's go see the ducks. But I want an ice cream now! came in as much of a wail as an out-of-breath six-year-old could muster. Come on, Nana's almost here. Race you to the duck pond. Which got Eddie's feet moving even before Chris finished the challenge. She beat him, of course, but only by as much as a ten-year-old big sister should beat a six-year-old kid brother. Look, the swans are back. Chris pointed at the four huge birds. So they walked along the pond, not too far behind the old man with the corn, who always fed the birds. Chris was careful to keep Eddie from getting too near to the water. She must have done a good job, because when Nana finally caught up with them, she didn't give Chris a lecture about how deep the pond was. I want an ice cream, Eddie demanded again, with the single-mindedness of his few years. I don't have any money, Nana insisted. I do, Chris put in proudly. She had planned ahead, just like Father said smart people should. Then you go buy the ice cream, Nana grumbled. Chris skipped off, so sure she would be seeing them again, that she didn't even look back. There was a tap at her shoulder. With a shiver, she turned to see a freckled face 
and raised her faceplate in time to be met with a, Need help, short fork? The drop bay was busy and noisy, and her shiver went unnoticed. She managed the cheery, No way, wooden spoon, reply the infectious grin and challenge demanded. Ensign Tommy Lee Chin Lean had been born to a family of Santa Maria asteroid miners. Rather than hang around that isolated world, he joined the Navy to see the galaxy, thereby greatly disappointing his folks and, per his great-grandmother, his ancestors. At officer candidate school, they'd passed hours swapping stories about how their parents had stormed and ranted against their career choice. Chris was surprised by how fast they became friends, one from super sophisticated Wardhaven, the other that crazy blend of Irish and Chinese that so much of Santa Maria's working class still held to. Right now, Tommy waved his universal tester in Chris's face. Raised in vacuum, he distrusted air and gravity and viewed mud-raised people like Chris as hopeless optimists, dependent on him for the proper paranoia toward space. Chris raised her left arm for Tommy to plug his black box into the battlesuit she'd been issued. While he ran his checks, Chris worked with Nellie, running her personal computer through interface tests with a command net. Auntie True, now retired from her job as Wardhaven's info war chief, had helped Chris with Nellie's interface, as she'd done with most of Chris's math and computer homework for as long as Chris could remember. Nellie lit up Chris's heads-up display with every report or screen authorized to a boot ensign on a mission, and a few it was better the skipper did not know Chris had access to. Chris and Nellie finished about the same time Tommy detached his tester from Chris. She flipped up her faceplate. Your camouflage adjustment is about five nanoseconds below optimum, but it meets Navy standards, Tommy grumbled. The Navy rarely met his expectations for perfection. Your coolant system wasn't all that far into the green either. I'm more worried about my heater. It's Arctic Tundra where I'm headed. Haven't you heard? She grinned. He refused to swallow his skull for her attempt at a Santa Maria brogue. And there's a bad gasket in there somewhere. They'd been over that one before. One of the battlesuit's jelly seals was a slow leaker. But every suit aboard had at least one bum seal. It was a bitter joke among the troops. Good seals went to the civilian market. Weak ones went to lowest bid government contracts. I'm not working the asteroids, Tommy. I won't be living in this suit for a month. Chris gave the standard reply the procurement chiefs gave her father. The Prime Minister of Wardhaven always accepted it. But then, he didn't do drop missions. Today, his daughter was... I'll only be in vacuum an hour. Two at the most. Sequim's atmosphere is good. Mud hen, Tommy answered in disgust. Space head, Chris shot back, giving Tommy one of his own trademark grins, then turned to the light assault craft that would be carrying her and her squad. It was the minimum vehicle that could get you from orbit to the deck, not much more than a heat shield that doubled as a wing, and a flip on top that was just there for stealth. Then again, Chris had raced in smaller skiffs. This check out, she asked, serious once more. Didn't I test it four times? Tommy grinned. Didn't it pass four times? Your humble servant will get you there which only left Chris struggling to keep hold of her temper. The Navy trusted the Marines to put their asses on the line, but not with the car keys. It would be Tommy's job to fly the two LACs from the Typhoon in orbit to the ground, all except for two or three minutes when ionization took the two LACs out of radio touch. And they'd be on autopilot for that. All the while, Chris and her 11 Marines were supposed to sit there, dumb 
and bored. That was just one part of the approved plan she would like to change. But a boot ensign does not change plans that her skipper and his gunny sergeant like. Help me on with my kit, she told Tommy. Along the bay, the platoon members were paired up, checking each other's suits, loading them up with weapons and drop gear. Corporal Santo went down Gunny Squad. Corporal Lee checked Chris's. Gunny would double check them. Then, Chris would triple check. Chris's load was a tad lighter than her teammates, since Nellie weighed in at half of a standard issue Navy personal computer while holding all the command, control, communications, and intelligence. C3I in military speak that an ensign could ask for. Still, hanging from her armor or carefully stowed in her pack were rocket-propelled grenades of many flavors, six spare magazines for her M6, half of them rounds of non-lethal intent, the others real ones, as well as water, first aid, and food. Marines never left home without lugging a ton of stuff. Fully loaded, again, Chris rotated her shoulders, twisted her hips, checked the load, if not for comfort, at least for problems. She'd carried more backpacking through the Blue Mountains on Wardhaven during college vacations. Those carefree months of outdoor living was one of the reasons she was here. Tommy eyed her as she did a deep knee squat and bounced back up. You good for this? Everything's in place, not too heavy. You good for this business? Rescuing a kidnapped kid? The grin was gone. She saw what the Santa Marian looked like serious. I'm good for this, Tom. I'm the best Navy small arms weapons qualifications on this boat. I've got the best Navy physical training scores, too. The skipper's right. I'm the best he's got. And Tommy, I want this. Ensign lean to the bridge came over the ship's MC-1, ending any further questions. Tommy clapped her on the back. The luck of the little people, and God go with you, he said as he headed for the hatch. No spare seat for him in an LAC, Chris shot back over her shoulder, another salvo in their long-running debate. But Chris was already trailing Gunny, rechecking the fall of gear, re-verifying weapons loads. She finished a second behind him. He went over her kit, and she went over his. He tightened one of her straps and growled. You'll do, ma'am. She found nothing to modify on him. She hadn't expected to. Gunny had practiced for this moment for 16 years that this was his first live-fire mission in all that time didn't seem to bother him or Captain Thorpe. Let's drop, team, Chris called to her loaned platoon. With a shout of, Oorah, the two squads turned in unison to face opposite bulkheads and board their two light assault crafts. Chris went down the line of her squad one more time, checking their restraining harnesses and the arrangement of their gear as they settled into their low seats in the LAC. All readouts showed green. Still, Chris gave each a good hard tug. That webbing was the only thing holding her troopers in. Satisfied, she settled her own rump onto the low composite seat in this minimum spacecraft and stretched her legs out ahead of her, careful to avoid the control pedals. The legs of the tech seated behind her surrounded her. Chris had once tried a toboggan. Mother had refused in horror when Chris asked to take a ride downhill. That toboggan was roomy compared to an LAC. She rechecked to make sure her harness was firmly attached to the LAC's narrow keel, checked again to make sure none of her gear was out of place, then pulled the canopy down, and felt it click into place. Like so much of the LAC, the canopy was paper thin. It added nothing more than stealth to the craft. Only their drop suits would protect Chris and her troops from the vacuum of space or the heat of reentry. 
The control stick began to rotate between Chris's legs. That would be Tommy, running tests. Still, the sight of it moving brought back good memories of some damn fine stick time of her own. She wiggled in her seat and felt the light craft respond to her movements, bigger than a racing skiff, but just as sweet. Chris banished those distractions by replaying the drop plan in her mind as she waited. These kidnapping sons of bitches had a simple plan. They'd snapped up the sequim general manager's sole child during a school outing, then dragged the poor kid off to the northern wilderness before anyone knew what had happened. Ignore the child's name. Much too familiar, only pain there. Quickly, Chris returned to tonight's problem. The approaches to the kidnapper's hideout were long, difficult, dangerous, and booby-trapped. So far, the bad guys had outsmarted and killed too many good people. Chris ground her teeth. How had cruds like these gotten their hands on some of the most sophisticated traps and countermeasures in human space? She could understand the traps— Humans now frequented planets with very nasty critters. And while she had never hunted big game herself, she was looking forward to this hunt for the most dangerous game. What frosted her was the legal bunk used by specialty stores to excuse their sale of measures and countermeasures that were only going to make her job damn dangerous tonight. Normal people didn't need electrocardiogram jammers, why would any good citizen need a decoy device to simulate a human heat signature? Blast it. Her suit was warm. Sweat was already running down her back. The day was so hot, the ice cream melted, even as Chris trotted toward the duck pond. Chris paused just long enough to give both ice cream cones a quick lick, then felt guilty. Eddie, I've got your ice cream she called as she hurried on. She hurried so much that she was well out of the trees and halfway across the vale to the pond before the wrongness of it got through to her. Chris came to a slow halt. Eddie wasn't there. The man with the corn had fallen, half in the water. The ducks gathered around him to pluck at the fallen grain. Two lumps of clothes doted the vale. In her nightmares that night, Chris would recognize them for agents who had been with her for years. But right then, her eyes were riveted on Nana. She had fallen down, her arms and legs splayed around like a rag doll. Even at ten, Chris knew that was all wrong for a real person. Chris began to scream. She dropped her ice cream cones as she tried to cram her hands in her mouth, bite down hard on knuckles, hoping the pain would wake her from this bad dream. Somewhere behind her, a voice shouted into a comm link. Agents down, agents down. Dandelion is nowhere in sight. I repeat, Dandelion is missing. A flashing red light grabbed Chris's attention. You did it again. She growled at herself as she yanked her thoughts back to the problem at hand. Around her, the drop bay ran through decompression. Air gone, Chris and her troopers breathed only what their drop suits provided. Chris checked all her readouts. Her suit was good, as good as Navy issue got. So were all of her troopers. Good to go, she reported. With a thump to Chris's rear, the LAC fell into silent, black space. Tommy let them drift for only the moment it took Chris to get a good look at the typhoon. Her smart metal hide stretched thin to give the crew individual rooms and spin gravity while in orbit. Her bow and stern was proudly painted with the blue and green flag of the Society of Humanity. Then the LAC came alive. The stick moved as Tommy guided both LACs into re-entry. Well, if Tommy was doing the work, Chris could use the time to check the ground situation once more. Nellie, show me the real-time target feed, Chris subvocalized. 
The hunting lodge filled Chris's heads-up display. Several dozen human shadows showed on the infrared detection. Six or eight moved around the building, all in pairs. Per the guarantee provided with every human heat decoy sold, there was no way Chris was supposed to know that only five real humans were moving. Thank God the manufacturers had so far stuck to the pledge of silence the government had extracted from them. For ten years, no bad guys had tumbled to the fact that 98.6 degrees was only the average human temperature. This late at night, most people's body heat was slipping down into the 97s and 96s. In the six upstairs rooms of the lodge, the heat signatures of six little girls lay chained to their beds. Two gunmen sat at opposite ends of the hall, ready at the first sign of rescue to dash into the one room that held the kidnapped girl and kill her. Thanks to the sensors on the 50-gram stool pigeon hovering 1,000 meters above the log cabin, Chris knew there was only one gunman and which room held the terrified girl. Terrified. Chris ground her teeth, then looked out of the LAC to rest her eyes on the planet revolving slowly below her. She tried to do anything but touch the nerve that took her again into her little brother's grave. At least these kidnappers had not buried their victim under tons of manure with a damaged air pipe, the only lifeline to the world for a six-year-old kid. At school, Chris had overheard other students talking, saying that Eddie was dead hours before her parents paid the ransom. She didn't know the truth of that. There were some reports she just couldn't read, some media coverage she could never sit through. What could never be ignored for a moment were the what-ifs. What if Chris hadn't gone for ice cream? What if the bad guys had had to take down Nana and Eddie and Chris? What would a wild ten-year-old girl have done to their plans? Chris shook her head, willed away the images, stay there too long, and tears came. A spacesuit? was no place for tears. Chris focused on the planet below. The day terminator lay ahead, changing the green and blue cloud-shrouded globe to dark, darkness and storms. A surprise night drop needed thunder to cover the sonic booms, darkness to hide their approach, night to make guards inattentive. Chris smiled, remembering other planets she'd watched from orbit, a fast racing skiff under her. And her smile slid into a scowl, as the memories she'd been struggling to hold at arm's length for a week came flooding back. Father vanished from Chris's life the day after Eddie's funeral. Off to the office before she awoke, he was rarely home before her bedtime. Mother was something else. You've been a little savage long enough, Time to make a proper young lady out of you. That didn't get Chris off the hook for winning soccer games for father, or showing up for his political parties. But Chris quickly discovered proper young ladies not only went to ballet, but also accompanied mother to teas. As the youngest at any tea by 20 years, Chris was bored silly. Then she noticed that some women's teas smelled funny. It wasn't long before Chris got a chance to taste them. They tasted funny, too. But they made Chris feel better. The parties go faster. It wasn't long before Chris found what was being added to their tea and how to raid her father's liquor cabinet or mother's wine closet. Somehow, the drinking made the days endurable. Chris didn't even care when her grades took a nosedive. It didn't matter. Mother and father only frowned. Other kids at school had fun things like skiff racing from orbit. Chris had her bottle. Of course, the bottle and the pills mother's doctor prescribed to help Chris be more ladylike did not help her soccer game. The coach shook his head and sidelined her as much as he could. 
Harvey, the chauffeur, who took her to all the games, just seemed kind of sad. But Harvey was grinning the afternoon he picked Chris up from school late. Your dad's invited your great-grandpa Trouble to dinner tonight. General Torden is on Wardhaven for meetings, Harvey added before she asked. Chris spent the drive home wondering what she'd say to someone straight out of her history books. Mother was in a snit, overseeing dinner preparations herself and mumbling that legends should stay in the books where they belonged. Chris was sent upstairs to do homework, but she staked out the balcony, reading with one eye and watching the front door with the other. Chris wasn't sure what to expect. Probably someone ancient, like old Ms. Brackett, who taught history and seemed dry and wrinkled enough to have lived it. All of it. Then Grandpa Trouble walked through the front door. Tall and trim, gleaming in undress greens, he looked like he could destroy an Aitichi fleet just by scowling at them. Only he wasn't scowling. The grin on his face was infectious. Mother was right. He was totally inappropriate for a proper legend. And at dinner, the stories he told. After dinner, Chris couldn't remember a single one of them, at least not completely. But during supper, they were all funny, even those that should have been horrifying. Somehow, no matter how bad the odds were or how impossible the situation had been, Grandpa Trouble made it sound terribly funny. Even Mother laughed, despite herself. And when supper was over, Chris managed to dodge Mother until she excused herself for her whist club. Chris wanted to hang around this wondrous apparition forever. And when they were alone, and he turned his full attention to Chris, she knew why kittens curled up in the sun. Your dad tells me you like soccer, he said, settling into a chair. Yeah, pretty much, Chris answered, seating herself ladylike across from her grandpa and feeling very grown up. Your mom says you're very good at ballet. Yeah, pretty much. Even at 12, Chris knew she was not holding up her end of the conversation. But what could she say to someone like her grandpa? I like orbital skiff racing. Ever do any racing? Nah, some kids at school do. Chris tasted excitement. Then she remembered herself. But mother says it is much too dangerous and nothing for a proper young lady. That's interesting, Grandpa Trouble said, leaning back in his chair and stretching his hands upward. A girl won the junior championship for Savannah last year. She wasn't much older than you. She wasn't? Chris stared, wide-eyed, even from Grandpa, she couldn't believe that. I've rented a skiff tomorrow. Want to take a few drops with me? Chris fidgeted in her chair. Mother would never let me. Grandpa brought his hands to rest on the table, only inches away from Chris's. Harvey tells me your mom usually sleeps in on Saturday. I could pick you up at six. Later, Chris would realize that Grandpa Trouble and the family chauffeur were in cahoots on this. But Chris had been too excited by the offer just then to put two and two together. Could you? Chris yelped. She couldn't remember the last time she'd been up early on her own. She also couldn't remember the last time she'd done something that wasn't on mother or father's to-do list. She couldn't remember, because to do that would be to remember what life was like with Eddie. I'd love to, she said. One thing, Grandpa Trouble said, reaching across the table to take her small, soft hands in his tanned, calloused ones. His touch was almost electric in its shock. His eyes looked into hers, stripping away the little girl that faked it for so many. Chris sat there with nothing but herself to hang on to. Your mother is right. Skiff racing can be dangerous. I only take people riding with me who are 
Stone cold sober. That won't be a problem for you, will it? Chris swallowed hard. She'd been laughing so hard at Grandpa Trouble stories that she hadn't stolen a drink at supper. She hadn't had one since lunch at school. Could she go through the night? It won't be a problem, Chris assured him. And somehow, she made it. It wasn't easy. She woke up twice crying for Eddie. But she thought about Grandpa and all the stories she had overheard from the school kids about how fun it was to see the stars above you and ride a falling star to Earth. And somehow Chris didn't tiptoe downstairs to Father's bar. Chris made it through that night to stand at the top of the stairs and look down at Grandpa Trouble, so magnificent in his green uniform, waiting patiently for her on the black and white tiles of the foyer. Balanced careful as ever, she did in ballet class, Chris went down the stairs, showing Grandpa just how sober she was. His smile was a small, tight thing, not at all the open-faced one father flashed all his political friends. Grandpa's tight little smile meant more to Chris than all she'd gotten from her father or mother. Three hours later, Chris was suited up and strapped into the front seat of a skiff when Grandpa Trouble hit the release and they dropped away from the space station. Oh, what a ride. Chris saw stars so close she could almost touch them. The temptation came to pop her belt, to drift away into the dark, to fall like a shooting star and make whatever amends she could to dead little Eddie but she couldn't do that to Grandpa Trouble after all the trouble he'd gone through to get her here. And the beauty of the unblinking stars grabbed Chris, enveloping her in their cold, silent hug. The pure, lean curves of skiffs on reentry were mathematics in motion. She'd lost her heart, and maybe some of her survivor's self-loathing. Mother was actually pacing the foyer when they came in late that evening. Where have you been? Was more an accusation than a question. Skiff racing, Grandpa Trouble answered, as evenly as he told jokes. Skiff racing, Mother shrieked. Honey, Grandpa Trouble said softly to Chris, I think you'd better go to your room. Grandpa, Chris started, but Harvey was taking Chris's elbow. And don't you come down before I send for you, Mother enforced Grandpa's suggestion. And what did you think you were doing with my daughter, General Jordan? Mother said coldly, turning on Grandpa. But Grandpa Trouble was already heading toward the great library. I think it best we finish this conversation out of earshot of little pitchers with big ears, he said, with all the calm Mother lacked. Harvey, I don't want to go to my room, Chris argued, as she and the chauffeur went up the stairs. It's best you do, little friend, he said. Your mother's been stretched quite a ways today. There's nothing to be gained by you pushing her any further. Chris never saw Grandpa trouble again. But a week later, Judith came into her life a woman Grandpa Trouble would probably have enjoyed meeting. Judith was a psychologist. I don't need a shrink, Chris told the woman flat out. Why'd you throw the soccer game last month? Judith shot right back. I didn't, Chris mumbled. Your coach thinks you did. Your dad thinks so too. How would father know? Chris asked, with all the sarcasm a 12-year-old could muster. Harvey recorded the entire game, Judith said. Oh. So they talked, and Chris found that Judith could be a friend. Like when Chris shared that she wanted to do more skiff racing, but Mother would have kittens at the very thought. Instead of agreeing with Mother, Judith asked Chris why Mother shouldn't have a kitten or two. The thought of Mother with a kitten made Chris laugh, which needed an explanation. And before they were done, Chris had come to realize that what Mother wanted wasn't always the best, and that the mother of a 12-year-old girl should have kittens occasionally. 
Chris went on to win Ward Haven's Junior Championship, to the Prime Minister's delight and Mother's horror. Get out of your head, Chris growled in Captain Thorpe's voice and yanked tight on her restraining harness, a life-affirming act that now came naturally to her. Then Chris's stomach shot into her throat as her lander turned dervish, spinning to the right as the bottom dropped out from underneath her and the still-blasting thrusters rose above. What the hell? Who's driving this bus? rattled in her ears as Chris grabbed for the wildly gyrating control stick. Aft, Corporal Lee restored discipline with a pipe down. The stick fought Chris, refusing to obey. She punched her comm link to the typhoon. Tommy, what the hell is going on? Her words echoed empty in her helmet. Her comm link was as dead as she and her crew would be if she didn't do something. Fast. Mashing the manual override, Chris took command of her craft. With hardly a thought, her hands went through the motions needed to dampen down the spin and pitch. The LAC was heavier, slower to respond than a skiff, but Chris fought it, and it obeyed. That's better, came from one of the grateful Marines behind her. Unless Chris figured out fast where they were and where they were going, this momentary better just meant they'd be less shook up when they burned on reentry. Nellie, I need skiff navigation and I need it now. In a blink, the familiar skiff routines took form on her heads up. Nellie, interrogate GPS system. Where am I? The LAC became a dot on her heads up. Vector lines extended from it. She'd been accelerating rather than decelerating. Corporal, get a line of sight link to Gunny's LAC. I've been trying, ma'am, but I don't know where he is. Her computer could probably tell Chris where the sergeant should be with respect to them. But Nellie was doing her best to plot a course that would win Chris another championship. They didn't hand out skiff trophies just for hitting that dinky ground target. They expected winners to do it in style, be on the dot, use less fuel, take less time. Chris gulped as her heads-up display filled with the harsh challenge ahead. The LAC was out of position and lower on fuel than any skiff she'd ever flown in competition. It would take every ounce of skill Chris had to land her Marines anywhere within a hundred kilometers of one terrified little girl. Chris had raced for trophies. Tightening her grip on the stick, she began a race for a little girl's life. Chapter Two Chris acted more on trained instinct than rational thought. Her right hand firmly on the stick, she first stabilized the craft. That done, she spared a second for Nellie's search to get Chris and her Marines down safely. Thank God she'd kept Nellie and refused the standard-issue computer with all its Navy limits. Nellie, get our present coordinates from GPS. Use the hunting lodge for a target. Now, give me a low-risk flight plan. Nellie did it in hardly a second. It would get them down safely, but on fumes and 50 clicks past the lodge. Even as Chris adjusted her deceleration burn to fit that trajectory, she snapped. Alternate flight plan. Assume I can bleed off an extra 20% of my energy aerodynamically. How much fuel would that leave me? Chris had to have a cushion. In competitions, each skiff had a two-minute separation between the one ahead and the one behind. Today, Gunny's LAC was somewhere off to her right, no more than ten kilometers, probably less. That might be an acceptable safety margin if Tommy was flying both of them to their drop point. But not now, not with Chris careening all over low orbit. Nelly, add in the assumption that I need a hundred kilometers north separation from Gunny's LAC. In a blink, Nelly modified the latest flight plan, but the result flashed red. Even assuming Chris cut her orbital burn to the bone, 
There was no way she could aerodynamically dissipate enough energy. She'd have to overshoot the target by a good hundred clicks. Assume 20 kilometers displacement, Chris reordered. Her first S-curve would have to be away from Gunny's LAC. Nellie quickly generated the requested flight plan. Chris could make it. However, a yellow button on the heads-up flashed a warning. Her fuel reserve would be below competitive standards. She would be disqualified. With a rueful shrug for the machine's concern, Chris said, Do it, Nellie, and settled in for the ride of her life. Very early, Chris had learned that every computer-generated course could be improved upon by a human. To take home those trophies scattered around her room, she'd saved a little fuel here, a little more there, always on her own. Sir, I mean, ma'am, I think I see the sergeant. Corporal Lee's voice was a series of nervous squeaks and cracks. Chris was rooted to her machine. Her hand had merged with the control stick. Her rear was part of the heat shield and wings fabric. Chris's eyes might as well have been the angle of attack, G-meter, and speed gauges. To break the concentration now would be agony. Where, Corporal? Off the starboard bow. Two, no, two thirty, ma'am. Low one, one thirty. I think that's him, ma'am. Chris risked a glance. Yes. There was an LAC, a bit ahead and below her, still breaking just as she was now. Try to raise Gunny, she ordered, and went back to flying a miracle. What I'm getting is all broken up and crackling, ma'am. Right, Chris kicked herself. His engine ionization is between us. A moment later, it was time to terminate the burn. She rotated her craft, placing its heat-shielded nose to the atmosphere, and got ready to ride it down. Lee made several more attempts to contact Gunny, but LAC-2 was still breaking, pointing its ionized exhaust at them. Chris told him to stow it as the nose of her LAC began to wrap itself in dancing light. Now came the hard part. Here, a good skiff driver made up for the fuel she'd saved, if she did it right, and dropped her boat on the dot. Diving, Chris plunged her craft quickly and hot into the atmosphere. Then she put the LAC into gentle, or maybe not so gentle, S-curves to bleed off that extra energy. Chris gauged them through narrow eye slits. She had to keep the heat shield between the searing ionized airflow and her very burnable body cut the curve too tight, and hot gases would take her and her marines heads off. Cut it too loose, and she'd overshoot by kilometers. Chris had learned these moves when it was only a game, and when she flew one of the best skiffs built on Ward Haven. Now, Chris honked her craft over on first one side, then the other, a craft she knew nothing about. Chris had pre-flighted this rig, no trained pilot put her butt into an air vehicle without first giving it a thorough checkout. But she had never flown it. She recognized the manufacturer's name emblazoned on the cockpit. They had a reputation for building good boats, but once in a while, their quality control hiccuped. Chris's stomach twisted into knots as tight as her grip on the stick. Was this LAC one of their good ones? Or was there a hidden flaw buried somewhere in the keel, on the wing support? If Chris pulled too many Gs, risked too much heat, would she break its back, send them all tumbling to a fiery death? Chris forced herself to complete calm, the better to feel every groan, every moan from the craft's tortured structure as she pushed it to its limits. Behind her, a marine broke into unfamiliar prayer, thanking his creator for the food he was about to receive. Someday we'll all laugh about this, Chris muttered on hot mic. If we live, she added only for herself. The LAC was hot. Despite the shielding, Chris could feel the heat through her suit, rising up to warm, then scorch her rear. The gauge confirmed it, 
she was well into the manufacturer's red warning zone. Out of the corner of her eyes, Chris measured the extra bend in the overstressed wing and growing flutter along its superheated, trailing edges. The LAC's flight had turned into a sluggish waddle through defiant atmosphere, worse than any skiff she'd flown. Still, Chris demanded more. She was above her approach path. Chris nosed her craft over, picking up speed and heat as she dropped like the proverbial lead brick. On path, but now too fast, she muscled her heavy lander into S-curves as tight as she had ever dared on a skiff, bleeding off energy, adding to her heat. Chris fidgeted in her seat as her skin cooked. The temperature readout, confirming the complaints of her own flesh, passed deeper into the red. But not too far, not if there were no surprises hidden in the structure of the craft beneath her. Ah, uh, ma'am, Corporal Lee whispered softly in Chris's earphone. My check back says your suit is awfully hot. You want to switch the blower and chiller to high, ma'am. Chris came back to herself just long enough to make the adjustments. Damn it, her suit back home would have done that automatically. But service suits were intentionally dumb, as a gunny sergeant at OCS had drawled. You don't want them doing nothing without your permission when unfriendly folks are shooting and all hell's broken loose around you. Can you still see Gunny? Chris asked Lee. I think he's still out there, ma'am, but it's kind of hard seeing with all these fireworks going on around us. Anybody sees Gunny, give a holler, Chris said, concentrating on her controls. Yes, ma'am, came back in several part harmony. It seemed like forever before the temperature gauge started to edge down. Chris tried to get a GPS report on her location, but she was still surrounded by too much ionization. The LAC's inertial guidance system insisted they were about where she wanted to be, and Nellie agreed. With a deep breath, Chris leaned back, tried to unknot every muscle in her body, and discovered it was a real kick flying this thing. I see him. There he is, chorused behind her. There's Gunny, ma'am, the corporal confirmed. A quick glance showed a falling star off to their right, maybe 30 kilometers, if Chris could trust her own judgment. With LAC-2 in sight, Chris let out a sigh of relief and put her stick over to bank closer. As she planned, Chris was subsonic and about three minutes out from the target. She had enough fuel for a few seconds of cruise if she needed it, but with a self-congratulatory grin, she knew she wouldn't. A moment later, Chris spared enough attention from the flight controls to aim her helmet and its line-of-sight antenna at Gunny's craft. Gunny, please advise the typhoon that LAC-1 has successfully re-entered. Chris waited a slow five count for a reply, then began to repeat her message. Roger, one. I have you on visual. Report your status, was Gunny's reply. I lost my uplink to the typhoon, can you patch me through to Captain Thorpe? I'd better. Ship's been screaming for you. Chris gritted her teeth and prepared for another nice talk with her least favorite military person. She hadn't long to wait. So glad you could fit us into your busy social schedule. Captain Thorpe's voice was the ice of space. Report your situation. I lost my uplink, sir. Lowest bidder, I presume. That was the skipper's perpetual beef. That and budget cuts. Gunny is patching me through to you. We are in position to execute the recovery, sir. There was a long pause. Chris could imagine Captain Thorpe reviewing the reports pouring into his bridge, weighing each one carefully to see what would make a certain Ensign Longknife's life the most miserable. I see that you are, Ensign. There was a shorter pause. Ensign Lean, can you acquire control of LAC-1? Negative, sir, came back quickly. Our downlink to LAC-1 is toast. I cannot fly that vehicle. Then we go with plan B, the captain said tersely. And Chris broke into a grin.
Chris had showed up at the planning session with a captain and gunny loaded with options to find the skipper grinning from ear to ear. I knew those tightwad civilians would holler for the dogs. I pulled in every chit I had to make sure we were the ship they got. Now we do this job right. No problem, sir. We'll show the fleet and those terrorists that the typhoon is the best, Gunny chortled. Chris was no respecter of kidnappers. She'd attended part of the trial of her brother's murderers. Add the IQ of all three of them together, and you still needed a negative number. However, sir, those terrorists have plenty of specialty gear, Chris pointed out. They've wiped out three rescue attempts. Those were civilians. Now they face Marines. Gunny's voice was deadly cold. A bunch of unshaven terrorists can't stand against what the typhoon is bringing to this party, Captain Thorpe said, with confidence, and laid out his plan. A stealthy night approach would let the Marines do a drop right in the kidnapper's front yard. The trigger pullers could pop their chutes and go straight to work. Chris swallowed hard and pointed out that a similar approach had been used in the last hostage rescue. She thought she left hanging clear in the air the question, do we dare try the same on guys with this much tech? She might as well have saved her breath. It worked, didn't it? Gunny snapped. Five bucks says we beat the time, dropped a last shot of the Cardinal's landing party for that hostage incident on Pale Up last year. I already bet the Cardinal's skipper a case of scotch we do, Thorpe grinned. Faced with that kind of confidence, Chris swallowed her own reservations. The three did a thorough review of all the recon feed. It showed no problems for a close-in jump. The skipper approved Gunny's close jump, and Chris said, Aye, aye, sir, like a good boot ensign, and went hunting for Tommy. But if Chris jumped now, her bird would make a very noisy hole in the tundra, sure to wake the sleeping beauties below. Chris had half expected orders to keep flying the LAC and let Gunny lead the platoon. Apparently, the Navy truly was averse to heavily armed Marines wandering around without an officer present. Plan B it is, Captain, Gunny replied on net. Chris echoed him, all grin out of her voice. Captain Thorpe cleared his throat. One last thing before we break this link. I am required to remind you, Marines, that this is not a slapdash search and smash mission. We have been invited by Sequim to assist their police forces. As such, you will operate under local law enforcement procedures. I expect you to take prisoners, not come back with a load of bodies. Chris keyed her mic. You heard the skipper. Those bastards have the right to face a jury of their peers. Then the people of Sequim can hang them. The troopers growled happily at that bit of information. Chris had done the search. Sequim had yet to ratify the capital punishment clause in the Society of Humanity's Human Rights Declaration. Chris's father had almost lost his chance at the prime minister's job because of the tactics he used to delay Ward Haven's ratification of that same clause just long enough for Eddie's murderers to hang. Strange, Chris could never think of little Eddie suffocating. But she had no trouble with his murderers dangling at the end of a rope. Done with talk, Chris did a quick check on the hunting lodge. The stool pigeon still circled. Its sensors reported all quiet. Sergeant, does Ensign Lean have me on sensors? Yes, ma'am. Tell him to tuck you in close behind me. I'm heading for the pond, five clicks north of the target. The pause was short. Ensign Lean says LAC-2 will conform to your movements. That would take some good flying. This was, after all, a dark and very stormy night. Chris aimed to set the LACs down in the shallows of a pond near the hunting lodge. From where she was at 20,000 meters, she could make out two or three nasty-looking storm cells between her and there. Nellie, connect to the local weather satellite. Interesting, the LAC's uplink to the typhoon was hashed, but Chris's own civilian comlink worked fine.
The weather feed let Chris plot a series of descending curves around the most dangerous of the storm cells. Still, the last 15,000 meters was bumpy. Rain lashed at the canopy, blurring Chris's vision. Her rain helmet would have been crystal clear. All the complaints about standard-issue equipment served up by the lowest bidder took on hard meaning as she peered into the darkness, trying to make out something before that something made a very big hole in her. Father, we have to talk. From behind her, Marines provided a chorus of groans, grumbles, and in general, wishes to get this damn thing on the deck. Chris's altimeter claimed a thousand meters between her and sea level when she broke out of the slope. More importantly, the Arctic tundra was supposed to be no higher than 650 meters around here, leaving Chris to do the happy math. However, the topo maps of the area reported enough hills, trees, and other exciting terrain features to make Chris wish she could dare a couple of radar sweeps. With bad guys as well-equipped as this bunch seemed to be, she doubted they lacked a radar detector or even a few radar homing missiles. No, using radar anywhere above their horizon was a dead giveaway. Death in this case was spelled with a little girl's name. Chris put her craft into gentle circles, each one lower, keeping her LAC just above stall speed. Corporal Lee reported LAC-2 out of the last squall and right behind them, three, maybe four kilometers back. Chris grinned. At least if she put her squad into a hill, Gunny would avoid their funeral pyre. Half of them would still arrive to take on the kidnappers. Right on schedule, Chris's low-light system detected the snag she'd chosen for the start of her landing way. Her LAC touched water hissing from residual heat, tossing spray as it bled off the last of its speed. She put the stick over as the craft started to settle. A moment later, she came to a jerking halt on a narrow, sandy beach. Corporal, pop a nightlight for Gunny, Chris said. As the canopy rose above her, she hit her restraint release. Throwing her legs over the LAC's side, she vaulted to the ground. Wow, was she pumped, a rush beyond any race. She opened her faceplate and drew in a deep breath, laden with the perfumes of water, night, and living things. It felt wonderful to be alive and breathing. She studied her squad as they stamped their feet, checked their weapons, brought their systems up. Okay, crew, we're down. I know a little girl who could use a hug about now, and some bastards who need a hard kick in the ass. Let's do it. The five Marines returned grim, determined nods. I'm coming, Eddie. I'm coming. Chapter 3 Gunny's LAC slid to a stop on the sandy beach ten meters from Chris, as Gunny and his squad readied themselves, Chris hiked over to them, stepping over driftwood and a half-eaten fish thing, and had Nellie beam Approach March B to Gunny. Long before the call came for the typhoon to drop everything and jump for Sequim, Chris had been following the kidnapping. It was the number one media event this month among the Rim Worlds. The betting in the wardroom had been two to one that Sequim would holler for the Navy when the second attempt went bust. Chris had put the bets down more to hope than expectation. Then, the third local effort to storm the cabin ended with two of their best trackers taking a dive off a 100-meter cliff into raging white water. That, 15 clicks from the cabin, was the closest the local police got. Chris figured the Navy would get a call, but she never expected the typhoon to answer it, or that she'd lead the platoon. But, as an old commander growled at OCS, Ours is not to reason why. Ours is but to do, and then fill out the paperwork. 
So, Chris had spent every waking moment for the last four days either preparing her platoon or planning this assault. Gunny and Captain Thorpe wanted a fast drop and grab, so Chris prepared for a fast drop and grab. Still, one of Father's rule ones was always to have a backup in your hip pocket. With little spare time on her hands, she drafted Tommy to help look for Plan B. That tundra looks mighty rough, Tommy said, studying the stool pigeon feed of the front yard they were to drop in. It's summertime. Tundra gets messy. The computer says it's within standards. Don't you trust the computer standards? Chris asked, with a nudge in Tommy's ribs. Nope, Tom answered, without looking up. If I, or someone I trust, haven't fed the computer the numbers, why trust it? So, you trust God, but not computers. And didn't my grandma Chin tell me to? he answered, without so much as a blink. Find me a back door to this place, Chris said. I could set the LACs down on this pond, and you could walk in from there, Tommy pointed out. Chris had been studying the pond and the ground between it and the hunting lodge housing the kidnappers. These woods show as much electronic noise as these other places where the civilians got themselves dead. Chris had memorized the electronic signatures of the three different spots civilian rescue teams had died. Their bodies were still there. No one would risk bringing them out. But isn't the swamp kind of quiet, I ask you? Chris pursed her lip, studying the mud and muck. Unlike some city kids, Chris had no illusions about how nice Mother Nature was in the raw. She'd split her last summer at university between running brother Hanovi's election campaign and hiking the rugged blue mountains of Wardhaven. Just the kind of place some lazy hoods might not bother with. But Marines and certain dumb boot ensigns like to play in the mud, Tommy grinned and got elbowed in the ribs, hard this time. But the point was made. There was an exit from the landing site. It took Chris another half hour to put all of Plan B in Nellie's memory. Now she laid out a soggy line of march to Gunny. He nodded. Tough, but nobody joined the Corps for easy. Chris signaled her tech specialist. Hanson, sniff the route I fed to your heads up. It was 10 p.m. by sequence 25.33 hour clock and going from gray, stormy day to dark, even this far north, when Chris's two squads headed into muck up to their waists. The going was slow. Battle suits kept the icy water out, even as the camouflage systems struggled to match the suits against the ever-changing backdrop. One poor marine suit gave up, head to toe. He was sand yellow, no matter what background he waded through. The suits kept the water out, but armor was thin insulation against a chill as cold as Gunny's heart. And whether the water was up to their waist or below their knees, each step still buried their boots in mud up to their ankles. To make matters worse, gnats, or some local equivalent, developed a taste for them. Chris slapped her faceplate down as her troops followed suit. Breathing became slow as they sucked against filters designed for nasty things a lot smaller than a gnat. As 2300 hours approached, Chris's tiny command was back on hard ground. She signaled a break while she, Gunny, and her tech examined the woods ahead. The trees here stood 30 meters tall, their greenery perched high on bare, scaly trunks much like the earth evergreen forests that had so quickly spread across the blue mountains of Wardhaven's temperate region. But unlike earth stock, these evergreens' needles ended in barbs. Chris's briefing didn't say how allergic her troops were to whatever was in those barbs, and she didn't want to find out. Keep buttoned up, she ordered. While the others rested, Hansen searched the woods for any sign of human life, booby trap, or general discomfort. The stool pigeon swept low, 
adding its contribution. There's a few big things here and there, Hansen advised, overlaying his sensor reports onto Chris's map. Probably nothing we can't handle, but it would make for a more exciting night than my recruiter ever promised, and mixing it up with party animals is bound to get the neighbors talking. Chris marked them on her team's charts with a no-go and asked what else. That got a shrug. Plenty of medium to little stuff. For the local furry residents, this is the time of year to make hay. Chris dismissed him with a, thanks. I'm coming, Eddie. The break seemed to have refreshed her troops. Chris's legs had gone from screaming to just hurting. I got to spend more time in the workout room if I'm going to hang with Marines. Around her, the night was deepening into solid dark. She was right on her schedule. Chris and her troops moved silently among the shadows of the sparse undergrowth. The Tex kept a lookout for human presence, but it was nature that got them. The rain had left everything with a sheen in the fading light, and slippery. Twice, a Marine went down. One was just embarrassed by her fall. The other ended up activating the pressure bandage at his suit's ankle. He continued with a limp, and teeth gritted against the pain. Half an hour later, Chris hand-signaled another halt about 100 meters before the trees petered out. While her troops settled in, she and Gunny inched forward carefully to get a personal look at the doors they'd come to kick in. The hunting cabin was a two-story log structure. The few small windows gave a good idea of just how cold the winter months were around here. A steep-roofed veranda covered the front and the back of the house. Infrared showed a half-dozen man-sized heat sources scattered front and back. However, night vision scopes showed only two of the six supposed guards to have a real human body to go with the heat. Chris brought the stool pigeon in as low as she dared, 500 meters above the house. Get too close, and even stealth gave a radar return. With two gunmen outside, Chris wanted a solid lock on inside target locations. Four in-house heat targets showed temperature variations. Chris opened her faceplate and whispered, Six targets. Gunny nodded. For 15 minutes, Chris studied the six as they slept. Only one, the guy on the back veranda, showed any action, and that was merely to clomp inside to visit the head. In the house, three men seemed pretty solidly asleep in beds. A fourth man on the upstairs landing, the appointed executioner, if any effort was made to rescue the girl, never moved from his chair. Pretty unprofessional, Chris observed. Negotiations had dragged out for a week, the main sticking point, a starship willing to take them wherever they wanted to go. No captain wanted to have anything to do with these bozos. If we'd followed my plan, my squad would have taken these duds before they even knew we were here, Gunny growled. With a shrug for what might have been, Chris waved Hansen forward to examine the 300 meters of cleared ground circling the lodge. From 500 meters, the lowest they dared risk the stool pigeon, it had identified nothing interesting about that plot of land. Up this close and personal, Hansen quickly spotted the hum of several low-powered batteries. What they powering, Gunny demanded. Working on that, Sarge? Not fast enough for Gunny. He ordered his own tech forward. Both took a few more minutes of fiddling with their sensor suite before Hansen let out a low whistle. Hyper-low power lasers, he whispered. A moment later, he had the frequencies. Chris adjusted her laser defense system and found herself looking at a cat's cradle of beams, crisscrossing the field, but only rising 25 or 30 meters. Nothing on the stool pigeon would have spotted these things unless it buzzed the field, and that was against policy. Damn, 
These fellows knew too much and were way over-equipped. Who the hell staked them for the upfront costs of this job and was telling them what to do? Then again, Sequim was a rich planet, and its manager had a wide range of investments in its wealth. Chris wondered who he was meeting with tomorrow to borrow the millions demanded to ransom his young daughter's life. Chris, raised the daughter of a cynical politician herself, expected there would be many offering help for minor considerations. Chris frowned. She'd never thought about who offered to loan money for Eddie's ransom and what collateral was demanded. Interesting thoughts for later. Hansen was still busy. He grinned when one of his sensors started blinking in several multicolored sequences. I got residue from the outgassing of C-12 and soft plastics, he whispered. Let me see that. Gunny barked softly and grabbed the instrument from the tech's hands. He frowned at the gadget, batting it on the side once, then studied it some more. Finally, he glared at the field. I don't see any digging out there. Didn't see any from orbit. Don't see any now. Mark 41 chameleon landmines, Chris suggested. They aren't issue yet, Gunny snapped. They just started up production. His words slowed as what he knew was possible fought with what he saw. Damn, if these sons of bitches have that kind of pull. He left the rest unsaid. There's mines out there, Sarge, Hansen said with surety. Rig to the lasers or just pressure, Chris asked. Your guess is as good as mine, ma'am, but I'd bet both. Chris took a good smell of the marshy tundra ahead of her. Rubbing her eyes, she studied the sky. Cloud cover was thick, but there was a graying light to the south. Dawn was an hour away. True, these fellows had a tendency to sleep until well after the sun was up, understandable when the sun was only down for three or four hours. Still, the guards were more restless come daylight and a single noise would change a sleeping watchman to a shooting one, with enough daylight to see what he was shooting at. Chris needed to get herself and ten fit marines across that last three hundred meters and get them across fast. Chris backed into the woods to face her team. Whose laser spotters are bust? she asked. A few moments later, four very embarrassed troopers acknowledged that the gear they'd so carefully nursed into operation in the loading bay was now dead weight. Chris's one bit of luck was that both her limper and her sand yellow were among the laser blind. She'd only have to leave four behind. You four are my fire support team. That, however, was only the start of Chris's problems. The two-millimeter darts of the M6 came in two flavors. One left you dead. The other was Colt Pfizer's best efforts at a sleepy bullet, a round with non-lethal intent. The M6 did not have cartridges. Once the range finder established the distance to the target, it automatically squirted an appropriate charge into the chamber. Still, there was a problem with sleepy bullets. If you put too much energy behind a dart, it shattered bone, artery, and brain. At 300 meters, the low-power sleepy dart was very subject to wind drift. The odds of it hitting anything were way past bad. Gunny, have the two best marksmen among those four load sleepy darts. The other two load live ammo. Gunny handed out firing orders with deft hand signals. If things get interesting, Gunny or I will say who and what gets fired, Chris told them softly, then decided it was time to make her own pre-fight statement. Remember, Marines, we're here as cops. These kidnappers have a right to face a jury of their peers, but Sequim still has the death penalty. We bag them, they hang them. With a happy growl, the Marines mounted up. Gunny's fire team led, reduced to him and his tech. Behind him followed in single file his corporal and a shooter. Chris led her squad off, Hansen with his gadgets ahead of her. Corporal Lee and a trigger puller brought up the rear. Gunny's tech went first, 
using her satchel of magic tricks to tell those following when to step high to avoid laser beams, when to edge right or left away from mines. Chris eyed one mine as she passed it. Its surface was a perfect match of the tundra surrounding it. At fifteen centimeters across and rising slowly to maybe one centimeter high, it left no shadow. It was, however, developing one telltale. The summer sun had warmed it. It now sank two or three millimeters into the tundra. Chris looked around. Now that she knew what to look for, she could spot a half dozen. No footprints, though. That was what she'd looked for from orbit, footprints on the fragile tundra. They must have dropped these from a chopper. Again, more expenses. Who was footing the bill for this? Chris badly felt the need for a shower, some coffee, and someone to talk over what had been thrown at her in the last few hours. There were patterns here, patterns that eluded her. Eddie didn't need pattern solved. Eddie needed rescuing. Chris concentrated on the problem at hand, hunched down halfway across a 300-meter minefield. She discovered a whole new meaning for naked and vulnerable. She watched her step. She watched the stool pigeons feed for action in the house. She watched the sleeping guards for any hint of wakefulness. Occasionally, she remembered to breathe. Re-entry had taken what seemed like a year. Chris aged centuries crossing the tundra in front of the lodge. When finally she was close, Chris signaled Gunny to take his squad around back. The front door was hers. It gave her a direct run at the central staircase and the upstairs gunman. Chris wanted her battle armor over that terrified child's body ten minutes ago. Whatever happened in the house after Chris got to the kid, harm would come to that little girl through Chris's dead body. Chris's luck ran out ten meters shy of the lodge. One of the sleeping beauties roused himself for a head visit. In his ambling, he wandered in front of the lodge's one picture window. Marines, we got action in the house, Chris whispered into her mic, as the guy stopped in front of the window to scratch. We start this show on my count. Gunny, you take down the back and pacify the downstairs. My squad will take care of the front and the upstairs. She paused for questions, just as the thug in the picture window yanked up his gun and went fully automatic at them. Fire support. Get that guy in the window. Corporal Lee, you get the sleeping guy on the front porch before he wakes up. Hanson, blow us a hole. Doing it, Hanson whispered, stuffing the end of a line charge into his grenade thrower and taking aim at the front door. Behind Chris, Corporal Lee's private took rounds, full in the chest. The force threw her a good five feet. She landed on a mine and got more airtime. Fire in the hole! Hansen shouted. Chris hit the deck, while her Tex grenade launcher went off with a whoosh, lobbing a charge at the front door and draping a line charge between her and said door. The door blew in. Then, like failing Christmas tree lights, the charges on the line behind it went off. Most just went pop. Three set off mines. Waiting just long enough for the explosives to blow, Chris dashed for the door. She was on it before it finished falling in. Chris struggled to catch her balance as she hurtled into the living room. The stairs were ahead of her. She could not see the upstairs gunman. Off to her right, one man collapsed under a hail of fire from across the yard, even while another man rolled off the couch gun coming up. Chris wanted the upstairs gunman, not this one. The nice thing about keeping company with Marines was that one of them was always behind you, always on backup. Ignoring the gunner, Chris raced for the stairs, gun up, magazine switching 
to sleepy darts. Eddie, I'm here. Halfway up, the sleeping gunman came in view. The racket was bringing him awake. His eyes popped open wide as he saw Chris's gun aimed right at him. His hands came up. Maybe he was going for his gun. Maybe he was just trying to fend off her fire. It didn't matter. Chris shot. Darts stitched up the man's chest, throat, and face, knocking him over backward. Chris reached the top of the stairs, did a hard left, and headed for the middle bedroom. Scream after scream came from that room. There was no question where the hostage was. Chris hit the door and bounced off. Hansen was right behind her. He slid to his knees at the door, jammed a wad of explosives in the lock, covered it with a flap of armored cloth, and ducked his head. The door blew open. Chris was moving before the explosion finished. That wasn't possible, but later, she'd swear she did. She flew in with the door, did a quick scan with her rifle to the right and left, then dashed for a tiny figure in torn jeans and a filthy green sweater. The girl was sitting half up in bed, yanking at her restraints and screaming at the top of her six-year-old lungs. All Chris wanted to do was hug the child to her chest, but there were rules in situations like these. She dropped to the floor. Something small and nasty-looking was attached by wires to the bottom of the bed. Hanson, we got a bomb here. Her tech slid to a stop on his knees, while Chris did a further check on the room. What looked like a school backpack had been reloaded with clothes and other junk. Chris decided it could be ignored for a moment. Otherwise, the room was as bare as its wooden floor, light green walls, and tan ceiling permitted. No closet. Chris turned back to the howling child just as Hansen finished his examination of the monster under the bed. Bomb, rig to the restraint. I pop them, it goes boom. Disarm it, came from Corporal Lee as he entered the room, trailed by his trigger puller, much the dirtier, but apparently no worse for wear from her encounter with live rounds and mines. You okay? Chris asked the private. She's fine, the corporal answered for his gunner. Landed on a mine flat on her back. If she'd stepped on it, it would have blown her foot off. As it was, it only tossed her around. Remind me to tell HQ their mines suck, Chris grinned. I'm ready to clip the leads on this thing, Hanson said, bringing them back to a child who hadn't quit screaming. If this doesn't go well... It would be nice if we had some armor between the kid and this bomb. Nothing would harm this girl. Chris gauged how much the little girl was bouncing around under restraints and slid herself onto the bed between the ragged blanket and the child. As Chris wrapped her arms around the girl, she stopped crying, though her breath came in short, choked gasps. Nobody's going to hurt you now, honey, Chris whispered in her ear. Nobody? The child said with a hiccup. Nobody, Hansen assured her. Now, everyone back in the hall. Once the corporal and private were gone, Hansen sighed. I think I got this right. He pulled his faceplate down and slid under the bed. For a long moment, nothing happened. Chris waited. Nothing still happened. Then... Hansen was getting back to his feet, raising his faceplate, and grinning like the man who broke the bank at Harrah's. Don't just stand there, Chris snapped. Cut the girl loose. Yes, ma'am, Hansen said, producing clippers. Lee and his gunner were back, forming a wall between the outside world and their little girl. Chris raised her faceplate. The Marines are here, honey. You're safe. Nobody's going to hurt you. The girl took it all in, her face sheet white and frozen, her eyes darting from one Marine to another. As Hansen freed the child's arms, the tension in her tiny muscles began to loosen under Chris's hug as she tried, really tried, to believe what this stranger said. If 
finally free, the girl rolled over and wrapped herself around Chris, buried her face in the hard battle armor, and gave herself over to deep, racking sobs. Ensign Longknife held her, protected her, and mingled in some tears of her own. Tears from a Navy ensign who'd saved a stranger's child. Tears from a ten-year-old who'd failed to save a brother. Above Chris, three Marines kept guard, guns out, grins proud. Way to go, Corporal Lee cheered. Way to go, Hanson echoed. God Almighty, God Almighty, the private repeated. How secure, Gunny reported on net. Tech verifies no dead man switch. One bad guy dead, five are cuffed and sleeping soundly. A few of the sleepy darts were at mighty close range. Some of these guys could use medical attention. Chris sniffed, then managed to stand without the kid losing a square centimeter of body contact. Very good, Gunny. Chris blinked her comlink to full local net. This is Ensign Longknife. The hostage is safe. Repeat, the kid is unharmed. Five bad guys are in custody, some injured. Request emergency medical backup. Warning, the ground around the target is mined. Do not land until we disarm them. Chris got acknowledgments from a half dozen police nets and the typhoon. Chris looked down into red-rimmed eyes, looking up at her. She hugged the girl tight. You are wrong, mother. The Navy's not a waste of my time. Some days are worth more than anyone could ever pay. Chapter 4 In a game simulation, Chris would have popped the game over button about now and gone out for pizza. In the real world, it's not over until it's over. And this one was far from over. The girl, so fragile and light in Chris's arms, mumbled, Edith, when asked her name. Right, that had been somewhere in Chris's briefing, but it was too close to Eddie for Chris to dare remember it. From the way Edith clung to Chris, you'd think they shared a heart. At the moment, Chris wouldn't deny that. The private threw the upstairs gunman over his shoulder. Corporal Lee and Hanson kept close to Chris and Edith as they worked their way downstairs. No one wanted to lose the girl to some surprise now. The private plopped his sleeper down in the living room next to two others. All showed blood where darts had hit them. Two bled freely. One shivered in apparent shock. Two awake prisoners huddled on the couch, hands taped behind them. A pool of blood in front of them showed where one body had been taken out back. Who's in charge? Chris demanded. The two conscious ones glanced around, as if just noticing the room. Martin, one muttered. The other pointed at the shivering sleeper. Gunny retrieved a wallet from that one and opened it. Martin had an Earth driver's license and social ID. Earth. What was an Earth crook doing out here? This situation was way past strange. But Chris had pressing housekeeping problems. Folks, she told her prisoners, there are landmines out there. I want them turned off. Who has the key? They just stared blankly at Chris. Get me their IDs. I want to know who we've got. Specialist, can you wake up our sleeping beauties? Hansen stepped over to the supine forms, gave each a shot, then started rocking the first one with his foot, a rifle in his face. Wake up, dude. You're in a world of hurt. Hansen smiled down cheerfully. His subject came awake with a cough, opened his eyes, took in the gun muzzle, and did his damnedest to roll away. That only put him hard up against the next terrorist's back. The tech got down and in his face. Who controls these mines? Martin, he has the codes, he answered, eager to please. 
Efforts to wake Martin only sent the heavy-set man from drugged sleep into out cold. This one's got a bad heart, Hansen reported. He needs a hospital, or we'll lose him. Gunny stooped to go face to face with one of the recently awakened sleepers. Where does Martin have his codes? In his pewter. I swear they are. The tech patted down Martin and pulled a banged up and aging wrist computer off him, liberally covered with blood. The tech tried to wipe it clean on his battle suit, but armor was meant to keep blood in, not wipe it away. He ended up wiping it on the couch before trying to turn it on. No activity there. He was fingering it when I darted him, Gunny growled. I think he wiped it, Hansen concluded. Chris had learned long ago that nothing in storage was ever quite gone, not if the right people went after it with patience. She took the computer and slid it into her pouch as she studied the field through the gaping door. Four of her marines were on the other side of a too-live minefield. Chris would risk no one now that Edith was safe. In theory, her techs could clear the field, but mines had no friends, and Chris was not about to see one of her crew hurt, even if a mom and dad were airborne, headed this way. This is Ensign Longknife. I have no way of turning off the landmines. Anyone on net have any assets for clearing mines? Several police nets gave her a negative. As Chris mulled her unacceptable options, her net boomed. This is Captain Thorpe of the Typhoon. We're inbound, 30 seconds out from the hunting lodge. We'll take care of that minefield. I suggest everyone dirt side get undercover. The troops around Chris exchanged puzzled glances. Hansen shook his head. The captain ain't gonna do that. Please, somebody tell me he ain't gone and done that. My gear's gonna be all over the place. He's 30 seconds out. I think he's already done it. Chris shook her head. He wouldn't. Not with me, Dirtside. I think he has, ma'am. Corporal Lee chuckled. Let's do what the skipper said, Gunny growled. It's gonna get noisy and messy hereabouts in a few seconds. While her troops got their prisoners headed for the back room, Chris made a quick call to her fire team and ordered them back, way back. Then she eyed the brightening sky through the front window, eager to see what was coming. The manual said the smart metal of the kamikaze-class ships could restructure themselves in several different ways. She herself had changed the typhoon from general travel to orbital mission, but that was done all the time. To change a starship into an air-capable vehicle, now that would take some rearranging. The clear blue sky let go with a high-pitched scream. Chris spotted a white contrail off to the southwest, headed her way in the morning light. She wondered how you made a house safe when a starship landed next to it not an evolution covered by any book she'd read at OCS. Gunny, pop the windows out, break the glass before it shatters. Right, ma'am. While her team went rapidly through the house, Chris scrounged several blankets and wrapped Edith in them. There's going to be a big noise. Don't worry, I've got you. Nothing can hurt you now. The child looked up at Chris with wide, accepting eyes. Then, if it was possible, she snuggled closer. Chris stationed herself next to a window to keep an eye on things both inside and out. The roar outside went from loud to painful. Chris lowered her faceplate. Looking like a winged bird from hell, the typhoon was aiming for the field in front of the lodge, coming in at about 400 knots. Half its engines were pointed down now. The overpressure out there was going to be nothing short of hellish. Chris held Edith tightly against the wall, assuming that her cowboy of a captain had calculated the full impact of the ship and mines on the house. What if he hadn't?
Chris had a vision of the cabin's giant logs reduced to kindling and prayed the skipper knew what he was doing. See? Didn't I tell you? One of her marines pointed. Don't it look like a Klingon bird of prey? Right out of the comic! The typhoon wasn't a hundred meters up when the first mine blew. Its explosion would have gone unnoticed in the racket, but Chris spotted the splash of water and mud that didn't fit the regular airflow from the typhoon's engine blast. Then another and another mine added its pop to the display. Water, mud, bits of vegetation, and rocks went flying every which way, none even close to the typhoon. Chris had seen enough. Everybody down. Reluctantly, her troops obeyed. With her back to the log wall, all Chris could think of was the mess the heat was making of the tundra. Summer had softened the top dozen centimeters or so. Now, hot rocket exhaust was digging two or three meters into the frozen earth, melting everything, turning it into a slurry, and throwing it far and wide. Chris hoped whoever owned this place wouldn't mind. If someone got stuck doing an after-the-fact environmental impact statement and mitigation plan, Chris knew who was high on Captain Thorpe's list for the duty. Outside, the scream of rockets changed to a settling whine. Chris risked a glance. The ground steamed and roiled in a broad slash as the typhoon settled onto a dozen thick landing gears well away from the last mine. Police choppers would be wanting to land next. Chris turned to her team. Gunny, have the techs police up the area. If there are any mines left, explode them. Start with a veranda. The two specialists had their satchel of techno tricks out, checking the door before they opened it. Here's one. Here's another, came back to her before they'd gone two paces. Crew, she waved at her marines. Let's gather for a prayer vigil in the back room while our friends bless our dear departing minds out front. Yeah, a corporal grinned. A mine is a terrible thing to waste. Keep that up, and these prisoners are going to sue us for marine brutality. Where's my mommy? Edith put in. She's coming, honey. Just a few more minutes. Chris sat Edith on the kitchen counter, while Gunny kept the prisoners in another room. Chris pulled her ration pack out, rummaged through it for a candy bar, and gave it to the girl. Edith studied it, her mouth twisted in a reflection of the conflict within. My mommy told me never to take candy from strangers. Honey, I'm not a stranger, Chris laughed. I'm a Marine. Hardcore, Corporal Lee agreed. All the way, the other trigger pullers chimed in. Edith must have agreed. She attacked the candy bar with zeal. Chris rummaged through the rest of her ration pouch, hunting for anything else the girl might like. The work out front was regularly punctuated by booms as exposed mines were set off by charges. Chris took several calls from police helicopters, asking when a landing pad might be ready. The 80-member crew of the Typhoon had no explosives experts to contribute to the two marine specialists, much to Captain Thorpe's disgust, so everyone waited while Chris's two worked. As the booms got farther from the house, Chris took Edith back to the front room. From the door, they watched the Marines at work. Sniffers picked up the scent of explosives in the swirling mist of steam and exhaust. The Marines would toss a package of explosives at the exposed mine, back off, and detonate their charge. That usually was enough to explode the mine as well. The few that didn't respond to the treatment were marked and left for later handling by a real bomb squad. This informal approach to field clearing finally yielded a large enough space that Chris ordered one specialist to drop back and set up a transponder for the first chopper. Two minutes later, three rotorcraft orbited the clearing. Chris ordered the mine hunt 
to pause. One chopper swooped in to quickly deposit a team of explosives experts before lifting off again. These volunteers from a local mining consortium turned to helping the Marines. As soon as the pad was clear, a second helicopter flared in for a landing without asking permission. There was no question who it brought. A woman and man bolted from it. Edith let out a whoop, and Chris almost lost her. Chris held on, trying not to fight, and amazed at how strong a six-year-old was when she wanted to be. The woman Edith's scream identified as, Mommy! Mommy! raced across the field, slipping and sliding until she was covered with mud, and dashed up the steps to the lodge, the man not two steps behind her. The child that before had seemed bolted to Chris's hip flowed into her mother's arms. There were tears and hugs and all kinds of blubbering as the three of them lost themselves in each other. Chris had cried her tears. She turned back to the lodge, quickly found her prisoners under Gunny's less-than-gentle care, and got them organized to move out. When next Chris stepped onto the veranda, the rejoined family was where she'd left them. A large chopper now occupied the single helipad, its engine spooling down as it disgorged a dozen men whose uniforms and hard eyes identified them as cops. Chris edged the family to the far corner of the veranda, then brought her prisoners out under heavy guard. The three, still locked in a hug, spared no notice for the kidnappers. The leader of the police force took in the handcuffed walking four and the half-carried fifth with a hard glare, as if already measuring them for coffins. There's a dead one on the back porch. We need to exchange any paperwork, Chris asked. Or do I just turn them over to you? I'll take them off your hands, ma'am. You want paperwork? I can scare you up some. We're kind of light on that stuff out here, he said not taking his eyes from the prisoners as they were quickly marched off. I understand one of them needs a duck. The wobbly one, Chris pointed out. He'll make it, the cop growled. Well, they say he's the boss man, Chris said with a wave at the other prisoners. I'd like to hear what he has to say. He'll be talking real soon. Now the cop grinned. I suspect we can get them all talking get them glad to talk. That left Chris wondering what other parts of the Society's Declaration on Human Rights Sequim hadn't gotten around to ratifying yet. Chris had other problems. Gunny, have your squad police up our gear. Otherwise, don't disturb the crime scene. Yes, ma'am, he saluted. Chris turned to Corporal Lee. Our squad will retrieve the LACs. I want to personally do the breakdown on our boat's comlink. Nobody touches it before me, got it? In spades, ma'am. No bloody squid's gonna get by with sloppy work that damn near fries me and mine. It was nice when leaders took a personal interest in their people's work. Chris did a slow look around, found everything under somebody else's control, and followed her corporal. It took Chris a while to collect the troopers who had provided fire support from the woods. They'd gotten way back when the ship came over. With them, she headed for the typhoon. At the gangway, a corpsman was waiting to take over the limper. Right beside the medic stood Captain Thorpe himself, grinning like a pirate as he surveyed the results of his landing approach. Damn good, if I do say so myself. Yes, sir, Chris agreed. I need to pick up the LACs. Can I sign for a hovercraft? Your Marines too lazy, Ensign, for another walk in that swamp you took them through? No, sir. Just thought you might want everyone back aboard before the sun gets too high, she answered. If she had gone straight for the landers, he'd be damning her for wasting time making mud pies. Chris was getting used to being damned if she did, and damned when she didn't. Take number two hover and make it quick, Thorpe ordered, then added, as if as an afterthought. Well done, Ensign. Chris saluted and led her squad back aboard. 
No surprise, turning the typhoon into a landing ship had shuffled a lot around inside. However, Nellie quickly showed Chris where Hovercraft 2 was docked. Chris used a second gangway to slip back out. No need going through Thorpe's idea of motivation twice. She found the right patch of skin, gave the order over the ship's net, and watched as a hatch slowly opened, lowering the hovercraft from its travel bay. In another three minutes, Chris had checked it out and mounted up her team. The corporal drove, Chris seated next to him. In the back seats, the Marines let loose with whoops and shouts as they shot away from the typhoon. As the corporal dodged trees and bounced over rocks, and the celebration in back got louder, he leaned toward Chris. Thanks for getting us down, ma'am. I figured us for fried. I don't know many officers who could have done what you did. Getting us down was about all I was hoping for. Getting us down, where we could help that little girl. Well, ma'am, you may not be a Marine, but I'll semper fi with you any time. Thanks, was all Chris could manage. Father, you are wrong. A one election isn't the greatest feeling in the world. Chris doubted she'd ever feel more pride than she felt at this moment from her subordinate's praise. Better than medals any day. The LACs were where they'd left them. While three Marines loaded gunnies in the bay of the hovercraft, Chris and Lee gave their own lander a once-over. The comm link was still as dead as horse cavalry. Go easy, Chris said, as the three troopers lifted this one much more gently and deposited it in hover two. Yeah, be a bleeding shame to knock what's wrong with it back right, one private observed. Chris chuckled. Just because they were Marines didn't mean they were dumb. Just, well, Marines. The trip back was slower. By the time they reached the typhoon, a cargo hatch was open in the ship's skin, so they drove right into the loading bay. Tommy was waiting, test kit in hand. Ready to tear into this piece of crap? Chris asked as she dismounted. Nope, he said, relaxing against the bay door. Thought I'd get some air, he waved his tester. Which LAC was yours? Chris had the Marines unload it, then dismissed them. Tommy went straight to work. Chris found her locker and doffed her drop suit. She would have loved a shower, but had no idea where one was in the reorganized ship. She settled for putting on yesterday's khakis. As she finished changing, Tommy waved her over to gaze with him into the innards of her cockpit. What can you tell me about my bum comlink? She asked. Let my heart quit beating when you went offline, he said. Chris wasn't sure if that was just Santa Maria's Irish talking or if Tommy was actually flirting. She dodged the question by ignoring him. He went on. There's a recall out on the comlink. Subcontractor got a hold of a batch of non-spec parts, but they initially passed inspection, both his and the contractor, or so the paperwork says. Let me check this one. With the cover off, the inner workings of the cockpit stood bare. Chris didn't need Tommy's magic tester to find the problem. The circuit board he pulled showed scorched plastic. Any way to know if that's just dumb luck or if someone tinkered with the board? Chris asked, giving full rein to the paranoia she'd learned at her father's knee. Tommy squinted one eye as he glanced her way. Who'd tinker with it? It's depot-level maintenance. Chris sighed, stood, and leaned against a closed locker. She eyed the parts laid out before her, trying to make sense of what she saw. Had a random distribution of bum parts almost killed her and her Marines? And then saved them. What are you thinking? Tommy asked, squatting beside her. That I ought to debrief my team she said, to no one in particular. Didn't one of the books at OCS say something about critiquing an action, that talking things through will soften post-traumatic stress if anything stressful happened? 
think almost frying on entry qualifies? Grandma Chin and the ancestors would, Tommy agreed. Thing is, I'm feeling a tad stressed myself. Real soon, my father and I need to have a long talk about the procurement practices of his government, she said. Then something hit her. If that damn part was on recall, why hadn't it been replaced? We didn't have a spare. Squadron Six's supply officer promised me a replacement in three days. We sortied on day two. Luck? Right. You know, Tommy, I think I need to do something to change my luck. Any suggestions? Have you tried leaving milk out for the little people? I think I'll have a beer myself, she muttered. They can have any I spill. Goodbye, me, the leprechaun beside her grinned. Before Chris could say anything more, both their comlinks went off, doing their level best to beep their way through the bugle notes of officer's call. Captain Thorpe had a very old notion of military decorum and motivation. Chris and Tommy hit both their comlinks at the same moment, so they were treated to the same message in stereo. Sequence general manager requests the presence of all ship's officers at a reception being given at his residence at 1930 local time. The typhoon will lift for Sequim's main spaceport at 1700 local. Uniform of the day will be dress white. Chris took a whiff of herself, decided she didn't like it, and went hunting for her quarters. With a little luck, her dress whites wouldn't look too bad after being trundled all over as the ship remade itself. Somehow, Chris suspected, her luck had been busy elsewhere this morning. Chapter 5 Chris was right. Though her locker and wardrobe had managed to move themselves into the stateroom that Chris now shared with Chief Bo, Chris had no idea where the contents of her desk and lockbox were. Hopefully, they'd show up tomorrow when the ship got back into orbit. As expected, Chris's uniforms looked like they'd been put through a ringer. The girls have an iron in the main room, Chief Bo said, as Chris surveyed the wreckage. Under the ship's normal configuration, Chris and Bo occupied separate staterooms at the opposite end of the Temple, that space where the Navy housed its vestigial virgins. This was someone's bright idea of how to keep men out of the enlisted women's sleeping quarters. Chris assumed it worked. She'd never bothered to catch any males making the run in or out of the spaces the enlisted women shared, two to a room, or, more often, one to a room, thanks to the typhoon being below even the skimpy peacetime crew authorization. Since it was work hours, Chris didn't feel the need for a coughing fit before entering the enlisted women's area. The iron and its board were easy to spot, and despite theatrical levels of shock and dismay among her fellow cadets at OCS that a long knife would iron her own uniforms, Chris had gotten the hang of it quickly. At 16.30, Chris joined the nine other ship's officers in the hulking shadow of the typhoon as a line of vehicles arrived to take them to the reception. The captain and XO shared a limo. Chris and Tommy piled into a reasonably clean all-terrain rig. At the general manager's residency, the officers arranged themselves in rank order before entering a crowded, wood-paneled ballroom lit by several crystal chandeliers that would have been right at home on Wardhaven, but seemed a bit out of place on a startup world. Captain Thorpe, in dress whites, resplendent with rows of medals, led his officers toward a formal reception line. Civilian men in brightly colored formal wear women in floor-length gowns from last year's Paris designers. As the most junior members of the Typhoon's crew, Chris and Tommy made sure no one got behind them. That didn't last very long. Longknife! Chris Longknife! That was you in that skiff this morning. Chris looked around for the voice. She didn't recognize it. A young man in a maroon tux and a drink in both hands headed for her. He looked vaguely familiar. 
Recognize me? He beamed. Raised on politics, where everyone was your best friend, at least until the door closed behind them, Chris had plenty of experience watching mother or father fake eternal friendship. Long time no see, she said, taking the offered drink. Hey, Anita, Jim, you have to meet this girl. Come on over. This has to be the woman Edith says saved her. At that shout, the receiving line disintegrated, just as Captain Thorpe extended his hand to the general manager. Leaving the skipper's hand waving in empty air, the man and woman at the front of the line headed for Chris, with everyone else only a step behind. Are you the woman who rescued my Edith? Behind the sequined gold lame dress and expensive coif, Chris saw the woman who had slogged through muck to her child this morning. I led the ground assault team, Chris answered, trying to avoid letting her small area of responsibility impinge in any way on Captain Thorpe's overall command. I told you there was a long knife flying that skiff, didn't I? Chris's unidentified friend went on. She beat the pants off me two years running at college. I'd recognize those smooth curves anywhere. Ought to. I studied them damn near every night. Can't tell you how glad I am to see you again. Beneath that umbrella of continuous chatter, the mother introduced herself as Anita Swanson, wife of Jim Swanson, Sequim's general manager and sister to the magpie. A servant was dispatched to wake Edith, who had gone to bed early under protest at not being allowed to come to the party. Through all this, Captain Thorpe stood ignored at the elbow of Jim Swanson's powder blue tux. Watching the red rise on her skipper's neck, Chris did what she'd better do if the entire crew was to be saved from a miserable week, month, and year. General Manager Swanson, may I present to you the commander of the ship that saved your daughter, Captain Thorpe. Jim Swanson turned to shake the captain's offered hand. I want you to know that as the planetary leader of this colony, I have recommended Miss Longknife for the Distinguished Flying Cross. I may not be the aficionado of skiff flying that my wife's brother Bob here is, but I want you to know that I've never seen the skills that this girl put into her skiff flying this morning. Chris started backing up, looking for a convenient place to hide. Mr. Swanson sounded like one of those politicians who knew just enough about the military to make it really miserable for anyone he took an interest in. We were watching on the secure hookup you provided us, Captain. I was hardly breathing when your skiff started their drop. Then this kid's skiff takes off doing loop-the-loops, and even I can tell it's burning reaction mass in all the wrong directions. How much did she have left when she got down? I will have my executive officer look up what the fuel situation was on Ensign Longknife's landing assault craft, the captain said emphasizing that it was no racing skiff Chris flew that morning. The skill Ensign Longknife displayed today, the skipper continued, with a nod in Chris's direction, was in the highest tradition of the service. However, Mr. Swanson, the DFC is out of the question. That is a combat medal, sir. And those kidnappers weren't more heavily armed than anyone the Navy's come up against in years. Mr. Swanson observed dryly. So it seems, sir, but we were here in support of a police matter, not a military combat drop. Even Chris, just getting used to being a subordinate, could read the captain's cut off as clearly as a brick wall. However, Chris had witnessed several of her father's failed conversations with military types. This had all the markings of a massive one. I should think... Captain Thorpe, that is the skipper of the good ship Summer Morning Breeze, you would be happy to have one of your crew recommended for a distinguished medal by the senior political official on a rapidly growing colony planet. Oh, boy. Chris glanced around for a place to hide. As the daughter of a prime minister, this might be fun to watch. Is a very junior officer at the center of all this attention? 
she'd gladly forego the honor. The ship out at the spaceport might be the fast-response Corvette summer morning breeze to the politicians who paid for her. But she was the fast-attack Corvette typhoon to the officer who commanded her. Chris had heard several variations on both names among the enlisted, but they didn't count. She'd heard her father say, after a long, bitter budget battle, that he'd call a ship any damn thing he needed to get the votes to fund it. And if the votes were for warm, cuddly koala bear, by damn, he'd have a nice little old lady commission it that. What the Navy officers chose to call it once they took possession was their own damn business. It had only taken two nasty incidents before the Prime Minister learned to keep careful track of who he was talking to and call the ship by the appropriate name for the listener. Mr. Swanson was about to have such a learning experience. Is that her? Is that the Irene that came for me? Said learning experience was forestalled as a tiny form in a white nightdress with pink ribbons dashed into the room. Chris found herself gazing down into familiar, wide blue eyes. This time, there was no red rim from tears. The face had been washed and was about as angelic as a six-year-old ever got. Edith now had a cuddly teddy bear in tow. Her mom bent to pick up Edith, but the girl made a beeline for Chris. Handing her untouched drink off to Tommy, Chris stooped, starched uniform crinkling to swoop up the child. Edith gave Chris a hug that had to be worth all the medals the Navy ever minted. You have a beautiful little girl here, Chris said to mother and father. It was my pleasure to return her safe and sound to you. I know I speak for my Marines and the entire ship when I say it was our honor and joy to see her in your arms. That drew a unanimous round of applause. Made unsure by all the noise, Edith decided she wanted her mother's arms around her. As Anita took the girl from Chris, she muttered, If only all such horrible things ended so happily. Then the mother blanched. You're Christine Longknife. You lost your... Oh, I'm sorry. Breath went out of Chris, like she'd been kneed in the belly. It was so easy to handle people in their fights. Thanks to father, she had plenty of experience there. But solicitous people, people who thought they knew the pain she'd been through, that was more than daunting. Stealing herself to put on the required face, Chris nodded. Yes, ma'am. I'm that Christine Longknife. And I am very glad that your family's ordeal ended very different from mine. Anita seemed at a loss for words. Her husband stepped in. I think we're about ready to serve dinner. If Edith is ready for Miss Lillywhite's party, nurse can put her to bed, and the rest of us can discuss matters further over dinner. Edith left, with backward waves for all. Chris excused herself, claiming restroom necessity. There was an exit just past the ladies' room. Chris took it. Outside, the air was warm, but an evening breeze cooled the expansive grounds of the general manager's mansion. Hands stiff at her sides, Chris fought to organize the emotions ripping at her gut. That was what Judith said. Know the dragons coming at you out of your darkness. Name them if you wish, but get familiar with each and every one of them. Some were easy. The captain, she knew. He needed his ship and the authority it gave him. He needed control of his domain. If he hadn't chosen the Navy, he'd be a senior manager by now, maybe running his own business. But he'd chosen the Navy because it did important things that mattered. Chris understood Swanson as well. He was building things. People looked up to him for what he did. Some day, they'd put a statue of him in the planet's capital when it had an elected legislature and full membership in the Society of Humanity. The captain and the general manager were very important people, and Chris had watched her father take the likes of them apart, leaving them bleeding career-wise 
and begging for help. Yes, Chris knew big men like these could be made very small. So, why was she in the Navy, where Thorpe could order her to risk her life using two-bit equipment to rescue Jim Swanson's daughter because he hadn't funded his own police well enough to do the job? Because today, I did what I couldn't do when I was ten. Today I saved Edith. If only I had been there to save Eddie. There it was. Still the survivor's guilt. No matter what she did, she'd always be alive, and the little boy she was supposed to take care of would always be dead. A knock at the door yanked Chris out of this all-too-familiar round of self-flagellation. Tommy stuck his head out. Thought I'd find you here. You should get back. They're about to officially seat us, and you don't want to make a grand entrance. Already made one today. Think I'll save the next one for tomorrow. By my ancestors' count, it's already two today. And yes, even the we people would be saving up the next one for several tomorrows from now. Chris gave Tommy the grin his mixed-up mythology deserved, and slipped back into the dining room before the movement to the tables was so pronounced as to make her absence noticeable. Chris was seated well away from the head table, although Bob, the magpie brother-in-law, somehow managed to seat himself next to her. That settled the table's conversation on skiffs. Chris found that if she played it right, she did little of the talking. Magpies did have their benefits. Late in the meal, a Marine brought message traffic for the captain. The officers grew silent at something so important, it required the old formality of the captain reading a flimsy, though talk among the civilians continued undimmed. Captain Thorpe signed the receipt, then pocketed the message. The officers would learn about it in the captain's good time. When Mr. Swanson stood to lay more profuse praise on them, the captain asked if he might say a word. As the skipper rose, he pulled the message flimsy from his pocket. The typhoon has been ordered back to base, he said curtly, glancing around the room. Due to the failure of the President and the Senate to arrive at a budget resolution, all ships of Fast Attack Squadron 6 will stand down for a three-month storage period. Officers will be placed on half pay. Enlistments that will be up in the next 90 days will be processed immediately. I regret to say that all requests for re-enlistments have been declined at the highest level. We will be raising ship at 0600 tomorrow. That said, the captain sat down. That's impossible, Mr. Swanson sputtered. The Senate and the President agreed on the full Navy bill. That's what my contacts on Earth informed me. The captain did not stand, but his command voice carried to the farthest corner of the room. You are correct, sir, as far as your information goes. However, to fund the full appropriation required an increase in taxes. The rim got the Senate to pass it. The Earthborn president vetoed it. While we are authorized to write enough checks to operate the Navy, Treasury lacks the money to cash them all. Rather than kite checks into next year, the Navy Department is ordering a stand down. Thorpe paused for a moment before adding, Be glad your daughter was kidnapped this month. Next month, there wouldn't be a ship to respond. Mr. Swanson stumbled back a step, as if hit by a wayward asteroid. The captain wasn't exactly correct. Supplemental appropriations were available for emergency activity. Indeed, this entire response might be debited to that account, leaving more money to cover naval operations. But Chris was not about to correct her captain. On that note, conversation around the room limped on. Ten minutes later, Captain Thorpe asked the hostess's leave to depart, and the ship's officers left as a group. As the door closed behind Chris, the civilian's conversation took off like thunder. She could easily imagine the topic. 
The executive officer was waiting for Chris as she crossed the quarter deck. Ensign, a moment. Chris stayed with him as the other officers went to their quarters. He said nothing until they had the space to themselves. Captain Thorpe has forwarded a recommendation that you receive the Navy Marine Corps Medal for your life-saving effort today. Swanson was kind enough to provide us with a copy of his write-up. Chris nodded, but the EXO wasn't finished. He stared off across the port to the city lights of Port Swanston, Sequim's largest city. I hear Sequim is trying to get Wardhaven to finance some new mines along their asteroid belt. Got to look nice, him putting the daughter of Wardhaven's prime minister in for a fucking medal, he spat. Stunned at the hatred in the XO's voice, Yes, sir, was all Chris managed to sputter. She'd risked her neck to save a kid's life, not for a medal. And all anyone could see was that she was one of those long knives. Dismissed, she stumbled through the unfamiliar passages to her room, slammed the door behind her, then pounded on it a few times for good measure. Don't think that door will be bothering anyone for a while, ma'am a quiet voice drawled in the darkness. Chris whirled. The dark of her room showed nothing. Lights dim, she ordered, trying to keep the emotions strangling her throat from turning her voice into a series of squeaks. The overhead came to life, casting low light around the rearranged quarters. Right, I'm sharing a damn room with Chief Bo. I'm sorry, Chief, I forgot. I'll be quieter. Lights out, Chris ordered, to hide herself. Lights on, the chief said, as she threw her covers aside and sat up in bed. Worn pajamas were missing the two top buttons, and the pants were cut off at the knees, revealing more wrinkled yellow skin than Chris wanted to see, as the old chief settled cross-legged on the lower bunk. Honey, you look like you've been rowed hard and put away wet, drawled the small, oriental-looking woman. The question, don't you want to talk to your Auntie Bo, was left hanging. As far as Chris was concerned, it could hang there until it strangled. She turned to her locker to get her PJs and to hide her face. Her locker wasn't there. Damn it! Where is everything? Chris exploded. Scattered around the ship, as best I can tell, the chief answered easily. You know, ma'am, I don't think they quite have the hang of rearranging the ship in flight. At least this time, we didn't space anyone. Chris was kicking her way along the panels under her bunk, hoping a door would pop open, mainly just kicking. They haven't actually spaced anyone during a reconfiguration, she said, then added. Have they? The Navy has its stories, and old chiefs do love passing them along to the young'uns. Like today, it'll make quite a story. Boot Ensign goes out, saves a squad of jarheads with some fancy flying, then saves the whole damn platoon when she flies them over the minefield Gunny and the Skipper were enthusiastically planning on dropping them into. Great story. So tell me, why you look like somebody stole your puppy? XO says the Skipper is putting me in for the Navy Marine Corps medal. Hell, dearie, everyone on the boat knows that. Skipper ordered it about ten hundred this morning. He's not doing it because Sequim's general manager wanted to put me in for a medal. No, ma'am. Then why the XO? Chris started to form the question, then stopped. Never ask a question you already know the answer to, was the prime minister's rule one. I expect the XO is riding you, like the skipper is, maybe was. Wants to know what you're made of. A panel flew open at Chris's last kick. The drawer was upside down. Underwear cascaded onto the floor. Chris pulled a pair of gym shorts and a college sweatshirt from the pile, shoved the rest back inside, and stripped quickly. 
When she turned to the sink, toothbrush in hand, the chief was still eyeing her. Why are you here? If you don't mind the question, ma'am. I wanted to do some good, Chris said, smearing paste on the brush. Think I did today, she said, jamming the brush in her mouth to cut off further discussion. The chief shook her head. My sister wanted to do good. She joined the Salvation Army. In case you didn't notice today, the good you did for the little girl is gonna mean some things very bad for the guys that grabbed her. They're getting what they deserve, Chris spat through the toothbrush. Right, you're one of those long knives. But trust me, honey, the bad guys ain't always going to be so deserving or so obvious. Navy shoots what it's aimed at, no questions asked, no answer sought. Politicians like your daddy point us. You sure you want to be out here on the tip of the spear with the rest of us folks with smelly feet? I joined, Chris said, rinsing out her mouth. So did every mother's daughter snoring out there in the bays. Some joined to get out of that mother's house, or father's. Some joined to dodge a marriage or the law. There are a couple out there earning money for college. They'll be the first in their family ever to get one of those diploma things. Every girl out there knows why she joined. Why did you? I said I joined so I could do some good, Chris snapped. And? Chief Bo wasn't going to let her off that easy. Would you believe I wanted to get away from home too? Maybe, came with a raised eyebrow. No. I'm not some poor little rich kid, damn it, who had to join the Navy to get any attention. I had the Prime Minister and his lady's attention. God, did I have their attention. So much of them, there was no room for me. That's why I joined the Navy. To find a little space for me. To find a little air of my own to breathe. That a good enough reason to join your damn Navy? Maybe, Chief Bo said reaching for her covers and stretching out on her bunk. Good enough reason to join. Not good enough to stay. Let me know when you figure out why you want to be Navy. Why are you Navy? Chris snapped. So I can have these fun late night girl talks with you young officers and still get a good night's sleep in my own rack. Lights out. In the dark, Chris could hear the chief rolling over. And in only a moment, she was snoring, leaving Chris to sort out a day that was more full than most months back home. Chris tried to organize all that had hit her in the last 30 hours, but quickly found that all her mind wanted to do was spin past the day in a blur. Chris measured her breath, slowed it, and in a moment, exhausted sleep found her. Chapter 6 The typhoon lifted on schedule at 0600. At 0700, while most of the crew was at breakfast, the XO converted the boat from air vehicle slash planet lander mode back to acceleration slash non-combat mode. Chris reached the bridge just as the reports on the success slash lack thereof began to pour in. When a kamikaze-class corvette was in non-combat mode, it wasn't a bad ship to be on. The thick hull armor for combat was spread thinly throughout the ship to make spacious passageways and workspaces. The bridge wasn't too claustrophobic, and each officer and many enlisted had their own private room. The XO had followed the book on how to change from one mode to the other and back again. Painful to say, and it was for him. The reconfiguration didn't quite work as the book promised. Chris got the job of figuring out what the book missed. As defensive systems officer, she was trained to move the ship's skin around in combat to compensate for damage. That left Chris the only one among the Typhoon's ten officers and sixty crew even marginally qualified to answer questions about wayward lockers, storage rooms, tool chests, et al. 
Chris spent most of the trip back to Squadron 6's base on High Cambria, trying to get the Typhoon's insides back where they belonged. 95% of everything worked just like the builder's specs said it would. Chris worked 16-hour days on the remaining 5%. It had its compensations. There was new respect in the crew's eyes, even as they pestered Chris for this and that. Quite a few put in a good word about the rescue. And all of them thanked her for what she was doing now, even the last, the owner of Foot Locker 73B2 and Tool Locker 23's mechs. After five tries and five failures, neither space would move to its designated location. Chris solved it, finally, by having the spacers involved empty the lockers in their wrong locations, deleting them, then recreating new ones in the right space. The typhoon seemed to tremble with a quiet sigh of relief and a cheer when Chris finished. Hope we don't do that again anytime soon, Chris muttered to herself and the rest of the bridge crew. Captain Thorpe raised an eyebrow to the exec. I followed the steps in the manual, the executive officer defended himself. You were looking over my shoulder, sir. <laughs> yes, I was, the captain chuckled, then turned to Chris and actually let the smile stay on his face. Right, Ensign, we will avoid this drill in the future. Before you stand down, Ensign, Write me an experience report to forward to Comatech Ron 6 for Commodore Sampson's review, entertainment, and referral to the yard for an explanation. The bridge team shared a laugh, and Chris stowed away the skipper's smile. It looked like she'd finally made it. She was an ensign, just one of the crew. Then they arrived back at base and went immediately into stand down for storage. Except for the captain, all officers went on half pay. They could leave the ship for the next three months, or they could work half time, rotating with each other. The four department heads planned to do that. The six junior officers, like Chris and Tommy, were told they had a choice. Get lost for all three months, or just for the first six weeks. Then work the last six for chow in a bunk. Either way, leave a place the Navy could contact them in case of emergency recall. Chris found Tommy flipping through the freight lines, looking for a cheap ticket back home. We Santa Marians always knew we were the wrong end of nowhere. But with these connections, I'll get home just in time to come back. There's a direct liner leaving for Wardhaven tomorrow. We could be there in four days. And what would I do on Wardhaven? Keep me company. Tell my mother there was nothing dangerous about how I won the medal my father is going to pin on me. You know, provide moral support. Tom laughed. <laughs> and your ma's going to believe me more than she will me. So it was settled. They dashed aboard the luxurious swift Achilles a good ten minutes before the airlocks were hatched down. Each ended up sharing quarters with six other junior officers headed for the beach, but Chris figured a cruise ship would be good for some serious relaxing. She was wrong. At breakfast the next morning, she bumped into, literally, Commodore Sampson, the commander of Attack Squadron 6. He eyed her like she was something really hideous that had just crawled out from under a rock. Chris was getting used to senior officers giving J.O.'s that treatment. Out of uniform, she braced and said, Good morning, sir. Ensign Longknife, isn't it? The short officer rumbled. Chris agreed that she was. Interesting report on smart metal. Your grandfather's shipyards should find it informative. Yes, sir, Chris answered then headed for the other end of the dining room, where the lowlifes and J.O.'s hung out. For the next four days, she did her best to be elsewhere when her superior officer was anywhere. Once the swift Achilles docked at High Wardhaven, Chris had Nellie take charge of seeing that her and Tommy's luggage was shipped dirtside. She wanted her hands free as she moved about the station, hurrying for the elevator. 
It couldn't be that she was excited about being home. A sign at the elevator station proudly announced that the contractor had finally gotten the bugs out of the passenger cars on the orbit-to-surface elevator. A reminder that the Navy wasn't the only one with quality control problems. Viewing cars were now available, and Chris and Tom grabbed tickets for one's fourth level, the one that gave a full view of Wardhaven, as they dropped. Once the car came out of the station, there were oohs and ahs at the view of the planet, laid out 44,000 kilometers below them. Chris found tears forming in her eyes. Just four months ago, she would have been glad to never see Wardhaven again. Today, it was the most beautiful place in the galaxy. Its white clouds spread across blue oceans. Its lands were green or brown or even bright yellow when the desert outback came in view. It looks just like Santa Maria, Tommy noted beside her, but not as beautiful. Did everyone in human space feel that way about their home planet? At mid-course, the car began to decelerate. Chris went from being gently pushed back into her seat by the one-quarter G-force to hanging on her restraints. A computer voice suggested they turn their seats around, but Chris was not about to give up this view. Now she could make out the particulars of home. Landers Bay, a curving hundred clicks of water. Barrier Islands had made this spot on the equator the choice for orbital landers until a runway could be built. The Old Miss, wide and reaching far back into South Continent, had given the city of Wardhaven a boost for trade both off-planet and up-country. What's that needle? Tommy asked. Grandpa Alex is doing, Chris answered. Most of great I forget how many Grandpa News factories are off-planet now, but we still own that chunk of land east of the river and south of town. He's turning it into one monstrous office and apartment complex and returning most of the land to parks. He bragged you'd be able to see the centerpiece of it from low orbit. And you can. You own all that? My family does, Chris corrected not relishing the awe in Tommy's voice. We're a big family. I don't own all that much. Yeah, right. Tommy didn't sound all that persuaded. Chris suppressed a sigh. Right about now was when she lost a lot of friends. Instead, she pointed. Those lakes out there beyond town. We used to have a sailboat. Hanovi, my older brother, and Eddie and I would go sailing whenever we could. We would have sailed all summer if they'd let us. You ever go sailing? There. She'd said Eddie's name. She didn't choke on it. Her heart hadn't bled. She'd saved Edith. Maybe now she could face Eddie. That pool back at OCS was the first time I saw water over my head, Tommy reminded her. Now, only a hundred clicks up, most of Wardhaven City was coming into view. Chris noted how much farther the city had spread around the bay since she'd seen it from Grandpa Trouble's racing skiff. Well, Father's eight years had been prosperous ones. Good for Wardhaven. Good for his re-election campaign. Now the car shuddered as the brakes were applied, and they slowed to a crawl to enter the station. As soon as the car turned level, riders were unhitching their harnesses, reaching under their chairs for their carry-on luggage, even before the car announced such goings-on were safe. Chris was in no hurry. Even though Nellie had messaged ahead, there had been no one to meet her at High Wardhaven. She doubted there would be anyone here. As she and Tommy looked for their luggage, Chris got a surprise tap on her shoulder. She turned and yelped with glee. Uncle Harvey! She threw her arms around the old chauffeur and gave him a hug and kiss on his scarred cheek.
It took an effort to believe that he'd been younger than she was now when his one battle qualified him for disability and a plush job at Newhouse, as he called his work. To Chris, he'd always been old Uncle Harvey, and he'd always taken her to the soccer games, the plays, and all the other places a little girl had to go. And he'd stayed there to cheer her on, buy an ice cream to celebrate victory, or take the edge off defeat. They'd been through Eddie together. Uncle Harvey was the one person she'd dare share her, if only I had, horror with. And sharing, she discovered she wasn't alone with thoughts of what might have been. Where's mother and father? she asked. Now, you know they're busy, or they wouldn't be the important people they are, he said, taking her luggage. You're traveling light, only one bag. I haven't seen you manage that since you were shorter than my knee, and the bad one at that. I'm an officer now, in case you haven't noticed. Chris did a quick whirl to show off her undressed khakis. You always said you'd travel light in the army. Well, that goes double for Navy. And who's this other poor sailor hanging around an old man, looking eager for a ride? Harvey, this is Ensign Tom Lean, the best friend I've made in the last five months. We're both kind of on the beach, and he's from Santa Maria. I thought we might have room for him for a couple of weeks. Not at the residency, they just hired two new special assistants. Damned if I can tell what's special about them. Anyway, there's no spare bedrooms anymore. It'll have to be the old new house, Harvey said, reaching for Tommy's bag. The young ensign swung it out of Harvey's reach. Da would tan my hide if I let a gray hair like you lug me bags. If you can find a gray hair up there, you're welcome to it but thanks for not saying old baldy. I suspect your folks raised you better than that. They exchanged grins. Come on, you two, the car's just a short walk. Let's get moving. The car brought more happy time. Gary was with it. A six-foot-four linebacker type, Gary was Chris's security detail at games and restaurants and whatever for the last ten years. What's mother's schedule like? Chris asked as she settled into the back seat of the black limo. I was hoping for a quiet dinner tonight. It's a state dinner tonight for the both of them, Harvey said. We've got a visiting delegation of firemen from old earth out here to talk and jabber and not do a thing. They've scheduled a quiet dinner tomorrow, only a dozen or so besides you and your brother. Tell mother I'll have Ensign Lean with me. She immediately silenced Tom's protestations with a wave. If you aren't there, the prime minister will have me paired with some old or young lecher whose vote he's chasing. With you, at least we can crack Navy jokes under our breath. That settled. Chris eyed the city around her. Everywhere she looked, something was being built out of stone and concrete. The red brick buildings that seemed so tall when she was just a kid were being replaced by buildings that soared out of her adult sight. Yep, times were good. Traffic was lousy, and father was at no risk of losing any election he called. Five months ago, that was all she supposedly needed to be happy. How a little time had changed that. As they approached the old new mansion, Harvey regaled Tommy with the tale of its growth. Old Ernie New started with that two-story block over there. That's where I and the missus live. He added that long three-story wing when the grandkids started coming. Then, with the general bringing in all kinds of people, not just the likes of me, he added a new kitchen and dining room ballroom, and a couple of dozen parlors and studies with the fancy columned portico. The great library was, I think, his wife's idea. Then, with great grandkids, he built another wing. They say old Ernie was building until the day he died. Folks still swear sometimes they can hear him walking the halls at night. 
I never heard him. Chris frowned at her deprived state. You were never quiet long enough, Harvey shot back. Gary smiled. Now, there was someone quiet enough to hear a ghost. Chris started to ask him. Before she got a word out, the main gate came into view. It was staffed by a dozen Marines in battle armor and rifles. I thought you said father was at the formal residency. He is. This is for the visiting firemen. The general himself is back from Santa Maria. Your great-grandpa trouble is due in today. What's going on? Tom asked. The driver and security guard exchanged glances. Need to know basis, son, Harvey answered. Chris and Tommy had to produce IDs and retina scans to prove they were who they were. As the car came to a final rest before the front portico, Chris realized that between college and the Navy, it had been a while since she crossed that door. It had opened automatically as she approached. Nellie had done her job of answering the door's challenge. The foyer was in shadows, but it was the floor Chris eyed. Great Grandpa knew had been in his spiritual phase when he built this section. The floor tiles were a spiral of black and white, starting along the wall and closing into a tight coil in the center. The design was from an ancient earth cathedral. As a child, Chris had walked it as a kind of game. Her on the blacks, Eddie on the whites. Always, they met in the middle. It had been a long time since she'd walked it. The ensign who saved Edith Swanson wondered what it would feel like to walk it now. The great library, off to the right, had more marine guards, these in dress red and blue. They eyed Chris as she crossed the cold marble floor, came to attention. It was clear that if she came an inch closer, they'd very likely shoot. She and Tommy headed directly for the thickly carpeted stairs. Chris got her old third-floor room back. Harvey apologized for putting Tom so far down the hall. All the rooms in between are taken. Who's in them? Could they be moved? Chris asked. General, General, Admiral, Colonel, Harvey said, pointing at each door. I guess we don't move them, Chris agreed. Would you have a small corner, maybe up in the attic, where I could lay a sleeping bag? Tom asked, voice cracking. Tom, what's to be afraid of? You're a girl. You don't have to worry about meeting one of them when you're halfway through a shower or sitting on the can. I'll be standing there at attention, myself hanging in the wind. Chris, this is not what I bargained for. Harvey turned to rest a hand on the young ensign's shoulder. I know how you feel, boy. Fresh out of the army with private stripes still on my soul. Being around the general and those that ended up around him, it was a shock to the old system. But son, they get up just like you and me every morning. And it seems to me that the higher up they go, the more they know that. Not all, but trust me. Any around the general and trouble are good ones. If they weren't, they wouldn't have had the smarts to come here to ask the general how to get out of this mess. What mess? Chris asked. Not for the likes of me to know, girl. But if I was a betting man, I wouldn't bet an earth dollar that the society flag is flying over government house next landing day. Devolution. Both Chris and Tom whispered the word. Is it that close? Chris finished. Ask the prime minister. Better yet, ask your grandpas. Chris wasn't so sure she wanted to meet folks studied in her history books. Besides, she had things to figure out about her last mission. And with the whole of human space on the line, this was no time to meet a bunch of family strangers and dump her problems on them. Harvey, could I borrow a car? I'd like to go see Aunt True about some computer stuff. True will love that, Harvey agreed. But why borrow a car? Isn't my driving good enough for you? Yes, Uncle Harvey. But aren't you busy? Hang around this place too long and they'll have me taking care of the cook's wee ones. 
or even my own great-grandkids. Nice little tots, but if I don't keep moving, the women will have me changing diapers. I'd rather be driving. Fifteen minutes later, Chris and Tom were in the back seat of a much smaller car. Of course, she had time, honorary Aunt True assured Chris. She'd just been working on a way to jimmy the new local lottery, but their network was down just now, so there was no rush. Tom gave Chris a questioning look and confessed to no longer being sure when the people around Chris were exaggerating. Chris laughed and told Tommy how True had helped her through elementary algebra in first grade and even given Chris her first computer. Then they got to True's penthouse apartment. It hadn't changed a bit, though a shiny new complex was going up next door. I thought you said she was a retired government worker, Tommy said. She is. She bought this place when she won the lottery 15 years back. Tom gave Chris a sidewise glance, but didn't say a word. Chris missed a step, rerunning what she'd just said. Aunt True would never cheat. If she could win the lottery every time, why doesn't she? Chris asked no one in particular. Smart woman knows not to push a good thing too far, Harvey winked. And Chris found herself wondering just how much of what she accepted without question as a kid was in dire need of a second look now that she was a woman. Then True opened the door, and Chris got lost in a hug of mega huge proportions. Mother never touched, and father never even came close to Chris, but Aunt True hugged. Chris let the breath go out of her, as she had so many times before. With it went the tightness in her stomach and the iron-fisted grip at her throat. It was True who broke the hug and ushered them into her living room with its spectacular view of Wardhaven. With Papa New's industrial plants off-planet, the capital city was a lovely place of trees, boulevards, and towering buildings watered by the old Mrs. Meanderings. True had heard of Chris's experience on Sequim. It seemed most of the rim had. There were even pictures of her L.A.C. ride. So that was not something Chris could avoid when she met Mother. Though, with luck, the woman would have no idea what she was looking at. True briefly swapped stories with Chris about the one or two times she had ended up with the booties, dodging bullets while she tried to find the right algorithm to close down all that noise. Now, Chris caught the tightness around her aunt's eyes, the catch in her voice. True dismissed herself to get herbal tea or fresh squeezed lemonade for her guests. That was one of True's rules. No talk before some good, healthy refreshments. Even in Chris's bottle days, a dose of Auntie True's lemonade had been better than bourbon. Chris rummaged up the computer she had removed from the crime scene on Sequim. When True returned with a tray, it was sitting as innocent as it could on the coffee table. A little present for your Auntie True, she said, putting down the tray. A little old and beaten up for a present, Chris said. More like a puzzle. You still like puzzles? Mmm, True said, giving the computer a quick once-over while the others served themselves. The computer was an old wrist unit, fairly thick and heavy, at least 200 grams. It used an old-fashioned display. Didn't even jack into eyeglasses. True tried and failed to activate it. Wiped at a pretty low level, she observed. Can you get at it? Chris asked. Probably, True muttered, eyeing the empty tray. I thought I had some cookies, but I seem to be out. I could bake some, Chris said, jumping up. True had been the one who taught Chris all that she knew about kitchens. It wasn't much, but True could whip up a wicked bunch of chocolate chip cookies, and Chris had learned from the expert. You talked me into it, True smiled, her eyes still concentrating on the unit. So, 
while True turned her kitchen table into a hacker-slash-cracker dreamland, Chris led Tom in an assault on True's immaculate kitchen. As they had for many years, the pans waited for Chris in the lower right drawer beside the oven. The flour was in the white earthen jar on the back of the kitchen counter. A bag of Ghirardelli chocolate chips stood its usual watch from the top shelf in the pantry. So much in the world had changed, but Aunt True's kitchen was a constant Chris could always count on. There is something to be said for the spiritual healing power of turning a little girl loose in a kitchen to bake cookies, or a big girl, for that matter. As the wondrous smells collected around them, she and Tom licked the spoon, snatched scraps of dough, and would have pulled chunks off the main ball if True hadn't announced loudly and forcefully her fear that nothing would remain to cook. Harvey curled up in a corner with his reader, checking all the oddities in the news and sharing the strangest with anyone listening. True tinkered with the computer. Its cover was now off, its innards revealed like entrails to be read. This bit of artificial intelligence is part of a kidnapping investigation, ongoing on Sequim, isn't it? True asked, attaching chunks of the offending unit to an analyzer she'd built herself. Yes, Chris admitted, pausing from greasing a cookie sheet. But the local cops didn't seem all that interested in it. At least, no one asked where it went. I figured you'd have a better chance of getting at it than anyone on Sequim. And besides, I came near to dying on a minefield set by those punks, brand new Mark 41 landmines that aren't even issued to my Marines, much less to kidnappers. I want to know where all their tech came from. Chris pursed her lips. And the upfront money. How are they building their case? True said absentmindedly. On confessions, Harvey put in. The four are singing like fine Irish tenors in a well-stocked pub, wouldn't you say? He asked Tom. Loud, if not so sweet, the young ensign answered. Four, Chris turned from her kitchen duties. We captured five. One had a heart attack the day after you bagged him, Harvey said, without looking up from his reading. Hmm, True muttered, before Chris could ask which dead man was already filling a coffin. I'm in, but it seems that paranoid here encrypted everything. Looks like a standard commercial package. Should have some interesting stuff in a few minutes. Who are these kidnappers? True asked Harvey. They claim to be just petty crooks, Harvey said, flipping through his reader. And they were from... Harvey paged back. Earth, New Haven, Columbia, New Jerusalem. That covered a big chunk of the Seven Sisters, the first planets colonized from Earth. The first two, New Eden and New Haven, had been wide open. Yamato, Columbia, Europa, and New Canton drew their original populations from specific regions of Old Earth. New Jerusalem had been a unique case, and still was. Five petty thugs from Earth and three of her seven overpopulated sisters had snatched the child of the general manager of a raw rim colony. That invited a raised eyebrow from True. Harvey snorted. Damn punks got a government dole to feed them and nothing else to do. Small-time hoods must have figured they could make it big out here hitting on some hard-working rim type, and retire to perpetual fun and games back home. Chris hid her surprise at Harvey's attitude. She knew a lot of rim folks didn't think much of the billions in the central worlds that wouldn't immigrate. Chris had even studied the situation in college. It wasn't that Earth and the Seven Sisters actually were welfare states. Their teeming billions were as fully employed as you'd expect for a mature economy. What they were was self-absorbed, maybe a bit self-important, and more than a bit decadent. It wasn't a mixture to appeal to the rim worlds. 
add in an incident like this that only served to solidify misperceptions like Harvey's, and things could get volatile. That's the way some folks would perceive it. Chris skirted the confrontation with her old friend. Perception is everything, True muttered. And reality may be subject to change. True finished with a smile and sat back in her chair. That didn't take so long. Let me copy this to my newest child. Sam can organize the data while we try a few of those cookies, True said, then mumbled softly to her personal computer to get it working on the project. They need a bit more time to cool, Chris said, but was already using the spatula to move them to a plate. The chips were gooey and dripping. The cookies were as delicious as when Chris had needed to stand on the chair to get at them. So much had changed in her life. Auntie True's cookies had not. The first dozen cookies were gone. The second batch just out, as a third batch went in the oven. When True grew distracted by Sam's report. True slipped a phone in her ear, muttered a few things under her breath, and passed up the next offered cookies. She leaned back, eyes going unfixed as she listened, a frown growing on her lips. Seems to be a perfect match for the news reports. Too perfect. Chris set down a cookie, wiped her hands, and took a close look at the wrist unit. It looked old, battered, pretty much the standard type of unit that anyone could buy for 20 bucks for the last 50 years. Chris reached up to move the overhead light. Inside the back of the unit was a mess. What's that crud? she asked. Harvey looked up from his paper, squinting. Looks like the gunk that gets in your wristband. You know, the stuff you clean out when you're supposed to be doing your homework. But inside the unit, bastard must have sweated a lot and never cleaned it. Slopped over inside, surprised it's still working. Harvey shook his head at such slovenliness. Let me see that. Oh, Auntie's eyes are getting old. True shook her head ruefully. She left the room, returning in a moment with a black box that Tom was immediately making loving eyes at. True set it down next to the unit, then began muttering orders to her computer. In a moment, tiny filaments sprouted from her box and weaved their way to the unit under study. Tiny, thin strands glistened in the light as they wandered over the surface of the unit's back. Then, two attached themselves to something. Those strands attracted others, and the filaments wove together into a solid pair of wires. Found the input and the output, True smiled happily. Chris frowned. Input and output of what? The real computer this bastard was carrying. Your poor old Aunt True has been wasting her time on the stalking horse they put there to distract her. Now we'll get at the real stuff. This may take a while. Do I smell cookies burning? That batch went into the trash can. While Chris made the next batch, True and Tommy leaned over the wrist unit, studying it with new respect. What's a two-bit punk doing with this kind of tech? Harvey asked. They've been surprising us with tech all along, Chris called over her shoulder as she put the next cookies in the oven. Yes, yes, True agreed. The old girl is getting forgetful. Chris wiped her hands on a towel and went to stand over her two favorite elders. What kind of computer is that? I've never seen anything like it. You won't for a few more years, True assured her. Self-organizing circuits will revolutionize wearable computers like my Sam and your Nelly, but the cost is out of sight. Some of my friends are using it for covert missions. Like this one? Tommy asked. True leaned back in her chair, eyeing the objects lying on her kitchen table, as if seeing them for the first time. Yes, 
like this operation. The following silence was broken by two beeps. Chris turned her attention to the oven, whose timer she had finally remembered how to work, while True returned to the center of their attention. Chris was starting to put the next dozen cookies on the sheet. Don't, True ordered. Put the dough in the refrigerator. Turn the oven off and put the cookies in a napkin. We're going visiting. Where? Harvey asked. New house. Chris needs to talk to her great-grandfathers, Ray and Trouble. Chapter 7 We can't bother them, Chris shouted, gulping hard. You can't, Harvey said bluntly, pocketing his reader. Her great-grandfathers need to fill Chris in on a bit of family history. True said, placing the computer parts carefully in a stasis box she had produced from a drawer under the table. They are at Newhouse. We are going to Newhouse. But they're doing important stuff, Chris pleaded. We can't bother them. More important than your life? Harvey cut in before Chris could figure out what kind of response that deserved. True. You won't get into Newhouse. They've got Marines crawling all over the place. They're applying the Mark I eyeball to all visitors and their credentials. You and all your electron magic will not get past the first eager Marine with an M6. Old-fashioned, are they? True sighed, closing the now full stasis box. Very old-fashioned, Harvey said. Then we'll have to go elsewhere. Harvey, take us to the Prime Minister's residence. No, Chris squealed. But her chauffeur was already moving toward the door. True on his heels. We can't bother the Prime Minister. He's got a full schedule. You can't just barge in on the man who's running the planet. Boy, did Chris know that. He will find time in his busy schedule. True paused, her mouth moving in subvocal communications with Sam. He already has. So has your mother. Chris hurried after True, Tom following her. My mother. Oh, no. She's got a social schedule booked solid till New Year's. Besides, you don't want to talk to my mother. Chris tried to chuckle. It came out sounding even to herself more like a terrified cackle. <laughs> Why do you want to talk to either of them? True and Harvey were at the elevator. Chris and Tom hurried to squeeze in as the doors closed. A woman, toy poodle in her arms, joined them on the next floor. The ride down was silent. What is it you think you have to talk to mother and father about? Chris asked, as she hurried to keep up Harvey's fast pace in the cool shade of the underground parking garage. Your life, True snapped, settling in the front seat beside Harvey. That left Chris and Tom the back seat. As she belted in, Chris still tried to stop the car. So the mission could have gone bad. That's part of the risk you take when you put on the uniform. Yeah. I want to talk to the Prime Minister about the equipment, but I was planning on getting him aside when he was in a good mood, maybe when he pins that medal on me. There's no rush, she insisted. God, you don't just barge in on my father, and definitely not my mother. No way. You check with their personal secretaries first, check out their moods, then you make an appointment to slip in. There are basic things you learn, when your parents run a planet. Chris, you are wrong. There are things involved here that you are unaware of. True turned to Harvey. Please hurry. I don't want to have to reschedule this meeting. People might notice what I've done. True smiled as she turned to Chris. People are so confident anything a computer tells them is true. It won't do to undermine their illusions. Satisfied that she'd said all that she intended, True faced front and began to mumble to her computer. 
Chris had seen True deep in consultation with her alternate self and knew better than to interrupt. Accepting the inevitable, Chris leaned back in her seat. Tom nudged her. We're about to meet William Longknife, the Prime Minister of Wardhaven? Yeah, Chris shrugged. That's my father. I'll stay in the car. If Tom thought he was scared, Chris wanted to find a deep hole to hide in. She knew what they were in for. She weighed several options, including leaping from the speeding car, and decided that if she couldn't wait in the car, Tommy couldn't either. You're with me. I deserve some backup. You were on the mission, too. You can tell Mother it wasn't so dangerous. It was. No, it wasn't. I had everything under control. If you say so. I do. You back me up on this. Tom looked none too sure about that. For a long moment, he eyed Chris, mouth half open. When he finally spoke, he surprised her. It's a bitch, you know, being an adult around the folks who changed your diapers. Despite everything, Chris found a smile slipping onto her face, Tommy was always good for that, and maybe Santa Maria wasn't so far from Wardhaven. Chris nodded. The bitchiest. Why can't they ever forget? And they didn't change all that many diapers, what with the hired help. Chris waited out the rest of the drive, reminding herself that she was a grown woman, had commanded a drop mission, and she was not going to let her mother or father buffalo her. She kept that mantra up as they parked in a reserved place in the basement of Government House, rode up a reserved elevator, and walked down a cold, marble, no-admittance hallway, doors opening before they came to them. Chris didn't know there were that many automatic doors in Government House. She'd always needed someone to open them. Nellie, remind me to ask True how she does that. Yes, her computer whispered. I would love that applet. Then, without going by his secretary's desk, they were in the prime minister's cluttered private office, and William Longknife, Billy to his cronies, was rising from his paper-covered work desk. So glad you could make it on such short notice, he said, extending his hand. It's critical we discuss... Father trailed off as his computer failed to fill in the expected words. As True shook his hand, his smile morphed into as much of a frown as the politician allowed himself. True, you haven't done this to me again. Afraid I have, Billy. Who else have you invited? Just your wife, True smiled, with teeth showing. Before the Prime Minister could react, the door to his front office opened, and Mother sailed in. Petticoats were the rage in Paris this year. Mother must have had on a dozen. I hope I'm not late. I must talk to my secretary. We went over today's schedule, and she didn't say a word about meeting you, Trudy. If I hadn't glanced at my wristwatch, I might have missed it entirely. As it was, I had to just throw on anything close at hand and rush over. Do let me catch my breath. Darling, you look divine, True said, pecking at the offered cheek. Your breathless rush has gotten you here before we could begin. Woman, you are a wonder. From their private talks, Chris knew just what kind of wonder True considered mother. A relic from the Middle Ages. How a woman could be born into the 23rd century and act mother's part was a wonder to everyone who met her, except that Chris knew several other women of wealth that fit right in with mother. No way I'm going to be like her, Chris swore. No surprise, mother threw only a nod at Chris. Never one for informal chit-chat, True folded her hands and began. As you know... Chris recently drew a rescue mission. Yes, father nodded. No, mother breathed in shock. It wasn't dangerous, darling. After all we've been through with... 
the sentence petered out, like all where Eddie's name might be mentioned. Mother, of course not. Chris immediately filled in the vacancy left by the sudden hush, trying to put just the right twist on the words to make them beyond doubt. I think we should all be seated, the Prime Minister suggested, pointing to a report-laden low table surrounded by worn couches and chairs where he had met with his closest staff. Father took the rocking chair at the head of the table, an affectation he acquired after reading about some other politician who reached the pinnacle of power at a young age. Unlike so many other of his fads that were dropped as quickly as Mother changed fashions, the simple wooden rocker remained. Father's bad back liked it. Mother took the overstuffed leather chair at the opposite end of the table, leaving the two couches in between for the rest. Chris hated it when her mother did that. It left her swiveling her head, trying to keep track of how each of them was reacting to whatever the other was saying. What about this rescue mission? Mother insisted. If it wasn't dangerous, why was the Navy asked to do it? Honey, the Navy would never put our daughter at risk, Father assured her. I followed the entire thing on net. He'd told Chris about the family addendum he'd put on his news search after Grandfather Alex did something with new enterprises that caused Father a lot of political fallout. Grandfather had resigned the Prime Minister's job and demanded his son give up his seat in the House. Not only had Father not left politics, he'd wrangled all his party connections into making him the next Prime Minister. The two hadn't shared a word since. You knew all about it and didn't tell me. Chris tuned out what followed. She'd heard it too many times. While mother and father did their individual theatrics, True cleared a space for the captured computer and attached its working parts to the table station. Unfortunately, I must disagree with you, Mr. Prime Minister, True said softly into a break in mother and father's battle of cliches. No, came from both of them. True had everyone's attention. Before I begin, let me point out what I am dealing with here, True said, pointing at the computer parts arranged on the table. Outward appearance is that of a very old, cheap, and battered wrist unit, and they are totally deceptive. Sprayed onto the inside of the case is the latest in self-organizing computer hardware. The cost of this alone? is several times the ransom demand. True raised an eyebrow to the Prime Minister, but did not state the obvious. Money was not the objective of this crime. Chris's father rocked back in his chair, hand coming up to rub his chin, but he said nothing. You must be wrong, Mother filled the silence. No one with money would behave like that. That was Chris's mother's inevitable answer to money. Not born to it herself, she worshipped it, now that her marriage made her the high priestess of lucre on Wardhaven. And since those with money had servants to do their work, they, of course, never did anything nasty. I've cracked two of the longer messages in his rather sparse collection of mail, True said. Here is one. They've taken the bait. Navy is being called in. Deploy greetings, appeared on the computer screen, recessed into the tabletop. What kind of greeting? The Prime Minister asked, leaning forward. Chris had a strong suspicion that greeting involved a very invisible minefield. Here's the other message, True said. We got the ship we want. Activate greetings. Assume plan B. Scrolled onto the tabletop. What kind of greetings? And what do they mean, the right ship? I hate it when people don't say what they mean, Mother snapped, in the voice that had made Chris jump when she was eight or nine. Now she hated it. True, for her part, leaned back into her couch and folded her hands. 
As she had so many times before when teaching Chris, True had laid out the problem. Now she left Chris to figure it out. Chris had learned to hate that, too. Where was a role model when a young woman needed one? Chris leaned forward, looking at the two messages. Assuming the typhoon was the right ship, the greetings were... The kidnappers, Chris began slowly. Had a field of Mark 41 landmines scattered around their hideout. Had we jumped as planned, we would all have been killed. Chris had intended to corner her father about the shoddy equipment, but the busted uplink to the ship had forced Chris to fly the LAC down, making a jump impossible, thereby spoiling the best-laid plans of the bad guys. Kind of hard to bitch about the equipment now. The Prime Minister mumbled to his computer link. Mark 41s haven't been issued yet, he repeated after his data link. Yes, Father, Navy doesn't have any, and a field of them would cost a hell of a lot more than their ransom demands. Christine Ann, a lady does not use such language, Mother contributed to their considerations. Between the traps that wiped out the first three rescue attempts, the mines, and this computer, True pointed out, this was a losing financial proposition. The Prime Minister rubbed his chin some more, raised an eyebrow to True, but said nothing. But who would do that? Tommy blurted out. Mother shot a freezing glower at Tom for interrupting, then an even colder one at Chris for dragging a stranger into something that clearly was a family matter. Well, it wasn't a family matter when I came here, Chris shot back, wordlessly. Then remembered, she was a serving naval officer, not just mother's little darling. Leaning back, she stared at the ceiling. I'm staying at Newhouse, she said. The place is crawling with guards. One of my great-grandfathers wouldn't happen to be in town, she asked the ceiling, wanting to make official what Harvey had given to her under the table. Both of them, Mother spat. Neither were among Mother's favorite people. Mother blamed Trouble for Chris's decision to join the Navy. This despite Trouble staying long and far from Chris with his job as president of Savannah's War College, the post he'd taken after retiring from chairman of the joint staff on Savannah. Ray had spent the last 30 or 40 years since leaving public life, mostly on Santa Maria, about as far from the rest of humanity as possible, with his youngest daughter, Alnaba, a researcher. Chris kept hearing rumors that they were going to crack the riddle of the three, real soon. The three species that built the jump points between planets. Hadn't yet. Maybe Grandpa Ray had finally met something he couldn't do. If I identified those troops roaming around Newhouse, they were Earth Marines. Chris found the hint of a grin start to wiggle across her mouth as she turned to eye her father. Who they're meeting with is on a need-to-know basis, young woman. Need I remind you you're in the Navy. I can have you transferred to the refueling station on Hell Froze Over, the Prime Minister pointed out. And darling, you should not have mentioned that my grandfathers are here, he added to Mother. You invited them to the reception tomorrow, Mother pouted. It can't be that secret. By then they should be done, the Prime Minister answered, a tinge of sadness creeping into his voice. Until then, we don't want it blasted all over the news. So, you are dividing up the fleet, Chris said, surprised she could get her mouth around the words. Father blanched. If he had any faith, it was in the Union, the absolute belief that humanity had to go to the stars as one. And the society was the embodiment of that union. It is my policy, Father said, hand going dramatically to his heart, and the policy of every prime minister of Wardhaven since we were admitted to the Society of Humanity, that humanity must go to the stars a single people. 
Father repeated the words Chris had heard hundreds of times. Missing today was the vigor and confidence that the policy would remain. Chris shivered and was startled by her reaction. In her mind's eye, she saw the green and blue flag of Earth and its society of humanity come down the flagpole, as it did every day at sunset. The thought that some morning was coming, when it would not go back up, brought a chill to her. How many times had she and her friends debated a new, more proper role for the society? Now their bull sessions were becoming reality. What would be the reaction if not only had a little girl been kidnapped by cheap, earthy scum, but that a long knife had died trying to free her? The words came ice cold from the logical part of Chris's brain. They were out of her mouth before she remembered Mother was on the other side of Tommy. Mother turned a stony stare at Chris, who ignored it. Mr. Prime Minister, Chris said to show she had not been coward. The hand that had been over his heart now took a worried swipe at his forehead. There would be an uproar against Earth, he said slowly. It would make my job much harder. And strengthen several different coalitions. Would it not? True asked. Yes. Including the Smythe Peterwalds of Greenfeld, True said. Now Father did rock back in his chair. Oh, the Peterwalds are such a nice family. Henry dated me in college, proposed to me on a beautiful moonlit night. Yes, Mother, we remember, Chris snapped, without taking her eyes off her father. Mr. Prime Minister, Chris repeated, wanting to hear what was going on in his political mind. No, he shook his head. No member of any government would dare do that. No policy is worth such a risk. And if it was traced back to a sitting government, it would crush it. They'd never get elected again, said the head of one government. He has a boy about your age, Christine. You ought to meet him, Mother added. I know, Mother. You've only mentioned him a million times. Have you told Chris about the Peter Waltz and Long Knives? True put in softly. I have told her. Many times, Mother insisted. No, Father answered. Mother cocked a questioning eye his way, but his eyes were locked on True. It has never been proven that the Peterwalds had anything to do with either the war or the drug trade. Just because Greenfeld is usually on the opposite side of a major issue from Wardhaven is no reason to ascribe personal motives to them. True shook her head. Someone was bankrolling unity before the war. You've read the histories. There was too much corruption at the lower levels. Hardly a dime of tax money reached Erm, yet he was doing more and more each year. When Ward Haven and the Long Knives broke the back of the drug trafficking, the Peter Wald's fortune vanished, and the family fled to Greenfeld. Ray forced them to give up Elysium after the Treaty of Ward Haven limited human expansion. You agree that the Long Knives have cost the Peter Wald's a lot of money? Yes. The Prime Minister was out of his chair and pacing around the room, his feet stomping into the plush blue carpet. But that proves nothing. There's not a damn piece of evidence that will stand up in a court of law. He whirled on True. And woman, I am a man who must deal in the law. True looked at the table, read from it. We've gotten the right ship. That ship was the Typhoon, your daughter's ship. It was minus a marine lieutenant. Normally, I would think that would be a very good reason to pick another. The skipper really wanted that mission, Tommy put in. The word around the station was that he was calling in all his markers with Commodore Sampson to get it. Understandable for a warrior, True agreed. Still... I imagine it was also common knowledge that Chris was on that ship, 
and that Thorpe was riding her pretty hard. How'd you know? Chris said. Just because I was Info War Chief doesn't mean I spent all my time with computers. I've known some hands on warriors who like the smell of powder and who'd need to know if you're a warrior or just some politician's daughter run away from home. If he was a politician, he'd have treated you with kid gloves. If he was a warrior, he'd push you. He pushed me, Chris grumbled. True turn to father. If I could put those pieces together, so could anyone else. The death of a little girl and a long knife in a botched kidnapping would get the entire rim up in arms. Internal passports limiting travel between Earth and the Seven Sisters would have passed by acclamation. The society would be shattered in all but name. Who said anything about the little girl dying? Chris tried to slow True down. What she was saying took Chris's breath away. Excuse me, I forgot. You haven't seen Plan B. True muttered to herself, and the screen on the table changed. No surprise, I found no reference to a Plan B in the computer. No Plan A, either. However, the police inventory of the lodge has two interesting items. First, two kilos of high explosives hidden in the bottom of the pack the girls' clothes were stuffed in, along with a radio squawker and detonator. Second, a tight beam radio set to the same frequency as the explosive squawker. As I recall, they were negotiating for a shuttle to take them to a starship and the ship to take them wherever they wanted to go. If the leader could manage not to be on the shuttle, he'd be in the right position to blow up the shuttle as it was rising. Chris breathed slowly. That's certainly the right gear for it, Tommy agreed. Blow it up just before it makes orbit, and pieces of shuttle will be coming down over half of Sequim. All that is supposition, the prime minister snapped. All this means nothing, mother said, cold and distant. It meant something to someone. Someone who wanted Chris and a little girl dead. Who would profit from such a losing proposition. Chris didn't know about the recent one on Sequim. She did want to know about the one ten years ago. Father, who offered to help you get the money to pay Eddie's ransom? Chris asked, into the growing silence. Christine Ann, mother snapped. That's enough, young woman father shot to his feet. Mr. Prime Minister, your next appointment is waiting, the intercom informed them. Send him right in, the Prime Minister said. Mother rushed for the private exit in a shower of petticoats, searching through her pillbox. She pulled two, no, three of the pink ones out and swallowed them down. Chris shook her head. Mother would probably not remember a thing from this meeting. True collected her computer parts as Chris and Tom stood. When the door closed behind Chris's mother, father put his face inches from True's nose. Trudy, you have gone too far this time. I've got 600 worlds flying apart. I do not need you setting my own family on me as well. I'll be doing good if I get a word out of that woman in the next month, he said glancing at the door his wife had just left by. He turned on Chris, his face cold rage. You, young woman, are staying here at the residency tonight. I don't want you hanging around this wild woman. Father, Chris cut in. There aren't any vacant bedrooms, remember? You just converted the last ones into offices for special assistance. The prime minister muttered to his computer, scowled at the response, then turned on Chris. How did you get here? Harvey drove us. Harvey will take you to Newhouse. You can do whatever a sailor wants to do on leave, but you will not talk to True. I can and will send you to Hell Froze Over if you bring this up again. Woman, he said at True, my chauffeur will take you home. This doesn't solve anything, William, True said. You can't run away from reality. 
This will solve it as well as anything can, the Prime Minister said, turning his back on them. True strode for the door Mother had used, just as the Prime Minister's personal driver poked his head through it. Chris, eager to beat a quick retreat, used the door she had come in, Tom on her heels. Halfway to the door, Chris stopped, causing a minor collision with Tom. Father, I really need to know how you arranged for Eddie's ransom money. He was adjusting his coat, putting on his formal face as he turned to the main entrance to his office. Since you insist, I will tell you. I went to my father, your grandfather, for the money. He didn't ask me for a damn thing. Now get out. Chris scooted out a split second before father opened the door to admit his next appointment. Chapter 8 is your da always like that? Tommy asked. The drive home had been full of poisoned silence. Chris was grateful for any break, even if there was no answer to his question. Chris had had a lifetime to get used to her family. Tommy had been dumped in the deep end. And, if Chris was honest, he had asked to be left out of the entire thing. What about my father's way of doing things are you curious about? Tommy shrugged. I don't know. Is he always so legalistic? I mean, if I told my folks someone was out to kill me, they wouldn't ask me if I had proof that would stand up in court. My father would, Chris answered easily. Then your da really would assign you to hell froze over. Oh, yes, she answered without a moment's reflection. His own daughter. You're kidding. I need a drink she announced, glancing out the car window and seeing her surroundings for the first time since she left her father's office. They were cutting through a corner of the university district. Harvey, let's stop at the scriptorum. Harvey didn't touch the car's controls. Miss Christine, I don't think that would be wise. And what have I done so far today that was? Will you tell the car to head for the scriptorum, or shall I have Nellie override you? I've had the car's security upgraded since you graduated from college, Harvey growled at her. And I've had Nellie upgraded. Want to see who bought the better upgrade? Harvey gave the car new instructions. Even though traffic in the university district was its usual mad scramble, the city computer found them a parking spot less than half a block from the scriptorum. There are advantages to having personal plates bearing PM-4. The scriptorum hadn't changed in the four or five months since Chris graduated. A new crop of freshmen had taken over the tables near the door. There was the inevitable bull session going at the seniors only table. Chris heard devolution and was tempted to join. But she wasn't a senior anymore. And besides, it was one thing to argue for or against Earth when it was just a game. Now it was for real, and she was a serving officer who would have to face what the hard changes brought. Somehow, the fun was gone. Chris settled for a table in the professor's section. Relaxing into her chair, Chris tried to see the place as she had for the four years of her college education. The diffuse lighting showed every crack and flaw in the fake brick, waddle and daub walls. Despite the aroma of pizza and beer, the overriding smell was of students, sweat, readers, and hormones, more like a library than a bar. The thick wooden tables were scarred by students' carved graffiti. Across the room was the table Chris and her entire 24th century problems class had carved their initials in on the last Saturday they met here. Old Doc Mead had refused to talk about the problems of 600 planets without a beer in his hand. So they eschewed their classroom and met here every Saturday for a semester. That table was occupied. A dozen students had covered it with readers, flimsies, and keypads. Some were actually concentrating on the work, while several couples among them concentrated on each other. 
Chris smiled at the familiar scene. What do you want? A waiter slash student demanded, with the usual lack of concern typical of service at the scriptorum. Tom passed the question to Chris with a glance. Harvey sat in his chair, back ramrod straight, his face a study in topkick disapproval. He'd driven Chris to school enough times, twelve years old and hung over as a deacon. Most likely, he'd turned her in to Grandpa Treble. Now, he eyed Chris with all the silent disapproval that any gunny sergeant ever put into a blank face. That answered the question of why Chris took so easily to the chiefs and gunnies at OCS. Hell, she'd grown up with one of them at her elbow. Of course, she knew what they were thinking behind those blank, formal faces they wore when they addressed the future officers. I'll have a tonic water, straight up with a twist of lime, Chris said. And Harvey relaxed, just that smidge that was all the approval he would ever give her. And it was all Chris ever needed. I'll have a soda, caffeinated, whatever they have on this planet, Tom ordered. Same for me, Harvey said. Right, Navy, the waiter said, and added as he turned back to the bar. Aren't you burrheads out of bounds? Chris blinked twice at the snide remark. Of course, they were in civilian clothes, but Tom and Harvey both sported the usual crew cut of the uniform services, and Chris's hair was a good two feet shorter and a lot more organized than it had been when she sat at Doc Mead's elbow, arguing for this or against that. Chris almost stood, called the kid back, and gave him a dressing down. That was what ensigns did to undisciplined ratings. But the waiter was no spacer, and as Chris took in the scriptorum with opening eyes, she was out of bounds for her kind. This room was chock full of cloud dreamers who had no idea of the cost of their wild plans or responsibility for paying them. Now that Chris had put her life on the line for a plan of her own making, this place seemed rather cheap, unreal, a waste of space. Almost, she got to her feet and marched out. Still, Tom had asked a question and he deserved an answer. Yes. If I crossed my father, he would get me assigned to hell froze over, and I'd spend the rest of my Navy career there. Tom looked blank for a moment, then connected her statement to his question of five minutes ago. I can't believe that. Chris noted that Harvey said nothing. Again, that silence was all the verification she needed. She was reading her old man right. My father is a politician, she told Tom. I once heard him say that a good politician is one who stays bought. Loyalty is about the only virtue I've ever heard him praise. If you're loyal to him, he'll move heaven and earth for you. Break faith, and he'll damn you to hell without a backward glance. You haven't seen the way he locked up when an ally of 20 years changed sides. He didn't even blink but that ex-friend never got the time of day from Billy Longknife again. Chris leaned back in her chair, took a deep breath, and let it out slowly. The pressures on my father must be hellacious. A quick glance in Harvey's direction showed the merest hint of a nod. His threat is real, but to hell with that. I don't want to add to the burden he's lugging. Tom pulled out his reader, began flipping through screens. Maybe I can hitch a ride back to Santa Maria from here. Ensign Longknife, I'm beginning to think that knowing you could be a career-ending relationship. If it isn't life-threatening, Harvey growled. Chris reached over and flipped Tom's reader closed. Get ready to march, crew, she ordered as the waiter approached with their drinks. As the kids slapped them down, slopping sticky liquid on the table, Chris stood. Tom and Harvey were on their feet with her. Scared he was about to be stiffed for the drinks, the waiter opened his mouth in protest. But Chris slapped down a bill equal to twice the cost of three sodas. That silenced him. My Marines pried a six-year-old girl from terrorists last week, 
she said, in a voice she'd learned at her father's knee and that carried through the place. But apparently, people who work for a living aren't good enough for this place. As the tables fell silent, she glanced at the one she'd sat at last year. You might add that to your problems of the 24th century. Everything worth saying said, she marched for the door. Tom and Harvey fell in beside her. In step, they quickly covered the distance to the exit. A couple of students were just coming in. They took one look at the phalanx bearing down on them and took two steps back, holding the door wide as Chris led her tiny detachment out into the sun. Then they quickly scurried inside and pulled the door closed behind themselves. That was fun, Tom grinned. Chris squinted at the blue sky above her, sun glaring down out of a fine spring day. We need to get Tommy a pair of sunglasses. Sunglasses, the Santa Marian echoed. Yes, you're in my gravity well now, spacer, Chris said, turning for the car. No space helmet visor to protect those baby blue eyes of yours. No suit between you and my son. You'll need some sunscreen as well, you pasty-skinned spacer. And why might I be needing all that? Harvey, my parents still keep the oasis at the lake. And the dock hands still check her out each week to make sure there's no problems, though the prime minister and his lady haven't been on her for five, six years. Their loss. Chris grabbed her fellow ensign by the elbow. Tommy, me boy, you are about to discover how great it feels to have wind in your hair, a tall ship beneath you, and a good star to guide her by, even if it is just to the other end of a lake. A real live sailing ship, Tommy enthused with underwhelming excitement. Any chance I could get Thorpe to let me hide out on the typhoon for the next six weeks? My bunk back there is looking better and better. Come now, Tommy. You've sailed the stars. Haven't you ever wondered how the ancients first sailed the seas of old Earth? No, I never wanted to swim either. Have no fear, me boy. I'll hit you up with a life belt that'll keep you safe should you encounter more water than you can drink. Just what I've always wanted, a bit of cork and plastic between me and suffocation. And what's a spacesuit? Chris laughed. Something I'm very familiar with. Harvey, to the lake. As the car slipped into traffic, Chris took a moment to commune with Nellie. Do a planet-wide search on Longknife and Peterwald. Every contact they or their businesses have had in the last 80 years. Then, expand the search to the entire society of humanity. Before you go too far, check Auntie True's computer to see anything she might have on the topics. True's computer has very good security, Nellie noted. Yes, but you might find a file or two in a less secure vestibule on Sam. Father told me not to talk to True, but I'm assuming that you and Sam are not covered by that. Beginning search. Chris relaxed back into the car's leather seat. Even if someone did want her more than the usual dead that she'd learned to live with as the Prime Minister's daughter, here on Wardhaven, she'd be her usual safe. She had six weeks to decide if a certain boot ensign had more than the usual problems of a Navy career to worry about. That was plenty of time. Growing up with a politician in the household, that was one thing Chris had learned early. Time could change anything. The next day, slightly sunburned, but happy as Chris could only be when a tacking wind had blown the cobwebs from her brain. She and Tommy were in starched whites as Harvey drove them into the driveway circle in front of the Museum of Natural History. Its immense ballroom had been dragooned into what Harvey grumbled was going to be the worst of a long line of back-padding jamborees. May they break their bleeding arms was the old trooper's fond hope. Tommy had done his best to duck out, but Chris had dragged him along, protesting all the way. What's there to worry about? No one's ever been hurt at one of these things, Chris assured her friend. Be my luck to be the first, 
Not possible. There's absolutely no way anything can go wrong, Chris said, with a confidence that evaporated as Harvey brought them into the drop-off circle. Several limos were already taking up parking spots there, including one identical to Chris's, except for the red and yellow paint dripping down its shiny black exterior. Whose is that? Tommy asked. Gary, riding shotgun, pointed his wrist unit at the blotched limo and punched a button. One of ours, number four. Had General Ho of Earth today. I thought we had the anti-Earth demonstrators far enough back. I didn't see any demonstrations, Chris said. So I guess we had them far enough away for you, Harvey drawled, as he pulled up next to an even larger white limo that needed four rear tires to support itself. Who owns that monster? Tommy asked. Again, Gary shot his query at a rig, then smiled. Thought I recognized it. Not too many like that one. Henry Smythe Peterwald the Twelfth's private battleship, Chris's security guard announced. Tommy raised an eyebrow as he opened the door. And didn't you say no one ever got killed at these shindigs? And didn't you say there's always a first time? Chris brogued right back as she measured the vast, hulking transport beside them. Body armor was light enough for unpowered battle gear. So what was all the weight that made that white elephant need four huge tires? How am I going to explain to me ancestors my coming before them with no descendants to carry on the family name? Tommy said as he stepped gingerly out and held the door for Chris. I'm sure your blarney-kissing Irish tongue will come up with a fine story to regale them, Chris answered, dismounted, and squared her shoulders. While it was true that real blood was never spilled at these affairs, the political equivalent of the red stuff could run knee-deep. Before, she'd just been father's darling daughter, mother's eligible debutante. Today, she was Chris Longknife, ensign, serving officer and medal recipient. Maybe she should rethink this. With a shrug, Chris joined the flow of people moving up the stone steps of the museum and into the rotunda. A six-meter-tall, horned and rampant tusker stood in the center of the room, more a tribute to the taxidermist art than to the actual creature that had terrified the original landers on Wardhaven. Most tusker habitat had been replaced by Earth-type flora, Still, a few herds managed to survive up on North Continent. The young Chris always considered this stuffed creature a thing of sadness. At the moment, it reminded her that today's power broker could end up as tomorrow's stuffed rug. And you wanted to be your own person. A part of her laughed. The high-ceilinged reception hall was resplendent in tall marble pillars, rich gray rock run through with bright streaks of reds, oranges, and blues. The vast expanse of plush royal blue carpet beneath her white shoes brought out the colors in the marble and made the cool power of the immense room even more overbearing. What a splendid room for this moment's great to celebrate their instant of glory. Chris took in the human company and found it rather shrunken by its surroundings. Most of the men were ignorable in white tie and black tails, tights, or trousers, as they chose, and not always because they fit well in them. Mother had set the women's fashion with a floor-length red dress that took up a good four feet around her, flounced out by at least a score of petticoats, Chris estimated. The top of the arrangement ended way too soon for Chris's tastes, in a tight, gleaming bustier that forced up what a woman had for all the world to see, except all the women were wearing them, and the men seemed too busy being seen to notice all the pulchritude around them. All the men, except Tommy. When Chris first put on the dress white's high-necked choker, she figured it for a torture device. Count on Mother to come up with a worse one. Chris, 
with nothing for the bustier to force up, was quite content behind her starched whites. Unfortunately, the whites did not bug out Tommy's eyes like the bustiers did. Mother held court on the far south corner of the ballroom, with most of the social women, parliamentary wives and the likes. Father, for his own reasons, circled through most of the men of parliament and business in the northern corner. Big Brother Hanovi, still in his first term in parliament, was right at father's elbow. He was learning the family trade from the best. Chris wished him well. The east corner was anchored by a fleet of admirals and generals. Captains and majors formed an outlying picket line that seemed to shelter the big brass from all but the most insistent civilians. Chris considered taking refuge in their ranks, but at the heart of it was another cluster of family, her great-grandfather's long knife and trouble. She had no idea how to handle meeting them for the first time in ten or fifteen years. Does an ensign throw her arms around an old general and give him a hug? Or stand stiff at attention and throw out a brisk, Good afternoon, sir. General McMorrison, chief of the Wardhaven staff, stood elbow to elbow with General Ho, the chairman of Earth's general staff. Around them was an unusually large contingent of other planetary staff chairmen. Somehow, Chris doubted she had the security clearances for their small talk. Resigning herself to the inevitable, Chris turned for the Prime Minister's contingent to see what official duties were assigned her. Before Chris reached father, Hanovi detached himself from the Prime Minister's elbow and moved to intercept her. Following in his wake was a new fellow who, judging from dress and crew cut, had to be a security agent. Chris smiled greetings to both. The agent actually nodded in her direction. Hanovi launched immediately into the business at hand. Little sister, you really have the old man bent out of shape. It's worse than when you ran off to the Navy. I do seem to have that effect. They exchanged a mutual shrug they'd mastered long ago for the inevitable. Well, I've calmed him down for the day. What do you say we don't risk you two having a bit of a chat? I could just circulate and smile and say a few nice words. Very few. Very nice words, Hanovi emphasized, with that irksome way that he had of making like he'd won Chris over to what she'd already surrendered to. Chris came to an exaggerated attention. Yes, sir. No questions asked, sir. Somehow, I doubt even the Navy can get that out of my little sister, Hanovi smiled. And sis, I do appreciate what you did for my campaign. Even father says, in his calmer moments, that you pulled my chestnuts out of the fire. Chris leaned over and gave her big brother, who was now a good two centimeters shorter than her, a peck on the cheek. Keep up the good work, brother. Make father happy. I will. Now shoo. The more long knives circulating, the more hands get shook. He quoted father's perennial demand, then glanced at each of the corners of the room, not under family domination. Say something nice to that officer clique over there, or to the veterans. You and I both know father could use all the help he can get on his right wing. And what with your medal and all, it can't but help. It was nice to know how risking her life was valued by her father. On my way, Chris said dutifully, turning away. Is that the way it is? Tommy asked, once Hanovi was gone. You mean politics first, nothing else even a close second? I guess. Isn't it business first in your family? Yes, but we have fun, too. Tommy, Chris said, glancing around, keeping her smile firmly pasted on her face. This is a very politically rich target environment, it's times like this that my family does its business. Think Harvey could run me home? Just smile and listen and nothing can go wrong, Chris said, tossing Tommy the minimum survival advice her father had offered when she was six. Opposite the active military was a collection of old veterans marked by their medals, proudly worn on the lapels and prim necklines of civilian clothes. 
Since they included no family Chris could recognize, she headed for them, but her progress was slow. Chris, I hardly recognized you in that white, one of Mother's socialite friends called loudly. Girl, it is so not your color. Chris sighed and paused as a matron and her daughter sailed down on her and Tommy. The mother simply bulged the latest fashion in all the wrong places. Her daughter's bulges were enough to make Tommy's eyes bulge out worse, and she had either rouged her breasts or was showing a few more millimeters than even Chris's mother displayed. I was hoping you would organize our summer fashion show the way you did last year, the mother gushed. You do have such a way with schedules and checklists and things. Mother, her daughter said, rolling her eyes at the ceiling. Even you can see she has other things to organize. Or are they letting you do much of anything, she said, looking Chris up and down. You are starting at the bottom, aren't you? A pennon or flag or whatever your rank is. Ensign, Chris provided. Behind her, a more interesting conversation was going on. There'll be no limit on the profit potential, son, assured a high-pitched voice. Once we throw out that bunch of scared old ladies in petticoats back on Earth that have kept a lid on our expansion... They're bleeding us white, making us settle every barely habitable planet in their expansion zone before they'll let us take another baby step outward. It's embarrassing that the damn treaty strangling our growth is named after Wardhaven. Well, I know that sweetie McMorrison, the matron went on. Maybe if I put in a good word for you, he could loan you for this year's fashion show. Chris muttered something like, Good luck, and turned away, as they did the same. She found herself face to face with a rotund businessman who went as red as his tie when he realized his last remark had been made in the presence of the great-granddaughter of the man who, as president of the Society of Humanity at the close of the Aitichi War, made the treaty limiting human expansion his last achievement before retirement. Chris smiled offered her hand and, as he took it reflexively, she said, without missing a beat, don't you think expanding the human growth boundary four times in the last 60 years showed a lot of courage on the part of those who fought the Aitichi? He sputtered something, and Chris passed on. How do you do that? Do what? Keep track of all the conversations and switch from one person to the next like some kind of computer, he said. Well, for one thing, I don't forget my name every time a pair of bouncing boobs comes at me. It must be great having your own nice pair to look at every time you take a shower, Tommy grinned shamelessly. Wouldn't know myself. I'd be glad to offer an opinion, Tommy said solicitously, then swallowed a laugh. Can you imagine the look on Thorpe's face when he gets orders to TDY you to cover a fashion show? Don't even go there, Chris said, trying not to cringe visibly. All she'd done to be just a regular ensign would vanish if General McMorrison gave in to that biddy. Chris, what are you doing in the Navy? I thought you were headed into politics, came from Chris's left. She paused to give a young woman who was actually dressed time to catch up with her. It wasn't enough time, however for Chris to dredge up her name. Chris smiled and offered a hand. I bet you don't remember me, the woman started. I'm Yuki Fontano, from up north in Tucson. You spent a week putting our campaign headquarters in shape for your dad's last re-election. Of course, Yuki, Chris lied. How are things up north? Hot as the dickens, and this early in the year, no less. I still can't get over how quickly you took that chaos and turned it into a cracking good show. Well, I have a bit of experience in that sort of thing. I bet you do, Yuki grinned. And I didn't know any of you, so I just started sweeping things up. And you were all kind enough to go along with me. When is Billy Longknife finally going to admit 
we have to have import duties to protect our industries from the cheap crap Earth spews out for its bulging slums, Chris heard behind her. A quick glance showed two older men in concentrated talk. And look at all these women, gussied up like Brenda Longknife. They look like Earth whores. Maybe now Billy will support travel restrictions. Christ on a crutch. In a few minutes, we're going to pin a medal on that long knife girl for saving one of our kids from a bunch of scum from the seven bitches. A good passport system would have kept those crooks where they belonged. If a long knife did it, his friend assured the speaker, it couldn't have been too hard. After all, the kidnappers were just two-bit thugs. All the inner worlds ever teach their kids in school is how to steal old ladies' purses. Yuki blanched. Chris shrugged, smiled, and went on her way. Why didn't you say something there? Tommy asked. Ever try to teach a pig to sing? I guess that would be a waste of time. So tell me, how did you turn the Tucson office on its ear so fast to impress Yuki? Just about anything is easy, Tom. If you don't care how successful you are, or if the people you're switching around are so honored to have you. I learned that the second time I got dumped in the middle of nowhere with orders to make a bunch of strangers work together and help get father votes. And joined the Navy. So they couldn't keep sending me off to wherever their bacon needed saving. The military stays out of politics, so now Ensign Christine Longknife will too. Of course, she finished. Whatever you do, smile while you're doing it. Smile, huh? Yes, and keep smiling. I know these two. Earth business is robbing me blind because of that ridiculous short patent life. Dr. Yu Ting, research professor of nanobiology, griped. Just about the time we get one of my ideas into production out here, those thieves on Earth declare my patent expired and start cranking stuff out for themselves. The Rim is doing all the research, and they're not paying us a wooden earth nickel for it. I say cut them loose and let them rot. We need a central patent law, Larry, and the Rim has been trying to lengthen patent durations. Dr. Mead, Chris's old political science professor, pointed out. And the last time the Senate passed it, that earth slave of a president vetoed the bill. L. Grant... When was the last time the Rim elected a president? Long knife, wasn't it? Oh, maybe one or two since. But so long as the president is a popular election, Earth and her seven witches will fill that slot. And we can't get a law through. As far as I'm concerned, we're better off on our own. Each planet for itself. We issue our own patents. We lock up our own files. Let those thieves try duplicating my work without my own patent application to rummage through. They are the largest market, Doc Mead pointed out, taking a sip from his drink. And they have the largest fleet, Chris said, joining the conversation on cue. Back in the Aitichi War, it was that fleet that saved us. That and Earth's billions to crew them. Hello, Chris. I see you've done well, Doc Mead beamed. Just did my job, Chris answered. Who cares about ancient history, the other growled. The Aitichi Empire has gone back to sleep, and nobody's seen any sign of another alien species. Thanks to the Treaty of Wardhaven, we really haven't done much hunting for aliens, Doc Mead pointed out. It's a big galaxy, and we've only touched its surface. You're sounding like some earthy with his head stuck in the sand. Chris nodded to Doc Mead and moved on, leaving him to the familiar argument. She was in a contest to shake as many hands as possible. A bar wasn't far ahead. Chris paused just long enough to get a tonic water. Tom finally got a beer. Close on her right were the vets she had been working her way toward. They were easily recognized by the medals they wore on their lapels. Veterans of the Aitichi War. 
These older women were probably the only ones in the room who had stayed with the coats, blouses, and flowing pants of that older era. Then again, Chris could think of no way to pin their battle ribbons to a bustier. The thought of Mother putting the golden sun blossom of the Order of Earth or the military medal anywhere on her getup made Chris smile. Several of the veterans returned her smile, and Chris easily gravitated toward them. As the Prime Minister's daughter, she had spent little time with these folks. As a serving ensign, they welcomed her. They did not, however, let her arrival interrupt the inner circle's ongoing topic. What these kids need is a good war. Too soft. Too soft by a straight shot, I tell you. A good war would give them some grit. Solid grit. Look at them. All got up like a bunch of hussies. Bunch of blind followers. A good war would teach them how to stand on their own two feet. And look who's leading them. That damn long knife and his scandals. Bastard never served a day in uniform in his life. A couple of hours with a good D.I., and that man would know which direction to lead. My D.I. would have given him a bit of backbone. <laughs> More than a bit. Got dry chuckles all around. A few of the insiders of the circle noted Chris's presence. It was kind of hard to not notice her whites against the garish colors circulating around the room. Gentle nudges were usually followed by glances her way, but there was no slowdown in grumbling about her father. Tommy seemed ready to withdraw, but Chris just let it roll. Once you faced an Aitichi warrior, a minor thing like a politician's daughter could hardly make you change your mind, let alone your favorite topic. It was nothing new to Chris. She'd heard it all before. Even some senior officers, Captain Thorpe included, felt kids today were only out to make their first million and damn the cost to the community. Duty and honor were lost on this generation, and the politicians leading them. In some corners, there was even a darker twist. The wrong people were running things. A good war would show the world who really deserved to be top dog. Eye contact and a smile exchanged with everyone. Chris turned away. You know, I can understand why these old vets are the way they are, she told Tommy. It's a lot harder to understand why someone under a hundred would sound like them. Could it be that you're kind of close to the folks that have it good? Tommy asked and answered. You saying I'm part of the problem? No, just maybe too close to one side to see the other. You in favor of charging out into the unknown? Hey, Chris, I'm from Santa Maria. We are out in that unknown. But even there, some folks see it one way, others the other. But we all have to live in the same galaxy, and somehow we have to do it all together. Any suggestions? If I had any, wouldn't I have told your old da the first time I saw him? Chris studied the room. Mother in her hen house was to her right. The military was ahead of her. Chris started across the room to see what she could do there, and ran into Commodore Sampson and Christine Longknife. I bet you don't remember me. A slightly gray, middle-aged man, impeccably dressed, said, holding out a beefy hand. Behind him, three, no, four security types that made the men around father look actually anemic, took her measurements, then went back to scanning the crowd. Now there were four people who weren't assuming no blood would be spilled here today. Hello, Mr. Smythe Peterwald. Chris said, making sure her smile didn't falter. What brings you to Wardhaven? Oh, there's so much going on. You can almost smell the future. This is where the real power is. So that's where I go. Once I get your old man past his family's bugaboos about limits on human expansion, there's a whole galaxy out there we can grab with both hands. Last time we tried that, we ended up with Aitichi tentacles wrapped around our neck, came from behind Chris. 
She turned to find her grandpa trouble, gleaming in dress red and blues, giving Peterwald a rigidly neutral face. The Aitichi Empire has been cowed for the last 60 years, Commodore Sampson pointed out. Some might say quiescent, Trouble noted, taking a sip from his beer. Their emperors never were much for expansion. But humanity must expand, Mr. Peter Wald said, low. Nothing can limit us. Why should we limit ourselves? That was the essence of the expansionist party's position. Humanity the Magnificent. Given her druthers, Chris would gladly go along with them. But the Aitichi almost made us, humanity, the extinct. Chris kept her mouth shut. Yes, Trouble nodded. Expansion is necessary. But managed expansion can make sure that we're ready for whatever we stumble into next time. At least as ready as we can be. The galaxy is a pretty vast place, Petey. And who knows what's out there? What do you think, Chris? Mr. Peterwald turned his smile on Chris. She tried to measure the sincerity behind it and came away with a plus or minus ten on a five-point scale. The galaxy's an interesting place, but I'm just starting to learn my way around it. Chris dodged, as she'd been taught. Father was not going to see any sound bites from Chris on this evening's opposition media report. You sound just like a careful young woman. Peter Wald's smile got even blander, if that was possible. Not a bad way to sound, Trouble nodded. Well, my son is with your mother's entourage. I hope you'll join me there later. I don't think you've met my son. No, I haven't had the pleasure. Well, maybe today. Yes. Chris stayed put while Peterwald made his way, smiling and glad-handing all the way, toward Mother's side of the room. Without a word said, Commodore Sampson turned his back on General Trouble and joined another group of officers. Chris took the time to catch her breath and check her smile. I hear you done good. Grandpa Trouble said, slipping one hand into a pocket and sipping his beer with the other. I got everybody out in one piece, sir. You gonna start surring your old grandpa? When we're both in uniform and in public? I think so, sir. Damn straight, he said. How bad is the mess? She asked him. That gave the old soldier pause. He studied the bubbles in his beer for a moment then shook his head and glanced at Tommy. Not quite bad enough that I wished you weren't wearing that suit, young woman. I think us old farts who still remember what a real war is like should be able to keep the forgetful and misinformed from doing anything stupid. He sipped from the beer. I hope. What you drinking? Tonic water, Grandpa. I still think your biggest problem was the pills your mom was pumping into you back then, to make you a nice girl. I doubt you're an alky. There are many things in life I don't need to know. Chris smiled at how gently he passed over what still brought her awake at night, cringing. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may have your attention, caused only a slight lowering in the room's ambient noise. You want to join us? Grandpa Trouble offered. You two are wearing the suit for it. And as I understand, you are our poster child today. If you don't mind, I think I'll stay where I am, Chris said, with Tommy nodding rapid agreement beside her. Afraid of a few old generals? You've got several galaxies of stars over there. It's your galaxy too, kids. Someday you'll probably be wearing your own constellation. Grandpa, we're serving ensigns. We are not cleared and we don't need to know the little asides you'll be passing around among yourselves. Your chicken? Hey, you faced mines and rifles. You can't be afraid of a few old men and women. Or is it just the two of us you're afraid of? God knows, with your family, you have a right to steer clear of your relatives. Not you, Grandpa. Never you. He took her arm. Reluctantly, 
she let him guide her around the room. Tommy followed, with all the enthusiasm of a ship being towed to the breakers. They passed through the outlying pickets without so much as a bobble. Father was presenting the first couple of medals to artists and bureaucrats as Trouble rousted a pair of three stars to make room for him and her at the elbow of Earth's chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Chris stamped a smile on her face and took the vacated seat between the two generals as Tommy took the opportunity to head for a safe, quiet corner. General Ho, this is my great-granddaughter, Ensign Longknife. While Chris struggled to remember, she was the prime minister's daughter and had survived situations worse than this, she rapidly went down the protocol requirements. He's uncovered, I'm uncovered. Do not salute. Wouldn't anyway. This is a social situation. Like hell it is. Chris returned his formal nod. I understand you did rather well by us. I did what any ensign would have done in the same situation, General. And don't you forget that. Being a long knife, that might not be so easy. Right, Ray? Damn. Her other great-grandfather had bounced a five-star from her seat on the other side of Ho. Just what Chris needed, a family reunion. She was still trying to figure out how to function as an ensign in a multi-star environment. And now she'd have to do the dysfunctional family thing as well. Oh, hell. If she survives it, she just might learn a few things, Ray agreed. The Prime Minister was going up the list and getting more long-winded as the recipients became more politically important to his party. However, the attitude of the military around Chris saved her from further reaction. They had been invited by their political masters, so they came. Still, as a mass, they sat, arms folded across their chests. Silent as embattled sphinxes, they faced out toward a society that did not understand them, rarely needed them, and pretty much ignored them. As Father reached the end of his unmercifully long list, he announced that the last award would be given not by him, but by General Ho, thereby passing over Wardhaven's own chairman, General McMorrison. True, Chris was serving in the Society's Navy, but the typhoon was built and crewed by Wardhaven and was, for all practical purposes, a Wardhaven ship. The Prime Minister was cruising for another lesson on the care and feeding of his own warriors, a lesson Chris would not give him. General Ho raised his eyebrows a fraction of an inch and the disapproving creases around eyes and mouths deepened a similar fraction among the generals and admirals surrounding him. Still, he made his way to the podium without hesitation. The master of ceremonies handed the general the folder with Chris's citation, then passed the medal to Chris's father. Chris had spent the last hour praying to every bureaucratic god in the pantheon that her family would leave this one to the soldiers who knew how to do it, all to no avail. Mother was sashaying onto the stage, her petticoats flouncing. It was rapidly becoming a bloody political circus. General Ho did not suffer political circuses, bloody or otherwise. And sit along, knife, front and center, he growled. The other recipients had glad-handed their way onto the stage, laughing, talking to father, or even shouting at people in the audience. Chris marched, shoulders back, head up. Her D.I. would have been proud of her. General Ho read the citation in a clear, gruff voice, ending with, Your actions, in the face of criminal acts and hostile fire, reflect credit on yourself and the Navy in which you serve. Chris blinked. In the past, such citations always concluded, and the Society of Humanity's Navy, in which you serve. General Ho offered her the award folder. Behind her, in their ghetto, high-ranking officers shuffled their feet, a virtual scream of opposition to what was missing. Chris sneaked a peek at the citation. The traditional phrase was there, in black and white. 
General Ho had omitted it. Was this his way of telling his fellow officers that the green and blue flag was coming down? The civilians, of course, missed this bit of drama playing out in front of them. They were on their feet as mother and father surrounded Chris. Mother, of course, pinned on the medal. Well, dear, now that you've got your bauble, are you ready to come home? She whispered as she managed to put the pin into Chris's left breast. A miniature of it will make a lovely pendant. I know a jeweler who could place a few diamonds on it and make it truly divine. Mother, Chris whispered back, intentionally shaping the word to echo her 14-year-old self and probably generations of girls. You don't just walk away from the Navy. They call it desertion, mutiny, things like that. Oh, your father was just telling me this morning that the Navy has itself in a budget bind. Aren't they sending their sailors home early? Yes, mother, but I'm an officer. We're just on half pay, and they want us back for half of it. Well, it seems to me that- Ladies, smile for the cameras, father ordered, through a clenched tooth smile of his own. Chris and mother obeyed. The ceremony self-destructed after that, as everyone went their own way. Mother and father had people to meet. General Ho had a lot of raised eyebrows to answer. Chris went looking for an out-of-the-way chair, where she could recover her naturally sunny disposition and stanch the need to order a real drink. She had expected to be mobbed, or at least respond to a few well-wishers. She found herself alone with Tommy, and free to observe. The chasm between the civilian and military parts of the ceremony was as glaring as the differences between what they'd done to get here. The civilians had built, discovered, made things happen, all for the greater glory of humanity, and their own, thank you very much. Chris had damn near got herself killed, so a little girl might live. Chris shook her head. General Ho muttered something under his breath as he left the stage. Something about them being so far out in left field, they didn't even know what game was being played, she said to no one. I didn't ask him who he meant, the audience or the generals, but I suspect I know what he'd say. Tommy looked around. It would fit both. Thus leaving Chris with a mental picture of trying to keep a baseball game going when the two teams never left right or left field. Chris watched as her great-grandparents circulated, trying to manage an endgame for the Society of Humanity, striving to resolve the tension between two factions, one with an almost religious faith that humanity had to be won, the other insisting everyone had a right to do what they wanted. Still, after the split between them was resolved, there would be two groups in each of the new factions, one playing for profit, power, and the glory it brought, the other going for self-sacrifice, power, and glory. Games within games. Chris looked into the faces around her. How much game-playing could the fabric of society survive? Chris came alert, as Grandpa's Ray and Trouble headed her way at the same time Mother did, with a young man in tow. Chris hoped Mother would flinch away. Trouble was Mother's least favorite person in the galaxy. No such luck. Chris resigned herself to more dysfunctional family than anyone should have to survive. Chris? I want you to meet Henry Smythe Peterwald the 13th. You two really should get to know each other. You have so much in common. Right, Chris thought. And if I marry him, my father-in-law will quit trying to kill me. The hard look on Grandpa's troubles and Ray's faces as they took in the young man left that answer in doubt. Young Peterwald, however, smiled sunnily and held out a hand. About Chris's age and height, he had the sculptured look that parents with too much money and ego gave children in these days of genetically manipulated offspring. Chris took the offered hand, but before she could say a word, her and Tommy's beeper went off in duet.
A quick flick of the wrist treated her to. Recall, your leave is canceled. Emergency circumstances on Olympia require your return to duty immediately. How's that for a reprieve? But Chris managed a frown anyway. Olympia? Where's that? Before Nellie could answer, Grandpa Trouble chuckled. Oh, that one. You've drawn a dilly again, kid. New colony, not yet 50 years old. Had a volcano blow on the other side of the world from the main settlement area. Lucky for them, Chris drawled. Hardly. Massive blow. Tossed enough gunk in the air that the planet skipped a summer. Total crop failure. Now, a current in the ocean offshore has gone missing, and they've been treated to the proverbial 40 days and nights of rain. They should wish they were so lucky, Grandpa Ray cut in. There are 12 months of rain and no end in sight. Looks like you'll have your work cut out for you, young woman. Starvation, flood, and, oh yes, complete breakdown of civil authority. Bands of heavily armed and desperate types roving the sodden landscape, fighting over what's left. Ray grinned at trouble. Yep, looks like the kid drew a nice one. Kind of reminds you of the good old days, Trouble laughed. Mother frowned. Young Peter Wald shrugged. And Chris, despite the bad news, felt like a ton had been lifted from her shoulders as she and Tommy excused themselves. Chapter 9 An old lieutenant at OCS had warned the candidates. Being in transit is the closest thing to being a civilian you can get while in uniform. And don't you smile at me. It's hell. And if you're a senior officer present, it's worse. Chris had only been in transit once, between Wardhaven and High Cambria. A commander had been senior officer present. He'd spent most of the passage in a corner of the bar he'd alternately designated Naval HQ and the O Club. Chris had buried her nose in anything Nellie could dig up on the kamikaze class and hadn't surfaced until the liner docked. Now, she wished she'd taken better notes. This trip, Chris was senior officer present. There weren't a lot of officers to choose from. First two, later four boot ensigns. But Chris graduated a seat ahead of Tommy, mainly because of her rifle range scores. The two ensigns who joined at Pitt's Hope were a whole week junior to Chris. Chris found that out from their files, because the two of them came aboard, went straight to their adjoining rooms, and never came out except for meals. Doubt the door between their rooms gets closed too often, Tommy scowled. The door between Chris's and his rooms stayed closed, except when Chris needed help on official duties, like going over all the vaccination records of her personnel. Chris signed for all the Navy personnel that came aboard, as if they were sacks of potatoes. She also had to verify everyone was up to date on their shots and had all they needed for Olympia. Unfortunately, those requirements were subject to change. Conditions on Olympia were bad and getting worse. Not only was the planet incubating all kinds of new bugs, others that healthy humans kept under control were turning pandemic. Typhoid, Tommy yelped. I thought we wiped that out a couple of hundred years ago. So did I. But there must have been a carrier on Olympia, because now people are getting sick. That particular problem left Chris pacing the dock at High Pitt's Hope, waiting for a hastily ordered shipment of vaccine as the good ship SS Lady Hesperus prepared to raise the gangplank and leave. The vials arrived just seconds before the ship's third officer's fourth deadline expired, so Chris was not left on the station as the ship pulled away. Chris was none too sure she would have minded that. Chris doubted the Hussy, an ancient wreck of a liner, had ever been a good ship. Although none of the merchant crew advised them to, Chris quickly learned to strap herself into her bunk at night and hold tight to her mess gear. 
it seemed that Hussey's engineers had trouble maintaining a steady burn. The ship's accelerations and decelerations were subject to wild excursions from a small fraction of a G to three Gs and back again, without benefit of warning. The civilian crew's laughs and jeers left the passengers feeling more like zoo exhibits than naval personnel on their way to save a planet. A glance through their records showed Chris why the rest of her shipmates took so long to learn how to survive the hussy's wild ways. For many, this was their first time in space. Most were raw recruits, fresh from boot camp. Some had not even finished basic training, as their confusion on even how to wear the uniform showed. Chris flagged down one of her third-class petty officers and ordered him to square away a few of the worst offenders. He said, Hi, aye, aye, ma'am, and headed for the problem child. Yet when Chris looked back, the P.O. had taken a hard right into the bar, and the recruit was still as much a wreck as before. Now Chris took a deep dive into the personnel folders at her disposal. She came up shaking her head and knocking on the door between her and Tommy's room. Come on in, he shouted. She found him deep in a reader. Have you seen our troops, she said, waving her own reader. I believe so, sad to say. No, I mean their records. We've only got two second class and four third class POs. All are in their second or third enlistment and were pulled from advanced schools for this job. Wardhaven dollars to donut holes, under the latest policies, they'd never have been shipped over. Kind of makes you suspect that a posting to Olympia is the Navy's way of telling all involved to shape up or get out, Tommy said, not even looking up from his reader. Maybe just get out. Chris did not ask him what he thought that said about the two of them. Was father trying another approach to getting her back where he wanted her? No way, Mr. Prime Minister. Did you know the Olympic system has seven jump points? Tommy asked as the pause lengthened. No, she said, coming over to glance at his reader. It showed Olympia and its surroundings. Thing is, from those seven jumps, you can get to just about anywhere in human space in two or three more. That would seem to make it a great trading point, she mused. Would seem so. So why are they sending the dregs of the fleet here to do a bit of this and a bit of that for it? Now Chris did frown. Nellie, what's the organization on the ground for this mission? Nellie took longer than usual to start populating Chris's reader with an organization chart. I am sorry, Nellie apologized. The daily reports do not balance and change from day to day with no explanation. Tommy raised an eyebrow at that. Even as boot ensigns, they'd learned that the Navy took daily reports, or, for that matter, any reports, very seriously. Who's running this show? Lieutenant Colonel James T. Hancock, SHMC. Nellie said. Him, Tommy breathed. Must be two of them, Chris assured him. But she didn't have Nellie check that out. There were some things better seen first. Instead, she glanced over the table of organization. Mercy missions like this one didn't have to follow any definitive structure. Commanders were free to improvise on the ground. However, they usually followed the structure of a battalion or regiment, depending on the size of things. Olympia wasn't close to battalion strength, say, 200, plus or minus the 30 the daily reports couldn't agree on. But the org chart looked like amoebas doing one of Tommy's Irish jigs around the CO's box. Communications, medical, intelligence, finances, supply operations, MPs. Tommy said, all reporting direct to the CO. And then there's this huge admin section with most of the personnel. Notice what's missing? Chris said. Tommy looked up at her, then rolled his eyes at the overhead. All tail, no teeth. Right, 
all tail, no hands giving a hand out. Maybe it's all in Edmund, Tommy suggested. We wait and see, Chris sighed. Father might be right. Today's troubles were enough to keep her busy. Maybe tomorrow's troubles would solve each other before they got to her. Chris wondered if maybe her father really was an optimist. Two days later, Olympia was large in the viewport, giving Chris her first look at the mess she'd drawn. The orb reflected brightly about what Chris expected when an island 30 clicks long and a dozen wide blew itself to dust. Despite the gunk in the atmosphere, she could see another line of storms blowing in from the ocean to add more to a ground already saturated from big, weeping clouds trying to make it over an inland mountain range. The desert behind showed recent signs of flash floods. Even the rain shadow was getting soaked. You the woman in charge of these hellions wrecking my boat? Chris turned to find a pot-bellied man who hadn't shaved in days lumbering down on her. What might pass for a grimy captain's hat barely hung to his head, a flimsy in his hand. I believe I am senior officer present, Chris admitted. Sign here. And this says, I'm delivering 96 enlisted and four of you officers to the Olympia Emergency Services Command, per my contract. Nellie, do we have 96 enlisted personnel? Chris had studied their files. She'd never done a count. Yes. Chris, shuttle is loaded, Tommy called over the net. Do you have 96 enlisted personnel on board? I don't know. Have them count off. Tommy's voice disappeared for a long minute. Then he was back with a crisp, 96 enlisted personnel present, ma'am. Me and the other two ensigns are waiting on you. Be there soonest, Chris said and signed. I want a copy. The captain produced a second flimsy from beneath the first. Chris's signature had carried through. Thank you, Captain. With luck, we won't be sharing a ride again. Chris hefted her bag. Marine battle dress was the uniform of the day, the night, and next week for this operation. The ancient warrant officer on Wardhaven who briefed them had taken great delight in pointing out that new ensigns were permitted to get their hands dirty on this tour. From the looks of things, there would be plenty of chances. The shuttle ride was bad made worse as one after another of the new recruits lost his or her lunch. If Chris hadn't strapped herself in so tight, she might have gone up front and relieved the pilot. Then again, flying a skiff was one thing. A hundred-passenger shuttle was quite another. As it was, they were lucky. Port Athens was in between the worst of its daily parade of storms. The landing, however, was a whole new experience. Upon dismount, Chris found a rutted runway dotted with potholes. Don't these people have any pride? A recruit snorted. Back on Hardly's Heaven, we'd never let concrete get this bad. Your runway might not look so sweet after a year of acid rain, a local unloading the cargo bay snapped back. Natives appear to lack a sense of humor, Tommy noted. I think it washed off with most of those buildings' paint. Between red streaks, the terminal showed patches of its original paint. It might once have been a gay jumble of blues, greens, oranges, and others. All were dull now. Two buses rolled up to the shuttle, but their doors stayed closed, while Chris's troops collected in the rain. Only when the trickle from the shuttle cut off did the bus doors open. A couple of dozen troops made a dash for the shuttle through the rain. There was no order in their leaving, no structure in their mad stampede for the freedom ride. Few had any attention for their replacements, other than an occasional obscene shout or gesture. Tommy watched them, then gave Chris a shrug. With the buses empty, the other two ensigns grabbed the front seats on the nearest one. Are they avoiding me or ignoring me? Chris muttered, standing in the rain as she oversaw the boarding of her 96 enlisted personnel. Maybe they've noticed that things can get lethal around you, Tommy said, 
a lopsided grin taking only part of the sting out of his words. And you? Chris shot back. I have the luck of the little people, he assured her. Then you and your little people take charge of that last bus. I'll handle the one with our prima donnas. Didn't anyone ever tell them that seniors enter a vehicle last? Tommy glanced up, blinking into the pouring rain. Whoever made that rule didn't spend much time on Olympia. Tommy headed for his bus, and Chris took the other and found herself stuck standing, the 51st person aboard a bus intended for 48. A young spacer with a badly broken out face offered her his seat. Mother or father would have taken it without a second thought. Chris couldn't picture Grandpa Trouble doing the same. She stood for the 15-minute ride. The drive was as dismal as the port. The roads were more potholes than road. All the buildings showed the effect of water's constant assault. Somewhere, a sewer main had broken, adding its stink to the misery. People plodded along, heads down, shoulders hunched against the latest downpour. Several windows gaped broken. A store had been burned out. Chris's crew grew quiet as the sights of desolation and despair accumulated. They pulled into a compound, rusting barbed wire setting it off from the buildings around it. To the right was what might have once been an office building. Society's green and blue flag had been painted on the plywood that filled a broken window. Across a drowned and muddy park, two hotels rose, one to four stories, the other to ten. The driver demanded Chris hurry her charges off his bus. He had other places to go, other fares to earn. Chris doubted that, but the buses were civilian, and the Navy always kept its people moving. Unfortunately, that just meant her troops hurried off the bus to stand in the rain. The truck that had followed them with their gear pulled up behind them. Its two civilians started tossing duffels into the deepest puddles around. Okay, troops, let's form a line, single file, Chris ordered. To draw your baggage, you, you, and you. She pointed at the biggest men in the ranks. Go help those civilians unload the truck. See that the kits land on dry land. That helped. The duffels started landing on their bottoms, standing where Chris could read the names on them. She rethought having the troops file by. Calling out names might work better. Is anybody in charge here? Tom whispered to her. Chris's curt answer died in her throat as she caught movement out of the corner of her eye. The admin building's door opened. A Marine officer in battle dress strode out, back ramrod straight, a battleboard slapping purposefully against his hip. There was no question who was in charge. From the scowl on his face as he took in this new addition to his command, there was also no doubt about his opinion of them. A ten hut, Chris ordered. Who's in charge here? Came from the officer, more a challenge than a question. I am, sir, Chris fired back, not hesitating a moment to take on her responsibility. And who might you be? Ensign Longknife, sir. Right. He eyed her for a moment, didn't seem to care much for what he saw, then turned his back. Form your personnel into two divisions, Ensign. An easy command, but one there was no way Chris could obey properly. By all that was good, holy, and navy, Chris should turn to a chief and order him or her to form divisions. Anything else was on officer. But all Chris had was a pair of second-class petty officers who'd shown no initiative on board or since arriving. No, what delusions of leadership as was here consisted of her and maybe Tommy. What had Grandpa Trouble said the morning he picked her up for the first skiff ride, without clearing it with either of her parents? If you're going to be damned if you do, and damned if you don't, then do it with panache. She turned to Tommy. And Celine, form a division of your bus team. He saluted. Yes, ma'am, did a snappy about face and stepped into a deep pothole. 
Still, he kept his balance as he marched away. Chris turned to face the milling group of sodden spacers and marines. My busload, form on me. Petty officers will form files to my left. As a suggestion, she pointed to where she wanted the few crows among them to stand. They took the hint and did so. Chris had one second class and two third class. That gave her enough for her first file. Dress right, dress. Got the petty officer's arms out. It began to dawn on the rawest recruit that they should have somebody's fingers touching their right shoulder. It caught on. Twenty meters to Chris's right, Tom's busload went through the same drill. In a surprisingly short time, the mob transformed itself into two divisions of three ranks. They were still getting soaked and growing more miserable, but they looked navy. The other two ensigns watched all this from a dry overhang, as if this was for their entertainment. Chris followed Hancock's lead and ignored them as she did her own about face, saluted, and reported. Divisions are formed, sir. All new arrivals are present. The lieutenant colonel turned, a scowl still occupying most of his face. You have a manifest, ensign? Chris dug it out of her pocket. She could just as easily have beamed it from her computer to his battle board, but he was doing this the old-fashioned way, and he had the rank. The officer took the paperwork. Without a glance, he pocketed it. Welcome to Port Athens Marine Base. I am Lieutenant Colonel Hancock, and that is all the welcome and thanks you can expect to get here. Those of you who joined up to do good, look around. This is as good as it gets. Enlisted will be issued web gear and rifles. Carry them with you at all times, on duty or on base. You will not take them off base while off duty. Officers. His glower got worse, if that was possible. You will also draw web gear and side arms. If you are smart, you will draw a rifle too. If you don't know how to use one, learn. I've shipped three of you ladies home he growled at the massed troops. One may actually get to keep that arm. I've shipped three people home, and the only return fire so far has been from a young woman who managed to shoot a local with his own gun. She says it was self-defense. He has witnesses to the contrary. She's being tried by a jury of his peers, since she did it off base and on her own time. My advice to you boys and girls is to stay on base and consider all your time my time. Do it, and you just might make it home to your mommies. He turned to her. Anson Longknife, is it? You're one of those long knives. Chris turned her head, just enough to look him in the eye. Yes, sir. She didn't add, general trouble sends his compliments, despite the temptation. Trouble would not send any kind of compliment to Colonel Hancock. Not that Hancock. Figures, he scowled. Well, Ensign, have your booties report to admin, then draw their web gear and check into their billet. If they hurry, they just might get some chow before the mess hall closes for the night. Admin will see they get issued ration chits and work assignments. I advise you to turn in any cash you're carrying, as well as your personal credit cards. It's worth your life to carry them around here. He redirected his scowl from the troop formation to the two ensigns, then Tom, then Chris. You officers see me when you're done. Yes, sir, Chris saluted. The wave she got in return might have been aimed at an annoying insect. Chris turned back to her troops. They looked as stunned as she felt. If that was what passed for leadership around here. But that was not their problem. The rain was coming down harder, and Chris looked to be the only officer around that gave a damn about them. Petty officers, fall out and call the names on those duffel bags, Chris ordered. On that bit of guidance, the troops got organized. Chris set up a smooth flow as troops collected their duffels, lugged them into the office building in front of them, where admin took up the ground floor. 
From there, they moved to the armory to draw their web gear and weapons. With no bunching up, her new arrivals proceeded fairly smoothly to their quarters, and from there to Chow. Of course, the last to have their name called would be soaked to the bone. As luck would have it, the two other ensigns' names were called very quickly. They took their gear and headed inside. Chris's bag was also called early. She made a note of where it lay in the mud and stayed with her shrinking command, taking over from a name caller when he found his own bag. With a pained expression, Tom took the place of the second caller to find her duffel. When the last person's name was called, Tom and Chris followed the sopping wet spacer into admin, their own waterproof boots squishing and contributing a liter or two to the deep pools flooding the tiled hall. Did we have to do that? Tommy asked. Grandpa Trouble would have tanned my hide if I'd left them out there alone in the rain. No one in my family would have complained. What do you say next time we flip on it? Heads we follow my family, tails we do it your way? You two are late. I finished with those other officers an hour ago, a hulking, first-class petty officer whined. You're making me late for dinner. You would have had to wait for all these, Chris waved at the rest of the crew checking in. Nope, I just had to wait for you officers. Colonel told me to make sure you got your quarters, orders, and chits. Then I'm done for the day. Thought the colonel suggested we work sun up to sundown, it was safer, Tommy pointed out. Who wants to live safe? Listen, there's a lot of desperate women out there. Amazing what a little hard cash can buy. The first class glanced at the papers he was handing Chris. Oh, right. You're a long knife. You can always buy anything. Chris signed her chit and kept her money to herself. Where's the leading chief, the armory, and the chow hall? You're looking at the closest thing we got to a leading chief, ma'am. We enlisted swine ain't drawing half pay during this clusterfuck. Nobody comes here lest they piss somebody off big time. And you? Chris asked. He ignored the question. The armory is across the way in the short quarters. The chow hall's in the tall one. They close in 30 minutes, so I'd shag my ass over there pronto. Thanks for the advice. Chris looked at her orders. I'm reporting direct to Colonel Hancock. Hardcock wants to keep down the overhead. Besides, he ain't got all that many officers. Couple of do-gooders. Most senior officers would rather go on half pay than go here. You'll see soon enough. Now, I'm done and I'm out of here. He turned for the door. Somebody turn off the lights when you're done. Tom stuffed his orders and chits into the pockets of his battle dress. It's so nice working among happy people. Think it'll get better? Chris stowed her paperwork, then hefted her duffel. Don't know, but I think I'll draw a rifle and sidearms first, then risk eating. Chris drew web gear, rifle, and sidearm, stowed her gear in her room, locked her rifle down in the floor's weapons bay, and raced into the chow line five minutes before it closed down for the night. What they slapped on her tray would win no awards, except maybe from a pig swill purchaser, but it filled an empty stomach. She and Tom were just getting the first forkful in their mouths when their beepers went off. Chris waved to Tommy to keep eating. She had a strong suspicion what this was about. Ensign's long knife and lean here. What can we do, sir? What the hell's keeping you two? Colonel Hancock growled. Just enjoying a delicious, nutritious meal, sir in the dining hall. Exactly what a growing girl needs, Colonel. I told you to report to me as soon as you were done. Tommy started to get up. Chris waved him back to his seat. Yes, sir. I plan to do that, sir. We saw that the new arrivals were processed properly, got our assignments and chits, drew our web gear and weapons, stowed our gear, and got our weapons locked down, and we're just enjoying the first mouthful of this wonderful meal they're serving in your dining hall, sir. We should be with you in another 30 minutes. What are you going to do? Take a walk in the moonlight? Might, sir. It's actually stopped raining for the last two minutes. Tommy's eyes were bugging out. Chris just smiled. 
Long knife. Get your ass over here in 15 minutes or keep walking. Understood, Colonel. See you in 15 minutes, Chris said, punched off, and reached for her second bite of dinner. We can be there in five, Tommy gulped. And add heartburn to our problems? Nope, I'm eating it nice and careful. Like a long knife? Chris studied her tray as she chewed unidentifiable and probably indigestible food. Don't know. Maybe I am letting myself be guided too much by a couple of Grandpa Trouble Sea stories. But Tom, when you draw hell for a billet, you can either run with the demons or run at them. Got an opinion? One who battles with demons needs a dragon at her side. Is that some old Irish saying? No. Mine, based on spending too much time too close to you. Chris rapped on Colonel Hancock's door exactly 15 minutes after she rang off. He was seated, feet up on the desk, face in a reader. She and Tommy filed in and came to attention in front of his boots. He glanced up, took in the clock on the wall, then went back to his reader. Took you long enough. Yes, sir, Chris answered. The warehouses are shambles, the colonel said, not looking up from his reader. Straighten it up. For some reason, we're only issuing bags of rice and beans to the people hereabouts. There's got to be a better diet in that warehouse. Find it. Yes, sir, Chris said. Waited. Nothing further happened. She saluted the colonel's boots. Tom joined her. Colonel Hancock threw her another wave. She led Tom in an about face and they marched from the office. What was that all about? Tom repeated his earlier question of the evening. A game, Chris said. Do you know the score? I think we're ahead on points, Chris guessed. Where's the warehouse? Nellie had no answer to that question, so Chris went looking for the duty section. Down the hall from the colonel's office, they found what might be one, two guys sleeping in their desk chairs. Where's the warehouse? Chris asked, twice. One woke up, looked around, saw Chris, reached for a sheet of paper, and tossed it her way. Chris eyed it. It did show an arrangement of streets. She rotated it slowly, trying to match the streets to what she had seen on the drive-in. The map worked best if you held the paper at a 30-degree angle. Looks about two blocks that way. Chris concluded. You going there tonight? The only slightly awake sleeping beauty asked, getting comfortable again in his chair. Plan to, Chris answered. Take your pistols. Chris left the two to their dreams. A sloppy bunch. Think we should have woken them up? Tom asked. If they feel safe sleeping just down the hall from the colonel, do you think two boot ensigns could get them excited? What kind of navy is this? I thought you'd recognize it, Ensign Lean. This is the navy your preachers talked about. This is Hell's Navy. Chris stopped by the locker to collect her M6. She had to remind Tom how to lock and load his weapon. Together, rifles slung over their shoulders muzzled down to keep the rain out. They walked the two blocks to the warehouse. Actually, several warehouses all surrounded by barbed wire. A civilian guard stood at the gate, his rifle also muzzled down against the beating rain. Who are you? greeted them. Ensign's long knife and lean. I'm in charge of the warehouse facilities here in Port Athens. I've come to inspect them. You can't. It's dark. So I noticed, Chris said, taking in the warehouses. The area was bathed in light. Several trucks were backed up to the loading docks. Looks well enough lit to me. Listen, I don't know who you are or what you think you're doing here, but you don't belong here. Get lost while you can or I'll... The rifle started coming Chris's way. Chris doubted she could outrun a bullet. But at the moment, the rifle looked within reach. Without thought, Chris grabbed for the muzzle. Her hand wrapping around the cold gun metal sent a shock through her. You're crazy, woman. Still, it seemed like the kind of thing Trouble would do. The guard looked just as shocked to see her hand on his gun as she was. 
He struggled for a second, but she yanked the weapon from his grasp and brought the butt up under his chin. Looks like we need to have a little talk, Chris growled. Up close, under the lights, Chris got her first good look at the guard. A kid of maybe 13, he stared through wide, round eyes at his rifle in her hands. What's going on here, Chris demanded. Running her brother Hanovi's campaign, she'd walked into some messes. Of course, most of Hanovi's campaign crew didn't carry guns and looked a lot less hungry. For an answer, the kids started screaming out names. Chris brought the butt up hard on the erstwhile guard's jaw, just like they did in the vids, and to her surprise, his eyes rolled back and he slumped into a mud puddle. However, heads popped out of trucks and loading dock doors. Chris had the attention of a good 20 or 30 folks. Time for a campaign speech. You are trespassing on government property, she shouted, and ducked as a rifle came up. The round was high, but Chris felt a distinct lack of cover. Ducking, she brought her own M6 up and snapped off a three-round burst, likewise over her target's heads. People piled from the warehouses into trucks. Motors came to life. Is there any other way out of this warehouse? Tom asked from his fighting position at the bottom of the largest pothole available. I don't think so. So they'll be leaving right over us? He squeaked. Oh, God, Chris breathed. She need not have worried. Trucks turned away from her and, with a few more shots over her head, smashed a hole in the fence opposite the formally agreed-upon exit. Chris stood only after the last truck was long gone. She glanced down at the kid. What are you going to do? The terrified youngster asked. Send a message, Chris said, using the muzzle of her M6 to signal the boy to stand. He looked painfully thin. His clothes needed patching. Who hired you? I'm not going to tell you nothing, lady. What's your pay for this? A sack of rice. My mom, brothers, sister. They're hungry. Come by the warehouse tomorrow. You work for me. I'll see your people get fed. And tell the folks you were working for that if they come back here tomorrow, I'll see what kind of jobs I can find for them. They come back tomorrow night, they'll be armed Marines walking the perimeter. Tell them there's a new broom in the warehouse. They can change and eat or try to do it the old way and starve. The kid's face changed as she spoke. Terror drained out. Dismay and shock were there for a while, along with a large dash of doubt. But he was nodding his head as she finished. He started backing away, careful-like. Chris watched until he disappeared into the dark. What do we do now? Tom asked. Well, unless you want to spend the rest of tonight walking fence, I say we go back to our rooms and get some sleep. I strongly suspect tomorrow is going to be a bitch of a day. But the fence, it's wide open. So I noticed and likely to stay that way until we get it patched. Kind of inviting to anyone who wants to wander in. Hungry women, kids, anyone at all. Check me out on this, Tommy. We are here to feed people, right? Right. Well, if a few people want to help me in the distribution of the food, that's fine by me. Then why did you shoot at those trucks? Because they had guns. How much of that food do you think they were planning on sharing? <laughs> right, he snorted. Count on a politician to care more about how they do it than what they do. Chris thought she was just being practical. With a shrug, she turned and headed back to the main compound, now shouldering two rifles. What else can you do, Tommy? Nine times out of ten, perspective has more to do with the final result than anything you do perspective, and getting some results. At the base, Chris paused in the rain. The colonel's window was still lit, the only light showing in the admin building. What is it with him? Tommy asked, shaking his head. There was trouble on a planet, dark under, Chris said. Farmers didn't think they were getting fair trade for their crops, 
Happens every once in a while. Hancock led a battalion of Marines dispatched to keep order. Some reports say he was too friendly with the money interests. Others say he just had a bunch of battle-sharp troops. Anyway, standard crowd control methods didn't seem to be working, and somebody thought machine guns would be better. Lots of recriminations. Hancock was brought up on charges, but the court-martial found him not guilty. So he is that Hancock. Yeah, even on Santa Maria we heard about him. Media about went ballistic. How could the man be found not guilty when a hundred unarmed farmers died? You know many farmers on Santa Maria? Chris asked. A few? I know a few generals. They felt Hancock did his job. He stopped a bunch of anarchists from murdering, raping, and pillaging in the streets. You agree with them? No, but I understand them. I also wonder if the Navy had sent two or three battalions to Dark Under, if the crowd wouldn't have seen the wisdom of going home early before anything got out of hand. Anyway, Hancock was exonerated by the court. But you can see what kind of assignment he drew next. Yeah, but I don't understand it. Brass won't hang him because the civilians want him hung. But they don't want any other officer making the mistake of thinking they can get by with that kind of failure. Since he didn't do the honorable thing and quit, he's here, having his nose rubbed in the fact that he's a failure. Tom glanced around at the compound. Does look like a mess. And I suspect it will only get worse. When I was in college, I read an essay on leadership by Grandpa Trouble. He had a lot to say, but the thing that struck me was his idea that leadership depended on belief, maybe even illusion. Belief. Illusion? Tom didn't sound like he was buying. As the commander, you have to believe that you are the best person to lead, that you can get the mission done with fewer casualties, less grief, better than anyone else can. And your troops have to believe the same. Even if it isn't so, you all have to buy into the illusion that it is. Tom shook his head. No illusions here. Right, Chris agreed. And that, more than the rain, is making this place hell. What are we going to do? I don't know, Chris said slowly. Well, yes, I do. We are going to see that these people don't starve. Beyond that, we'll just have to wait and see. Why do I find waiting to see what an ensign long knife will do very frightening? Oh, you ain't seen frightening yet, Tommy, me boy. Now, what do you say we get out of this rain? Back in her room, Chris did a quick survey. Standard hotel fare, bathroom with shower, bedroom with closet, easy chair, desk, and beautiful-looking bed. So long as the hotel's self-contained energy, water, and sewer continued to work, Chris's own personal matters would be taken care of. Her duffel stood in a puddle of water-soaked carpet. She dragged it into the bathroom. Most of its contents were soaked. For a moment, she considered leaving it to the hotel's staff to clean up. However, a glance at the mildew on the tile suggested there was no staff waiting on her every whim, no matter how big the tip. With a wry smile, Chris fed her battle dress through the washer, dryer, and presser in the bathroom. She wondered how many other debutantes on Ward Haven knew how to do their own laundry. There were things to do while her hands were busy. Having to ask for a map to find her own warehouse was ridiculous. Nellie, did Sam pass you any new routines before we left? Several. Can you get yourself synced with the military system? I have several routines that should do that. See if you can hook into the military network here. Searching. Nellie responded obediently, and maybe just a wee bit enthusiastically, if Chris was reading her A.I.'s inflections. By the time Chris had her undress khakis and one set of dress whites ready to hang up, and was wondering why she hadn't taken the warrant officer's advice and left them home, the presser was overheating and threatening to scorch her fingers. Nellie picked that moment to respond. I now have access. Nellie, 
Can you turn off the warehouse compound lights? Yes. Chris thought for a second. At 0200 local, turn the warehouse lights out. That ought to give the folks in need enough time. Can you lock down the warehouses? Chris took a moment to pull off her sodden uniform and hang it in the shower. Soaked boots, too. She turned the humidity down to the minimum. Taking Nellie off, Chris set her carefully on the desk. That information is not in the military net. There was a short pause. I can access it on the warehouse system. The warehouse has its own system? Yes, ma'am. Lock them down at 0230, Chris ordered, crawling under the covers and pulling the blanket up. Her feet were cold, but that wouldn't last long. Nellie, what time is Reveille? The Administrative Division's handout, welcoming you to Olympia Support Base, says Reveille is at 0600. Not Port Athens Marine Base. Chris noted the discrepancy between Hancock's greeting and his admin division. Another thing to look into tomorrow. Nellie, wake me at 0530. Chapter 10 Chris woke to a splitting headache and a dry mouth. Nellie, lights. What's the humidity in here? One moment while I connect to the hotel network was not what Chris wanted to hear, but it told her another network had not been merged into the overall system. She was no computer whiz like Auntie True, but this was poor management all around. Humidity is 8% in your room and your unit is approaching failure mode. Turn it up, Chris ordered, as she glanced around at the mess of hanging underwear and socks and took in the stink of fast-dried boots. She headed for the shower to try and get some moisture back into her head, then went back, made up her bed, and dumped everything that had dried out in the bathroom on the bed. Only then did she take some aspirin and a shower. Feeling almost human, she laced on her spare boots, pulled on her poncho, and at 0600 met Tommy in the hall on his way to chow. They stopped in their tracks, rain pouring off them, halfway to the other hotel. The mess hall was dark. Then again, no lights were showing in the hotel windows above them either. What gives? Tommy gulped. One place I want to check before I do something I'm going to regret. Chris said with a shrug, and trotted to the HQ. As she expected, the lights were dim. The duty watch slept at their desks. A light still burned in the colonel's office. Chris walked quietly to his room. The man slept, head thrown back in his chair, snoring. Tom frowned a question. Chris motioned him back down the hall. So, Tom said, that's the way it is. Nothing we can do. I'm hungry and I intend to eat, Chris said, as they quick marched through the rain to the mess hall. Nellie, give all personnel's rooms a wake-up call. Lights on everywhere. Locate the cooks. Tell them I want them down here now. Yes, Chris. Can your computer do that? Aunt True gave Nellie a couple of new routines. You're the one who said I needed a dragon if I was going to fight demons. Yes but I'm not sure I like the idea of someone else's computer waking me up. Tom's frown deepened. Ah, oh, Chris, are we ensigns the only other officers here? Oh, no, Chris gasped. Nellie, are there any senior officers here? Affirmative. In addition to you ensigns, there is a Lieutenant Commander Owing, a Lieutenant Commander Thu, who is also a doctor, and a Lieutenant... Pearson, did we wake them up? Chris asked, in a voice gone small. I hear no noise except snoring in Owings and Thu's rooms. Turn off their lights, Chris and Tom both shouted. Done. Lieutenant Pearson's room? Chris asked. She is showering. Two out of three ain't bad, Chris sighed. Senior boot ensign. Are we going about this right? Tom asked, very respectfully, and very junior. Doesn't look like I am, Chris acknowledged, as Nellie opened the door to the mess hall without bothering to ask. 
Chris reviewed her problem for a long minute. A kid's sister, strong-arming her brother's campaign workers, looked cute. How would officers react to her? Some might consider what she was doing a good exercise in initiative. Others could fall back on words like insubordination or mutiny. Upon further reflection, Chris decided on a new tack. Nellie, locate yesterday's arrivals. Inform them that they are wanted in the chow hall in 15 minutes. Show me a list of the ones assigned to the warehouse. In half a minute, Chris knew most of those she'd brought down would be in her department. Good. If she was going to play power games, it would be best if she started with a base she'd already looked after. Chris eyed the mess hall around her and scowled at her first impression. Upon further review, her scowl got deeper. The floors of the converted restaurant showed mud, and the tables needed cleaning. She headed for the kitchen. It definitely needed a good cleaning. Show me the personnel files on the cooks. Nellie did. Chris was not impressed. Two third-class petty officers seemed to alternate being in charge. At irregular intervals. Hmm. Right. They had a tendency to divert potatoes to their own, as yet unlocated, still. Had this operation drawn the hind end of everything? Well, you're here, aren't you? Nellie, do any of our other personnel have some cooking experience? Second-class Blyden graduated from the new Towson School of Culinary Techniques. Father is a five-star chef. Second-class Blyden is detached from Weapons Maintenance School. Chris and Tom exchanged looks of pure joy. Another kid trying to avoid the family curse, Chris crowed. He's a second-class. That outranks two third-classes any day, Tommy chortled. Nellie. Tell Mr. Blyden his presence is required in the mess hall immediately, if not sooner. And where are our cooks? Still sleeping? Nellie, can you find any bugle calls in your files? Yes. Full blast into all mess hands' quarters. Even on the ground floor of the converted hotel, Chris heard the bugles. Two minutes later, P.O. 2 slash C. Blyden appeared. To Chris's surprise, Blyden was a short woman fighting a weight problem, which probably explained her assignment here. You wanted to see me, she said sourly. Did you eat here yesterday? Yes, I did. And no, I didn't much like it. But no, I'm not interested in cleaning up this mess. After a long pause, she added, Ma'am. What's your price? Chris asked. My price? Yep, everyone has one. Right now, I need you. In case you haven't noticed, this outfit ain't going to hell. We're already fully established in residence. Food can change a lot for a spacer. We need to change things, and you look like the best change agent in town. Blyden scowled at the praise. You're a long knife? Yep, and I don't much like having what my father does thrown up in my face— so I suspect you don't either. How many cooks they have, Blyden said, glancing around. Two that like to drink the potatoes, and three renegades from boot camp. Blyden wrinkled her nose at that. Slowly, she paced her way into the kitchen. That drew a disgusted grunt. No wonder the food's so bad. She turned to Chris and offered a hand. My friends call me Courtney. I'll name my price later, and it won't be cheap. For now, the challenge has hooked me, and I'm hungry. I want six volunteers to start cleaning this kitchen right now. Chris volunteered the first six from the warehouse that came through the door. When the cooks finally meandered in, Courtney took one look at them and declared them unsanitary and unsafe in any kitchen. Chris peeled off another six of her crew, with a third class in charge and orders to get those two clean if they had to use wire brushes. After last night's meal, Chris had to turn down volunteers for that detail. Lieutenant Pearson showed up as the cooks were marched for the showers. When is breakfast? she asked. The voice was high, the handshake limp, and the dark roots showing in the blonde thatch left Chris wondering if anything about the woman was authentic. 
Give me a half hour, Courtney shouted from the kitchen. Pearson didn't hide her disappointment. As the lieutenant glanced around the mess hall, Chris could hear her grinding her teeth. I guess I'll be at my desk. I'm still trying to define the correct policy for who we help. There are so many in need, but so many of them have guns. What this place needs is a good gun control law. Really, Ensign, have someone bring over some toast when it's ready, and some fruit, spring melons if there's some left from yesterday. I'll just start my day early at my desk. Her exit, however, was slow, as if she expected Chris to stop her, do the proper junior officer thing of asking the wise senior to tell her all she needed to know. Chris didn't have time for that. She headed for the kitchen and its scrub teams. That got Pearson moving in the opposite direction. Nellie, what's Pearson's job? She commands the admin division. Last night's sleeping watchstanders, Tommy remarked. Looks like it. Can you imagine her and Hancock in a staff meeting? Why do I suspect we won't have many staff meetings? Tommy grinned at the prospect. But did I hear right? She's developing our policies? And probably will be for the next ten years. Chris knew people like Pearson, both in volunteer work and on campaigns. They were usually too fixated on their minutiae to get in Chris's way. We'll get everybody fed, with or without policies. Courtney came to stand in the kitchen door, hands on hips. Scrambled eggs and bacon is the fastest thing I can get out this morning. Any of you smiling faces ever flipped hamburgers or done some industrial strength cooking? Chris cringed at Courtney's choice of words. The woman grinned unrepentantly. Several hands went up among the gathering troops. The new head cook waved them into her kitchen with a proprietary grin and a, scrub your hands, then draw an apron and gloves. While the place took on the smell of a kitchen in use, Chris circulated. Nellie gave Chris a heads up about who had what assignments and how long they'd been on Olympia. With Nellie coaching, Chris asked a question here, made a neutral observation there, and managed to get most talking about their jobs. Then, Chris listened. There was a lot of resentment, some at the locals, lots at the brass. But most of it was frustration, pure and simple. Olympia was a lousy place to be, and they were just sitting on their thumbs while it got worse. Who is in charge of the warehouse? She asked the first person who admitted to working there. I don't know, ma'am. I think we're an admin, like most of the rest here. There's a third-class petty officer that shows up sometimes, but most of us just sit over there and stack supplies when a shipment comes in. Who built the fence? A local contractor. Why, ma'am? Because there's a hole in it that needs fixing. Wasn't there yesterday when we knocked off, ma'am, the able spacer assured her. Nope, a truck drove through it last night when I was shooting at it. You went there at night? You shot at them? The woman beside him added. Seemed like the thing to do. They were shooting at me. You know about the nightly shipments from the warehouse? The two looked at each other, palpably uncomfortable. The woman answered. We know things are gone most mornings. Nobody told us to do anything about it. I think we'll be doing something about it, Chris said. As they walked away from those two, Tom shook his head. I'm starting to think the smartest move I ever made in my life was stopping to tie my shoe during that obstacle course. I can't tell you how glad I am you graduated a seat ahead of me at OCS. And all the time I thought it was that final exam on military etiquette, Chris said, nudging him in the ribs. The cooks returned from the showers to impromptu applause and turned to under Courtney's watchful eyes. Two of the volunteers asked to stay on. Chris started making a list of things she was going to need forgiveness for. She definitely wasn't about to ask permission first. Father always said it was a lot easier to get Parliament to forgive what was working than get those prima donnas to approve what might blow up. Everything she'd seen in the last four months convinced her that, at least in that one respect, Father and the Navy way were the same. Her meal done, Chris went through the line again and took a tray and coffee mug across the way to the HQ. P. 
Pearson was bent over her workstation, moving a paragraph from one part of her document to another. Hancock was still asleep in his chair. Chris set the tray and mug on his desk and turned to go. There was a snort behind her as snoring halted. Then the sound of boots hitting the deck. She turned. The colonel looked at her through red-rimmed eyes for a long moment, then reached for the mug. A long swallow later, he put it down. What are you looking at, Ensign? He growled as he attacked the plate. Chris flipped a coin. As Billy Longknife's daughter, she'd gotten away with a lot. As an ensign, it might be a good idea to at least let the colonel know what direction she was headed off in. Nothing, sir. I was wondering if I might ask for some guidance, or whether I should wait for officer's call. No way I'm going to- The colonel decided not to finish that sentence. Okay, Longknife, what do you want? Am I in charge of the warehouse? Yep. I report directly to you. I told you so. There's a hole in the warehouse fence where a truck drove through it last night. Who do I talk to to get it fixed? Pearson, he bellowed. Get in here. The lieutenant did not rush to her commander's call. Adjusting her khakis, she came to stand beside Chris in the colonel's doorway. Her, yes, sir, came out with a mixture of pain and disdain. Ensign here wants the warehouse fence mended. I'll have to inspect it, sir. The warehouse is under my division. Not anymore. The ensign has it all to herself. Her and that freckle-faced boot. Sir? Pearson didn't quite squeal. Chris had heard similar bureaucratic shrieks when her father shaved a sliver off someone's empire. She waited to see who wore the boondockers in this command. The girl has the warehouse. I gave you the other two ensigns. Maybe the three of you can finish your policies. The colonel eyed the eggs, took another bite, then bit off a piece of bacon. This breakfast is damn good. New cook? Yes, sir. Chris cut in. Second class Blyden had some culinary training on the outside. She's willing to oversee the kitchen. Chris turned to Pearson. With the lieutenant's permission. My toast tasted as good as always, Pearson sniffed. Well, my eggs are the best I've tasted in too damn long. Ensign, you want the mess hall assigned to your division? Not if you and the lieutenant don't want it that way, sir. Even a prime minister's daughter learned a little bit about tact. I want it that way. Also, see if you can't do something about the quarters. They're filthy. Pearson, turn the budget for them over to Longknife here and let her run with it. If you say so, sir. I think I just did. Now you two women get out of my face. I need a shave. Chris saluted and backed out of the way. Pearson stopped her in the hall. Just remember, Ensign Longknife, I'll be the one auditing your expenses, and people can go to jail for misappropriating government funds, no matter what their name is. Yes, ma'am, I understand completely, Chris said, and marched from the HQ. Nellie, Chris whispered, is there anyone unassigned with accounting training? No. Anyone have an accountant in the family? Some other scion was going to hate her for dragging them into a profession they'd learned to hate at their parents' knee. That's just life, kid, she whispered to whomever her next victim was. Chris had Nellie inform her warehouse personnel to form division, under arms, at 0800. Uniform of the day was battle dress and rain ponchos. She passed up the temptation to put her five marines in battle armor, Somehow, she doubted heavy stuff had been landed for a mercy mission. Chris delegated the dining hall and quarters to Tom, which left her just enough time to interview a pair of third-class spacers who shared the same views of the accounting profession and their rarely home accountant parents. Tom and she flipped to see who got which. To loud protestations that, I didn't join the Navy to count beans, Chris told Petty Officer Spens he'd be doing just that for her. At 0800, Spens formed the division and marched them for the warehouse.
if he'd ever learned drill commands, he'd forgotten them. Spens made up some pretty creative replacements to get the division moving. The troops got the message, even if they didn't keep in step. Count Cadence, count, Chris shouted. The one was pretty weak, mainly Marines in the rear ranks. Two got stronger. By the second four, even the worst offenders had managed to get their feet in step with the others. Lift your heads and hold them high, sang out from the rear rank, where the Marines marched proud and tall. Space Marines are marching by, one, two, three, four. Her spacers, heads thrown back and shoulders straightened by the cadence call, joined in the count from force of inexperienced habit, unaware that they'd just been had by the Marines. Spens was fully aware. He waited a short forebeat before bringing on the same call, ending it with, Your Space Navy's marching by. Well, a bit of competition never hurt anyone, and the troops were starting to look a lot less like drowned puppies, and a bit more like Navy. A very wet Navy, but Navy. Chris hoped the colonel had heard them. Even he might smile. Around Chris, civilians were out hunched in upon themselves against the latest town poor. At the shouted cadences, their heads came up too, some with mouths agape, others curious. A few took a good look and took off running, carrying what message to whom, Chris had no idea. But anyone spreading the word that a new day was dawning at the warehouse was fine by her. There were shouts from the crowd already gathered at the warehouse fence as they approached. People milled around the gate and the hole in the fence. Others raced to join them from inside the warehouse yard. Apparently, the building lockdown had been successful. The runners came empty-handed. Only as the divisions came to a halt did Chris have Nelly unlock the warehouses. She turned to face her first real command. Some knew her. She'd done her best to get them out of the rain as fast as was humanly possible last night. Others were old hands, stationed here for up to a month, a long time to serve in hell. They looked at her like drowned rats, wondering if she might have a straw for them to cling to. Chris reran some of the pep talks she'd given campaign crews, did a quick edit, and began. Crew, I don't know how some of you feel about the work you've been doing. Maybe you're happy about it, maybe you're not. That doesn't matter. Today, here and now, we start the mission to Olympia. There are hungry people out there. We've got the food. We're gonna see they get fed. Those of you who've been working at this for a while, you take the lead for these new hands. I'll be circulating most of today. You got a problem, see me. You got a solution, see me too. Most of you are new to the Navy. If you'd drawn ship duty, you'd be someplace dry and warm. That drew a rueful laugh. You'd also be a small cog in a very big wheel, doing what you were told to do. Here, you're critical to saving people's lives. We are all in this together. I need ideas. You come up with a good one, you'll find I'm a good listener. Any questions? Chris spoke the inevitable end to these kinds of talks. Just as inevitably, there were none. Petty officer, dismiss the division to workstations. See that those needing assignments get them. Oh, that sounded so easy. Maybe with a few good chiefs, it would have worked. Her third-class petty officer was just as over his head as she was. Still, she left him to do a by-guess and by-god bit of detailing while she did her first of many walkarounds in the mud and rain. The warehouse area opened on a large bay, muddy, Choppy water lapped at the seawall. A marine railroad on the left had hauled a large, unmanned dropship out of the water. It lay like a beached whale, open and half empty. Bags of rice and beans were getting soaked. A young spacer led a group of recruits in dropping hundred-pound food bags on waiting shoulders and lugging them to the nearest warehouse. Backbreaking labor. That couldn't be the way it was usually done. At the break in the fence, people stood in the downpour. They needed food, work too, 
She needed laborers to get the food to them. Nellie, can I hire local workers? No, ma'am. There are not funds in this mission for local employees. Of course, Navy all the way. The more debited to the emergency appropriation, the more left over for the rest of the fleet. Chris had heard that some commands even kept an extra ship in commission, betting that enough expenses would be soaked up by emergencies to fund it. Ma'am, a quiet voice called to Chris as she walked toward the torn fence. Chris turned to face a thin, gray-haired woman in a slicker and kerchief. Are you the new person in charge? Yes, Chris said. Then, when the woman seemed unable to respond, Chris softened. What can I do for you? My name is Esther Sadik. My church runs a soup kitchen. Lots of men lost their jobs when the crops failed. Families are going hungry. We're seeing they get one warm meal a day. That's very nice of you, Chris offered to the woman, when she seemed unsure how to go on. None too sure how to help, Chris at least could give the woman a listening ear. We're out of food. Chris knew that was coming. She nodded. The woman's words stumbled on. We've been buying food from this Navy man, but we're out of money. Third class petty officer? Chris asked, remembering what she'd heard about the warehouse leadership. The woman shrugged. Rates were a mystery to civilians. Chris wondered if she could arrange a lineup, but suspected the culprit would be long gone if he hadn't managed to ship out on the hussy yesterday. No, Chris's problem was how to go forward, not look back. She wiped the rain from her face as she puzzled her problem. She was here to feed people, but she couldn't just hand out food. Obviously, someone had been, for a price. But I'm a long knife. Oh, joy. Nellie, who can hire local civilians on missions like this? Non-governmental organizations are the usual employers of the local labor forces. The woman listened, dripping in the rain, as Chris continued her conversation with her assisting A.I. Do we have any here? No. Not a surprise. This place was the inglorious hind end of everything. But Chris had volunteered as a counselor for a handicapped kid's summer camp her freshman year in college. She'd gotten them their tax-exempt status. Nellie, what does it take to set up an NGO? I have just completed the paperwork to set one up. Before I send them off-world for registration, what should I name it? Nellie, you're wonderful, Chris grinned and the woman across from her actually cracked a chip of a smile. Make it the Ruth Edris Fund for Displaced Farmers, Chris said. Now, that would make her great-grandmother's day. I went to school with a girl named Ruth Edris, the woman muttered. A long time ago, on Hertford. We were fun kids then. I hear Granny Ruth still is. She was from Hertford, a long time before I was born. Nellie, are those papers served? Done. How large do I endow this fund? What would I have to pay you to do what you're already doing? Chris asked Esther. If you feel you must pay me, I am willing to work for an earth dollar a month, the woman answered. Chris tried not to show a reaction to that. With just a week's earnings from her trust fund, she could probably hire every person on this planet for a year. Nellie's last upgrade had taken two months' worth of income, and that in Wardhaven dollars. I can get volunteers to work for free, the woman went on, mistaking Chris's silence for disapproval. If you arrange the release of food to the soup kitchens, a lot of men will work for you. Not just my church's kitchen, there are many others in town. I think we have a deal, Chris said quickly, to reassure the woman. Then she added subvocally to Nellie, put a hundred thousand in it for starters. To the woman, Chris continued, Let me run this by my boss. Nellie, page the colonel. Hancock, came from Chris's comlink a moment later. Colonel, Ensign Longknife here. I need some more advice. And you expect good advice from me? Chris ignored the question and quickly ran down what she'd done. 
this displaced farmer fund is a legitimate NGO? He asked as she finished. I have it on the best legal advice, she said, grinning at Esther. The old woman did smile this time. Yeah, we can release food to soup kitchens, food banks, and the likes, so long as we've got some NGO vouching for their legitimacy. This gig ain't the most popular show on earth, so you may have noted the lack of media coverage and NGOs. If you got one, do it, Ensign. And he tapped out. Chris pulled a Wardhaven dollar coin from her pocket and handed it to Esther. I guess that makes you the fund's first employee. You know anyone else who might help me? Esther glanced around. A man stepped forward. His boots had holes in the top of them. His pants were soaked. Name's Jebediah Selinsky. Jeb to most. I was a foreman at this transfer station before the rains came, and management hightailed it off planet. I see your guys lugging bags of beans around. I know the folks who used to work here. We know where the lifts and carts are, though they don't work so good since the rains came. Acid rain damaged them, the boss said before he ran. You're hired, Chris said, and fished in her pocket for another dollar. Like the prime minister, Chris always carried a couple of dollar coins. You could never tell when you'd want a soda, and the net would be down. As she hired her second employee, she asked, Either of you know anyone who used to work at the hotel that's our barracks? Millie Uzigoto was the head housekeeper there, Esther said. When people quit coming, the hotel folded. Managers left. Sounds like a lot of people left? Not a lot. Only all who could. Well, for those still here, this is the drill. Chris rushed out her words before anyone could change their mind. The pay's a dollar a month. Chris handed her third and last dollar to Esther. Give that one to Millie. The rest will have to wait a while for pay. Also, they get all they and their family can eat at the nearest soup kitchen. That sound like a fair deal? Esther and Jeb glanced around at the others, standing farther back in the rain. Here, a head nodded a bit, a finger twitched, a hand raised a little. They came forward when Jeb motioned them in. Under Esther and Jeb's direction, they began hand-unloading the just-landed supplies. A check of the three trucks in the yard turned up only one that worked. Chris tapped her comm link. Tom, how's the barracks? Lousy, Chris. I couldn't keep my room clean in an environmental and humidity-controlled asteroid station. How am I supposed to clean up this place? I think our local non-governmental agency just hired someone to take over the barracks for you. I didn't know there were any NGOs here. Wasn't this morning. Is one now. Why do I so not want to know how that happened? Just pray to your ancestors and St. Patrick that Hancock is happy not knowing too. Now, I've got three trucks out here, and only one will turn over. I've got lifters and loaders damaged by the acid rain. You got any ideas about how to cure them? Probably damage their solar panels. Don't have much sun to start with. Got to make good use of what you got. I could probably reprogram the nanos I've got keeping my bright work shiny to rework the solar panels. You're using nanos to polish your uniform brass? Of course. Doesn't everyone? Came back, pure startlement. Chris rolled her eyes at the sky and got rain in them for her dramatics. Blinking. She turned back to her comm link. Tomorrow morning, Tom, you turn over the barracks to someone who knows them, and you get your tail over here and put your leprechauns to work on my broken gear. I'll bring the ancestors' cami along, too. Believe me, we need all the miracles you can spare. The lone truck was loaded. Chris peeled off three armed, able spacers to guard the cargo while they dropped off food at the kitchens Esther listed. Esther promised to get the guards back unharmed and before dark. The spacers might be the ones carrying M6s, but they looked much relieved by the woman's assurance of safety. With all her pocket change gone, Chris had Nellie arrange to ship in a box of Wardhaven dollars with each relief ship, inconspicuous-like, and finished the day feeling pretty good. The next morning started bad and got worse. 
First, for Millie, Yu Zagoto to take over managing the hotel required a meeting with both the colonel and Lieutenant Pearson. The colonel immediately went on record as not caring who did it, so long as the barracks got cleaned. Pearson insisted on a signed contract and only withdrew her long list of objections when it became clear that this service was being provided under the Society's Apprentice Training Volunteer Program and no Navy appropriation would be tapped. Nellie's fast law search found that bit of legal fiction while Chris stalled. The colonel seemed to be enjoying himself immensely as Chris tap-danced around Pearson's opposition. Once free of the HQ red tape, Chris got Tommy doing an inventory of what they had mechanical and what they needed to convert it from wet and rusting junk into something useful. Chris assigned herself the miserable job of getting a full, complete, and honest inventory of supplies on hand, separating Navy issue from relief goods. She had barely touched the surface that afternoon when a breathless runner skidded to a halt beside her. Armed thugs had held up a soup kitchen, cleaned it out of food, and pistol-whipped Esther Saddock for reasons that escaped Chris. Chris stopped herself two steps into running down to Esther's kitchen. That would do no good. In this rain, no one left tracks, and if things were usual, no one saw anything. While Chris struggled with lousy options, Jeb took over the inventory. Free, Chris stepped outside to let the pouring rain cool her off. There was no use rushing across town. The boy said Esther was already being bandaged by the best doctor available. It was tempting to take a dozen armed spacers to chase down the culprits. Fat chance she'd have. That left her with a less pleasant problem of how to make sure it didn't happen again. She spent a good hour pacing up and down in the rain. The problem wasn't all that different from trying to clean up a sour campaign office. Of course, it often was wiser when all hell broke loose to have hit up the nearest so-called adult leadership before she did too much on her own. And getting that adult leadership to agree to what Chris wanted often took a bit of finagling. That evening at supper, She set her tray down across from Colonel Hancock, shrugged out of her poncho, and settled into the seat. I need your advice, sir. I'm starting to get scared when you start misusing that word, Ensign. What bridge you trying to sell me this time? Chris updated him on the warehouse. He nodded, satisfied, as he buttered a croissant that looked fit to melt in his hand. Then she hit him with the problem of food being ripped off by guys who beat up old ladies. His bread went down uneaten as he looked at her. And you expect me to do something about that? Sir? Chris left the question hanging there. He leaned back. I don't doubt you are aware that I'm not the most popular field-grade officer in the Corps, charged with using machine guns for crowd control. I am aware, sir. You're also aware of the quality of the recruits we've got, Ensign Longknife. The two of them eyed the room, full of new, half-trained Navy and Marine personnel. Not really, sir. But, but what? He interrupted her. The people who settled this mud ball chose to have every home incomplete without a weapon, preferably automatic in the closet. A nice trigger lock to keep the kiddies from hurting themselves. Good God, do these idiots really think their pop guns could stop a fleet of raving bug-eyed monsters if one charged through their jump point? He snorted. Well, there's all hell to pay, and the devil fully armed to beat the band. And I'll be damned if I'll put my troopers out there for anybody who wants to take a pot shot at them. He looked hard at Chris, then went on more softly. They said those farmers were only throwing rocks. I swear to God, I heard automatic fire. But we didn't find guns in the wreckage, and no one believes Marines, except Marines. But I'm still in this hellhole, and I'll be damned if I'll put anyone else in a worse spot. He balled up his napkin, threw it down on his half-eaten supper, scowled at it, then looked up at Chris. So, Ensign Longknife, 
What are you going to do about thugs that steal food from soup kitchens and beat up old ladies? I intend to post a constant guard on the warehouses. Put our poor booties out slogging in the rain and mud. Makes them easy targets, too. No, sir. One warehouse has a business tower, four stories high. Its roof should give our duty watch clear fields of vision all along the fence. And fire lanes. I've recycled rice bags into sandbags and built a bunker up there. That should give our personnel protection. I'll need a searchlight. I can scare one up for you. I'm also asking locals, ministers, officials, small business types, to share the night watches. So they can give the order to fire? No, sir. To serve as witnesses in any local court when and if one of our petty officers does give the order to fire. The colonel eyed Chris for a long moment. Not bad, Ensign. You know, they're starving on the farm stations. Yes, sir. We're due for a dozen trucks sometime this week. I'll start spreading out then. First convoy is bound to get shot at, maybe even raided. I'll be leading that one, sir. Unless you want to. He snorted. <laughs> Sorry, kid. I've been in that barrel. Once you've been hung out to dry by the chain of command, you learn to take what minor advantages delegation offers you. Thank you, sir. Seemed the only answer to that. The colonel stood, abandoning his unfinished meal. One more thing, sir, Chris quickly added. That NGO that's helping me. I hear it's hiring locals with guns to guard the kitchens. That got her a long, measuring stare before the colonel finally picked up his tray. What the locals do to each other is their own damn business, he said slowly. Just don't you go spending too much time on it. Of course not, sir. Chapter 11 First thing next morning, Chris checked in at the warehouse. Jeb and a dozen of his team had worked through most of the night. They expected to complete the inventory by noon. Chris left them to it. Tommy showed up a few minutes later. Millie had appeared at the barracks front door that morning with a small army of ex-hotel employees. We can handle things from here, kind sir, if you will just get out of our way, kind sir. We should have everything spick and span by supper, kind sir. Now, kind sir, please, get lost. Tommy had several ideas about how to get the rolling gear rolling, so Chris left the kind sir to himself and concentrated on what she wanted to do. Esther was back at her soup kitchen, a spick and span building in need of paint on the outside, but as homey as could be on the inside. The woman sported a bandaged head, but didn't let it slow her down one bit. Nellie had discovered a local bank with rolls of Wardhaven dollars in its vault. Chris plopped four rolls, a hundred dollars, on the table in front of Esther. How long will it take to get armed guards on each kitchen? They're already here, Esther answered. Behind the serving table, two young women smiled and produced rifles from under the table. My daughters, Esther explained. Their husbands are out front. And the other kitchens? I'll have guards today. No man wants his wife put through this, she said, with a wave at her head. Chris pointed at the rolls of dollars. See that every one gets his or her pay. And Esther, it will be a problem for me if my colonel is embarrassed by something done by our guards. Could you see that they understand that while they take our dollar and eat our food, they are... On their best behavior, Esther smiled. Yes, I will let them know that Grandma Esther expects only the best from her men. That was not exactly Chris's words, and it certainly wasn't the way a Marine colonel would express his expectations for discipline within the ranks. Still, it was probably the best this lash-up would allow. Chris hiked back to the base. Somehow, word had gotten out that Tom needed machinists and mechanics. The warehouse fence was already lined with men and women with automotive skills seeking employment. 
For a repair shop, Tommy identified a large building next to the warehouse that could be easily included in their perimeter fence. One of the hires was the owner of a failing truck firm halfway across town. He was painfully eager to sell his inventory for ten cents on the dollar. Chris was uncomfortable at the idea until the man admitted his off-world bank was selling him off just that cheap. If Chris would buy him out, he could pay off his debt and be in a position to buy it back from the Navy when they left. Under those conditions, the displaced farmers' fund happily wrote a check and got the gear moved inside the fence. While the actual work was quickly done on a handshake, the paperwork required Chris to coordinate with both supply, finance, and administration. Chris quickly discovered why supply and finance wanted nothing to do with admin. She had no problem getting the petty officers in two sections that usually would have reported to admin to sign off on all the required paperwork. Getting Pearson to approve anything turned into a Herculean task. Why do we need all this stuff? The lieutenant sniffed. If it's broke, we have to fix it. Chris had to go to the colonel to get that answer declared acceptable. Still, five times the admin chief bounced Chris's paperwork for minor corrections. Five times, Chris resubmitted it. Why are you putting up with this? Tommy asked. I wouldn't if we had some trucks to work on, but the ones due yesterday still aren't even in orbit. Chris sighed and played the lieutenant's game. When the dozen trucks finally did arrive, Chris was glad for her pre-work. Donated Riggs, the newest truck, had a hundred thousand miles on it. The mechanics took one look at them, shook their heads, then turned two and totally rebuilt them, using every machine and tool Chris had laid her hands on. Chris didn't let Pearson and her runarounds eat up all her time. Mornings, she quickly did her Navy duties. Afternoons, she devoted most of her time to the Ruth Edris Fund. If she failed to hitch a ride with a supply truck, she hoofed it, making the rounds of soup kitchens, checking how everything was going. There were no more robberies, no more beatings. The rain still came down in sheets as Chris traveled the flooded streets of Port Athens, the people still hunched against it as they splashed from puddle to pothole, but now they seemed less beaten. Whether she hitched a ride or walked, she wound up soaking wet by sundown, from the top of her hat to the soggy soles of her boots. The only thing between Chris and utter misery was the humidity controls in the barracks, and when Millie reported the entire unit ready to give up the ghost, Chris paid extra to hire the only man on planet able to nurse the collapsing system along. A dry, warm room each night was cheap at any price. Pearson was still developing policy when the mechanics wiped grease from their hands and declared six of the trucks as ready as they were ever going to get for the roads up country. Chris didn't intend to wait any longer for policy. The farm stations were starving. She collected the people she'd met on her rounds and put the question to them. Where do we start? I think down south is having it harder, a farm implement sales manager advised. Up north, the land runs to hills and gullies. The gullies are taking up a lot of the water. Down south, it's flatter. Water doesn't have any place to go. It's going back to swamp. Across the table from her, a priest and minister nodded their heads. That's what we hear too, said the priest. But young woman... The gangs are also worse down south. A lot of gunmen are running down there, and with the swamps, there's no way anyone can trace them. We've got some pretty smart gear, Padre, Chris answered. I know you do, but I haven't seen any of it flying around here, the red-faced priest answered back. Is it only my imagination, or is this whole effort being done on the cheap? Father! Esther Saddock swatted his wrist. My mother taught me to say thank you when someone offered a helping hand, not count the fingers. Sorry. Nothing I haven't thought, Father, Chris acknowledged. Tomorrow, 
I'll take a half dozen trucks south. Should be back in a day. Thanks for your help. Do you want a few of our armed men with you? Esther asked. Chris had been thinking a lot about that. Armed civilians riding shotgun for the Navy didn't feel right. A few witnesses? No. This is a Navy show, ma'am. We'll do it the Navy way. The trucks were eight wheelers. Each wheel was supposed to be good for both traction and steering. Chris was just happy if they turned. Each cab had a front and back seat. The days of troops riding on the truck bed were gone. No safety belts back there. Chris assigned three gunners to the back seat of each truck. That left room for a driver and a boss in the front seat. Chris would command the first truck. She should have assigned Tommy to command the last truck, but he asked to be her driver. There might be an advantage to having both officers up front. With her pair of third-class POs, that only put a supervisor in three of the six trucks. Her accountant insisted on commanding one truck. I get out of the office, or the auditors are going to find really weird things, was a threat Chris respected. Unfortunately, when you give in to one threat, you only get more. Burnt toast if I don't get a truck, Courtney smiled. So she got a day away from the mess hall. The sixth truck was all Marines. Her convoy on the move, Chris found herself with time on her hands and a puzzle that would not go away. Everyone here was supposed to be armed to the teeth. The city folk certainly were. So how come the farm stations were off net with rumors they'd been beat up? The orbital photos showed most of them were in the middle of wide fields, clear lanes of fire as far as any shooter could sight. Anybody trying to rob a farm station should have been very dead, 500 meters out. Maybe someone could sneak up on one or two, but Chris was scheduled to stop at five. Five. Something was wrong here. To the three recruits riding shotgun in the back, there was definitely something wrong, but nothing like what worried Chris. I ain't joined the Navy to be no errand boy one young spacer said, not caring if Chris heard. Hell, the next one agreed. If I wanted to do deliveries, I could have stayed home and worked for my dad's shop. At least there, after you put in your eight hours, your day is your own. No offense meant, ma'am. It's not your fault we have to take night watch once a week. None taken, Chris assured him, knowing full well that all the troops knew she was the reason for the night duty. Wouldn't do you any good to have spare time. The third, a woman chimed in. No place to go, and if you do, it's raining, raining, raining. Join the Navy and see the mud holes. The first one was ready to come back in. I joined up to be a gunner. I got the highest score on Tuck Willow and Space Fighter. Nobody can zap those bug-eyed monsters like I can. We haven't found any more aliens, Chris pointed out. Getting chow to starving people is a bit more pressing than getting ready for hostels we haven't met. Yeah, I know. You're an officer, ma'am, and you have to think like that. But me, just give me a four-inch laser and a squadron of incoming badasses, and you'd see what I can do. This stuff, it's just making the do-gooders back in their overstuffed couches on Earth feel like they did something good when they paid their taxes. They ought to come out here and play around in this mud. Chris didn't tell him Wardhaven had do-gooders, too. And that was why she joined the Navy. The first station on their list was big. Owners, their kids and wives, grandkids, maybe a few of those getting up marriage high, filled several dozen family-size houses. A number of families from small stations had also taken refuge there. Before it went off net, they reported groups of horse and truck-mounted bandits roaming the area. Chris shook her head. They ought to have been able to field a continuous watch, they ought not to have gone off the air. Approaching the station, Chris matched the map on her reader against reality. The muddy road was wide enough for two trucks, but in need of repair. Tom slipped and slid from side to side, looking for the shallower potholes. The fields on either side of the road were muddy from a crop that never grew and rain that never stopped. 
she had an unhindered line of sight across those sodden fields to a creek that had overflowed its banks, swallowed the trees around it, and flooded hundreds of meters more. An abandoned tractor was up to its hubs in water. This muck would have channelized any attack. The raiders had to hit them from the road. They should have been mowed down. What were Chris and her tiny convoy driving into? Lock and load, Chris ordered, as they came in sight of the station. That made a few troopers day. Tom left his rifle in the scabbard hanging from the door. Can't use it and drive. It had been a successful farm, if three large barns said anything about its pre-volcanic wealth. A big house held pride of place, facing a central yard. Other houses and outbuildings turned the station into a small village. There was no one in view. Chris ordered the other trucks to halt and go on over watch, then explained that meant them watching, rifles ready, while she had Tom drive slowly in. Maybe she spotted motion behind a window. Maybe the barrel of a gun protruding out a door. With a fatalistic grimace, Chris ordered Tom to stop at the gate, dismounted, and started to walk the rest of the way in. Activating her mic, Chris announced, I am Ensign Longknife of the Society Navy, when she was a hundred meters from the nearest outbuilding. Her voice boomed from her truck's loudspeaker. My rigs have food. You went off net several months ago. Do you require aid? A barn door opened. Three men slipped out before closing it, then started walking toward Chris. At the big house, several women appeared on the porch, two with babies in arms. They also made for the center of the commons. Chris did, too. They met in the middle. A tall, bald man held out his hand to Chris. I'm Jason McDowell. My father started this station. He waved at the thin, graying woman leading the other women. This is my wife, Leticia. Chris shook his hand, then the woman's when she joined the group. I have food packages for you. I was hoping to leave about a month's supply. How many people do you have here? The man shook his head. A hundred or so. But a month's worth of food is too much. They'll just come back and take it, he said bitterly. We could hide some, Jason, his wife whispered. They'd make us tell. Someone would give it out. They'd make us. The wife looked away, but nodded agreement. I guess we can come out here once a week, Chris offered, not really wanting the workload. Others now came from the barns, houses, and outbuildings. The number kept growing. Chris had expected to see guns. There weren't any. Before I can leave the food, I'll need every person's identicard to verify the delivery. Don't have any. They took them. Jason dropped the words like lumps of hot iron. Does that mean you can't help us? Leticia asked, her hands nodding her apron. The two silent women beside her clutched their children. We didn't drive all this way to tell hungry folks we can't feed them because of a paperwork snafu, Chris said. And Lieutenant Pearson can finish her policies in hell. She chinned her mic. Tommy, bring him in. Still, losing identicards was no minor matter. For the last month, these people could have had their bank accounts emptied, their personalities misused on the interplanetary web. Anything could have happened to them while they were off net and unable to say a word in their defense. This did not sound like the work of local hooligans. With no IDs, I'll need photographs of everyone, Chris said, then ordered Tom to break out a camera. Brother, if they've got a comm link, I could check our bank account, one of the men with Jason said. You do that, Jerry. Tom. See that this man gets a link to the net. Tom took the flood of orders with a grin and a, you got it, ma'am. Can you get everyone out here? Chris asked. My mother is bedridden, Jason said. I guess we could bring her down here, but I'll go see her. I'm just trying to keep the damn auditors from flaying me too badly when this is over. 
I understand. We're in business. Jason stopped, glanced around, ended up staring at the muddy yard. We were. We will be again, his wife said, offering a hand that he flinched away from. As a commissioned officer, Chris ought to leave this well enough alone. Still, Judith would never have let Chris get away in therapy with dodging what these two were running from. And Chris owed Judith her life. In the mudroom of the house, Chris shucked her poncho before taking the stairs slowly to the third floor. The house was made of wood, finely polished by work and use. In a bedroom hung with the needlework of years, a woman lay alone on an oversized bed. She moaned in pain. With three quick steps, Chris knelt by the bed, lifted the covers from the old woman. Her weathered skin showed the blue and yellow discoloration of a several weeks old beating. I've got a corpsman in the convoy. Can I have her take a look at your mother? We've done what we could for mother, the man said, eyes flinching from the woman. Do you have painkillers? They took ours, his wife said. Tom, send up the corpsman. Have her home on my comlink. Yes, ma'am. Chris turned from where she knelt, looked up at the couple. Are you going to tell me what happened here? Everybody told me when I got orders to Olympia, watch your back. Everybody carries a gun. Our colonel doesn't want us on the streets at night. Too many guns. Well, I haven't seen a gun in this compound. Chris pointed at a gun rack, hanging on the wall beside a window. Empty. Where are your guns? Gone, the man said. They're just gone. Leave it at that, Navy. My husband went to the fields, the woman began softly. The man turned on his wife, his eyes begging her for silence. She met his eyes with her own, level, unflinching. When she didn't turn away, he fled to the farthest corner of the room. A farm isn't something that you take care of when you feel like it, not if you're like Jason and his family. His pa carved this station out of a grant. It was swamp when they came here fifty years ago. They drained it. The pumps have to be checked, now especially, and the pumps are close to the swamps. There were five of us, Jason said to the floor. All armed. We knew that, he failed to find a word. Those men were out there. We figured we'd see them coming. Jason looked up at Chris. We're good shots. Pa had us practice every week, and there are things we locals call a buffalo in the swamp that can trample a crop into the mud. We're good at hunting them. They came out of a ditch must have been breathing through hollow reeds or something. They had the drop on us before we even knew they were there. If we'd gone for our guns, they'd have slaughtered us. The man looked up at his wife, his voice choked. Honey, I wish to hell we'd fought. Now the woman went to her husband's side, gave him a shoulder as he sobbed. Chris had rarely seen men cry, On the bed, the old woman struggled to find a comfortable place, moaned. Chris stood, her hand going to the butt of her pistol. There were things she'd join the Navy to take care of. At the moment, the local bad guys were too up on her. She didn't like the score. As her man wept, the wife continued the story, her voice a low monotone that screamed, wrong, by its very softness. The truck stopped 400 yards out. About a dozen got out. Any of them that weren't one of ours, we had them in our sights. Then someone shouted, Woman, I got a pistol at your husband's head. You have your men and women folk drop their guns, and everyone's going to come out of this alive. People start shooting, and he dies first. I told you to shoot! The man's voice was begging for understanding, forgiveness. I shouted at you, screamed for you to shoot. Chris wondered what she would have done, as wife, as husband. More men got out of the trucks, the wife continued. Spread out in the mud, went to ground. There must have been thirty or forty riflemen. 
we had children. She looked up at Chris, pleading for understanding. Chris nodded, tried to give what the woman wanted. The wife shook her head and went on. Some of the men were for fighting it out. Let the devil take the last one standing. The woman looked Chris hard in the eye. We have our children here. We women voted to put the guns down. The woman glanced down at her husband. Maybe if we'd known what came next, we'd have fought. Some of us say we wish we had. Most of us don't. Almost, Chris told the woman that she didn't have to finish the story. Already Chris knew the ending. But the wife had come this far. The rest tumbled from her mouth. They took our guns first, then our food, eye dents, anything that seemed important or that they wanted. Then they had the men tie each other's hands. There, in the mud, in front of our husbands and children, they raped us. That seemed to add something to it for them. Jason's father, her husband, she nodded at the old woman in bed. He fought them. Tied up, he fought them. Why didn't I? Why didn't I too? Jason moaned. Because I told you not to. Because if you had, they'd have killed you like they did him. Probably beaten me like they did her. A large sigh racked the woman. We're alive. Over at the Sullivan place, they're dead. They slaughtered the kids like pigs because they tried to fight them off. We are alive, Jason. She took her husband's face in her hands. We are alive. We will come through this. And we will hang those bastards, Jason whispered. If we can, it's all in God's hands. The medic arrived. Chris left the wife to work with the corpsman and headed downstairs. Outside, she paused. Her mission plan called for delivering food. The rules of engagement only allowed her to return fire if fired upon. Come on, you sons of bitches, she whispered to the leaden air. I got 30 trigger pullers and no kids in this convoy. You know we're here. You know you want what we got. Come get it, please. As Chris marched across the yard, the man who'd asked to check on finances came walking back, shaking his head. They sold the farm. Right out from under us, they sold it. Chris stopped him. I'm recording what I'm saying for a legal deposition, she told Nellie and the man. You can do that? That and more. Quickly, Chris recounted how she'd found the farm station, stripped of eye dents and communications. Any financial and legal actions taken between the time this station went off net and now are not legal and binding. I, Christine Ann Longknife, do testify to that in any court of law, she finished. Thank you, the young man said. We'll see what else I can do, Chris said, spotted Tom, and shouted, We done? Think so. I've got photos of everyone. Even Pearson should be happy. Good. Let's pack it in and get moving. We got a lot more to do. Yes, ma'am, Tom stepped close. Chris, is something wrong? You look like, well, like you want somebody dead. Nothing wrong with that, Chris snapped. We're armed, and there are bad guys out there. Everybody, let's saddle up. We got things to do, places to go. The troops began to collect by their rigs. They seemed in no hurry to be gone. Several of them were still holding small children, helping them to stuff their faces. Ma'am, one of Chris's backseat guards started. The bad guys are just going to come back, take what we left them. Could we, maybe, at least take the kids back to town? They've been starving for the last month. That mom told me the little kids don't have the stomach to digest the grass and other stuff keeping the grown-ups alive. Next week, maybe we will. Not now, Chris cut him off. I said, move it, troops. I expect to see you moving, she shouted. Navy and Marines got moving. Jason came out of the large house, spotted her, and began a slow jog toward Chris. As emaciated as the man was, still, 
he put one foot in front of the other until he came to hang on Chris's truck door. Listen, those guys use the swamps for their hideout. If you keep away from the worst of the swamps, you might avoid them. Chris called up her planned track on her battleboard and shared it with Jason. He shook his head. There, four, five miles down the road, you're headed into Dead Cow Swamp. You've got to go around. Can't. Chris found that she was grinning. Everything around that road is flooded. It's the only elevated road left. We're going right up it. They'll be waiting for you. I kind of hope so, Chris said, letting her grin take over her entire face. Grandpa Trouble would be proud. Just so you know what you're getting into, Jason said. Chris turned around, glancing down the line of trucks. Got no children? Only Navy and Marines. This is what we get paid for. Be careful, Lieutenant, or Ensign, or whatever you are. I thought I could take anything that came. God, I was wrong. I may have some photos for you and your wife to ID next week when we come through. You may not have to wait until this mess is over before you watch a few of them swing. Damn, I'm starting to like this. Oh, God, be careful. Not what they pay me for, Chris said, leaning out the window, looking back. All her troops were mounted up. Tom, move us out. Yes, ma'am. In the rear view, Chris watched as Jason went from group to group, saying something. Some of the women fell to their knees in the mud, hands clasped in prayer. Say your prayers for the bastards ahead of us, not for me and mine, Chris whispered through tightly drawn lips. Would you mind telling me what the hell is going on here? Tom asked, eyes locked straight ahead, hands in a white-knuckled grip on the steering wheel. I am your second in command, and I am supposed to take over if something happens to you. Chris popped her mic. Troops, you just saw why we're here. Those folks are starving because a bunch of thugs stole what they raised. They killed an old man and beat up his wife. They raped most of the women you saw back there. Raped echoed through the back seat like an electric shock. So, not everyone had gotten full disclosure. Well, they had it now. Even the little girls, Chris snapped. Some of you are tired of being glorified delivery boys. Maybe you could have stayed home and delivered pizza for what we've done so far. Well, I'm told that our road is going to get a bit dangerous in a few minutes. These cruds like to steal things, and our trucks are the only things on the road worth stealing today. Lock and load, crew. Payback time is here, and we'll do the collecting. Chris turned to Tom. While she talked, he had called up the route on the truck's display. Overlaying that with a photo, he stabbed a finger at Dead Cow Swamp. There? Looks it. Tom studied the map. We could double back about five clicks. There's that other road that stays to high ground. Looks flooded to me, Chris cut him off. We've got food to deliver. If we go wandering all over the place, we'll never make it back to base tonight. We could camp at one of the farm stations. Those folks are friendly. They'd be glad to have us stay a night. We've got other deliveries to make tomorrow. Tom, we are going up this road. I suggest you check your weapon. I've never seen you fire one. I qualified at OCS. I had to, to graduate. What did you shoot? The minimum required, Tom said, not looking at her. For God's sake, Tom, you're a Navy officer. You knew this was part of the job when you took it. You may have noticed. I'm driving a truck, delivering food to starving people. Didn't the priest back home preach, thou shalt not kill, every time there'd be a barroom fight in town and someone would be cut up? I joined the Navy to get my college loans forgiven, not to kill. Even men who rape and kill and steal food from starving kids, Chris spat. Tommy looked out over the sodden land. This wasn't what I had in mind, but it is what you've got now. Behind Chris, while she and Tom talked, the back seat got very quiet. What were they thinking? Did it matter? They had their orders. They would follow her. 
Why was she wasting time arguing with Tom? She had things to do. Again, she tapped her mic. Long knife here. Roll the windows down. We don't want flying glass in the cabs. Chris looked up, examining the front window. She spotted a release, hit it. The window on her side of the cab swung down to rest on the hood as the rain began to soak her. She told the rest of the convoy to do the same. For a long moment, they rode in silence, swaying from side to side as Tom hunted for more road and less pothole. Ma'am, came quietly from the back seat. Yes. It was not the expectant hero. He looked white as a sheet as he stared out the window. It was the young woman behind Chris. She'd been in the middle on the ride in. We can shoot these people? They'll be shooting at us, yes. We shoot back. My mama and the preacher, they always said death belonged to God. God and the doctors. That's why the gangs were wrong. Now you're saying it's okay to kill. You sure, ma'am? Chris had grown up a politician's daughter, where you did anything you had to do to win the next election. Grandpa Trouble had come in like some knight in shining armor, when she was so far down there was no up. She'd loved to read the history books about what he'd done in the war. He and Grandpa Ray, even Great Grannies Ruth and Rita were in the history books, fighting for what was right. Of course, Chris had learned, thou shalt not kill. But for her, it had never been absolute. True, rather than kill a spider, Harvey would take it outdoors to keep his wife happy. But he'd fought side by side with Grandpa Ray at the Battle at the Gap and was damn proud of it. As I hear it, Chris began slowly, hunting for the words that would release the safety on her trooper's souls. There's a time to build and a time to tear down. A time to live and a time to die. I say, if those men up there shoot at us, it's their time to die. Or they can throw their weapons down and their hands up and hang after the courts get done with them. Chris turned in her seat to study the three recruits behind her. They were pale. The guy in the middle licked his lips nervously. The girl fingered her weapon as if to see if it was real. The hero-to-be glanced at Chris, then went back to staring out the window. What those men did back there took them outside the bounds of humanity. If they shoot at us, we will kill them, like the wild dogs they've become. Those are your orders. You will execute them. If I'm wrong, I'll be the one that stands trial, not you. But they'll be just as dead, whether a court says you were right or wrong, the middle said. Kind of like the colonel, the woman agreed. This was not going the way Chris had expected. In the history books, there were no reluctant soldiers. Then again, these were Navy types, hardly out of boot camp. Maybe Chris ought to have the Marines pull their truck up closer to the front. Maybe I ought to rethink this whole thing. Chris swung around in her seat. While she talked, the open fields had given way to mangled trees and scrub. Some trees were down, big root balls standing in the still waters. Chris eyed the road ahead of them and what stretched out behind them. Just road and water. Probably a ditch alongside the road. How could she turn this parade around? Couldn't even if she wanted to. Licking her lips, she put that option aside. For better or worse, this convoy went forward. Chris concentrated on what lay ahead in the next few minutes. Had she done everything? What had she forgotten? That was supposed to be the perpetual question of the commander. What's left undone? She felt a rising panic. What had she missed? She didn't remember that being mentioned in the history books. Chris checked her gun, eyed the trees growing closer and closer to the road. She activated her mic again. Crew, we can expect our targets to be hiding behind trees. Your rifles have range finders that automatically set the charge for your darts. They'll set them too low to shoot through tree trunks. Turn your selector to maximum. Ma'am, came a shaky voice. Which switch is that? The forward one, Chris answered. 
then thought better. The one closest to the end of the barrel, ahead of the selector for sleepy darts. Thank you. The automatic civility seemed out of place at the moment. Anything smacking of civilization seemed wrong just now. Chris started to say that, then swallowed hard as the truck came around a curve. The trees that had blocked her view ahead now fell away to Chris's right. Ahead, two, maybe three hundred meters, a tree lay across the road. Chris took the scene in quickly. There was no root ball on this down tree. A freshly cut stump stood beside the road. Chris switched the sights on her rifle to thermal. Yes, three people lay behind the downed log. Chris quickly scanned the woods to the left and right. Yes, more thermal images, a dozen. Twenty. A lot. Chris remembered the man's story, people rising up out of the water. She tried to scan the ditch alongside the road. Some of the water seemed warmer than that around it, but the current in the ditch formed it into a long blur. Beside her, Tom was slowing. How close do you want to get, long knife? He asked through gritted teeth. Chris went through her options fast. Drive into the trap and stop. Let the bad guys shoot first, then take them. She had more people, correction. She had recruits. Her targets were desperate killers. Chris eyed the water ahead. Riflemen coming from the water had gotten the drop on the farmer. Stop here, she ordered. Tom braked slowly to a stop in the middle of the muddy road, a good 200 meters from the downed tree. For a long minute, Chris watched the roadblock as nothing happened. Throw down your guns and nobody gets hurt, blared over the swamp, sending birds squawking and flapping into the leaden sky. Chris scowled. She was about to say the very same thing. Well, that settled the question of intent. Chris sighted her rifle at the rightmost thermal shadow behind the down tree. She chinned her mic. Open fire, crew. Obeying her own command, Chris sent a long burst into the tree, walking the darts from right to left. Someone tried to get up, run away. He didn't get very far. Chris switched her concentration to the ditch to the left of the road and sent a long burst into any water that looked warm. A man stood in a shower of bubbles and spray, started to aim at Chris. He fell backward as her rounds took him in the chest. Forms were slithering from the ditch to crawl up on the road to Chris's right. She slapped the door. As it came open, she dropped through it to settle into a squat beside the forward tire. She fired a quick burst at the closest of the gunmen, lying prone on the side of the road. He slumped over his rifle. She took aim at the next one. He tossed his gun away, rolled over on his back, and held his hands up in the air. Throw away your guns and you live, Chris heard her voice boom over the swamp amid the rattle of guns. Keep them and you're dead. Five, six people along the road edge were on their knees, hands up. Chris swept her rifle sights along the trees to her right. People were standing, hands waving high in the air. She glanced over her shoulder. The left-hand side of the convoy looked the same. You. Chris snapped at the woman recruit, still in the back seat of the truck. Put those prisoners under guard. Yes, ma'am. The woman's voice was a ragged whisper. She stumbled as she got out of the truck. Chris flinched away from her rifle, then realized that was the least of her fears. The woman still had the safety on her weapons. Unsafety your rifle, Chris whispered. She got a blank look in reply. Chris reached across, flipped the safety off. Now it will shoot. The spacer recruit glanced down. Oh, and went back to waving her weapon unsteadily at their prisoners. You, in the swamp, walk to the road slowly, Chris ordered. No sudden moves. Those of you on the road, get up here in the middle of it and lie down. Chris glanced in the truck. Tom was just getting his rifle out of its holster on the door. 
The would-be hero and his friend were frozen in place, eyes and weapons covering the left side, but doing nothing. Are you okay? Chris asked. When they didn't respond, she repeated, Are you okay back there? The hero-to-be blinked twice and was violently ill. From the back of the convoy, two Marines advanced with their weapons at the ready. At least their boot camp seemed to have taught them to take the safety off their weapons. Cover this side, she shouted to them. They waved fists in agreement. Switching around to the left of her convoy, Chris found three Marines coming forward, keeping their weapons leveled at the slowly moving prisoners. I got that one, a Marine chortled. No, I got him, the one beside him disagreed. No, I was shooting at that bunch in the tree. The Marine indicated a clump of trees. One body was flung backward over a low snag. So was I, buddy boy, I got him. You both got him. Chris cut off further debate. Keep the others covered. I don't want any getting away. One of the prisoners picked that moment to trip. He went over with a splash. Chris waited for him to get back up, but he didn't. Switching to thermal sights, Chris searched the water, but it was too mixed up to give any kind of target. I think one of them is getting away, Tom observed as he dismounted the truck. Chris scowled. You prisoners, be careful. The next one of you that trips gets shot on the way down. But they're unarmed, the woman spacer behind Chris said. They're escaping, Chris pointed out. And until we check them out, we don't know who's unarmed. You spacers in the trucks, get out here. I need some hands to pat down the prisoners for weapons. The rest of the trucks began to empty. The recruits brought their weapons, but about half of them still had their safety on. Most of the other guns didn't look like they'd need cleaning. Now Chris realized why the fight had seemed so quiet around her. She and the Marines had been the only ones shooting. Them and the bad guys. Pairs of Navy recruits went down the slowly forming line of prisoners. While one kept a rifle on a prone figure, an unarmed recruit frisked the captive, making sure they were no longer armed. Hey. This one's a girl, a spacer said, taking two steps back from the muddy figure he had started to pat down. The woman's response was in no way ladylike. Chris waved a female spacer over to frisk that prisoner and paused to watch as the pile of gear taken from the prisoner slowly grew. No communications gear, no computers, plenty of knives, and usually one gun each. Little ammo, though. The prisoners, stripped to their shorts in most cases, showed thin and hungry. Not the starvation level of the farm people, but even the bad guys had been on short rations. Bad girls, too. Four of the 14 were women. Chris turned from the live ones to study the dead. Behind the roadblock, two lay, insects already settling to feast. Chris swallowed hard to keep her own stomach where it belonged. One face was contorted in death. Rage, anger, agony. Chris could not tell, and the dead were not likely to answer her question. The one next to him seemed asleep on his side, quietly drawn up like a child. He provided the only calm link among them. The third rifleman was gone, just a pool of blood showing he'd been shot. Back in the trucks, a medic was caring for his wound. He'd be in fine shape for the hanging. Chris walked back up the road. Two more bodies lay between the ditch and the roadbed. You and you. She pointed at two prisoners, the youngest among them, hardly more than boys of 15, 14. Pick up these bodies, hang them by their feet from those trees, she said, pointing to the four standing next to the freshly cut stump. Tom was at her side in a moment. It's not right to dishonor the dead. And leaving them down here to be gnawed by whatever wanders by is better than hanging them up there as a warning to the rest? I am not taking time to dig a hole here and bury them. She glanced up and down the road. No place to dig anyway. Still, Tom shook his head. Chris, 
This is out of bounds. You two, start doing what I told you. Marine, see that these two do what they're ordered. The assigned Marine nudged the two boys to their feet with his rifle. They'd been dead fish belly pale before. Now they were almost ghostly white. Terrified ghosts. Chris turned to Tom. Tape the live prisoners' hands and load them on the trucks. Once they're down, tape their feet to something on the truck. I'm not losing any prisoners. Yes, ma'am. Tom snapped to a caricature of attention, threw her a parody of a salute, and stomped off to comply. And send me any wrapping tape or rope you've got free, Chris called after him. If it was possible, Tom stomped harder. Half an hour later, the convoy moved slowly past Chris's stark message to the denizens of the swamp. A new team was in town. Get out before you join these. At least, that was the message Chris wanted them to hear. The next farm on their list was empty of life. A few bodies still lay where they'd fallen or been cast aside. Guess this is what happened to a farm that fought, Chris observed dryly to Tom, as they slowly drove through the farmyard. Maybe she isn't such a bitch, someone muttered on a live mic. Chris chose not to hear. The next farm was a repeat of the first. Chris distributed the food quickly, neither asking how they had come to be in this fix, nor offering to listen to the silent screams behind dry eyes. She did refuse to let any of her troopers turn their backs on their prisoners long enough for the farmers to get quick vengeance. They are Navy prisoners. I will turn them over to local officials at Port Athens. You can get your justice there, she snapped when the knife-wielding wife of the farm owner had to be forcibly hauled from one of the trucks. You think you can get them back there? Her husband asked. I capture them, I keep them. Good luck. You know, they're not the only band out here. How many? Couple of hundred. Who are they? Tom asked. What turned them rogue? Ask them, the owner spat. Two farms later, the trucks were sitting higher on their axles, but Chris was no closer to understanding the dynamics of what made someone a killer and another the starving victim. She didn't like that. She also was getting a bad feeling about her route back to Port Athens. The last farm was the smallest on her list, but it had three times the people of the others. They seemed less brutalized. At least, there was no effort to knife her prisoners. Two women even went from prisoner to prisoner, giving them a drink of water, a taste of the rations. The owner was a lanky, middle-aged man who stood aside and let his people organize themselves to quickly unload the trucks into bunkhouses and several small houses, including one he shared with two other couples and a dozen children. By now, Chris's team had their drill down, so Chris and Tommy joined him watching. Much appreciate the food. We've been down to eating grass and leaves. You've got an awful lot of people, Chris asked, not quite knowing what the question was. Yeah, I didn't let go of my indentured workers when the crop failed. Where would the poor bastards go? Indentured workers? That was the great thing about being a boot ensign. All the time you were learning new stuff. Yeah, New Eden slashed its welfare budget a few years back. Get a job or get a ticket to Olympia or a couple other new colonies where the fields aren't big enough for agribusiness. And they'd work for you, Tommy said. No, they'd work to pay off their ticket. For one year's work, I'd pay for a seventh of the ticket. Seven years and you're free and clear. The man squatted down to pluck a blade of grass. He eyed it like someone might a vintage wine before sticking the end of it in his mouth. Of course, the poor damn workfair types got no grub steak, no cash. The lucky ones end up working in town at the processing plants. We're feeding them out of soup kitchens, Chris told him. I wondered how they were making out, the man said. Chris did a quick count around the farmyard. 
lots of kids, lots of old, lots of in-between. You had a lot of firepower when the gunman came. Gunman didn't come here. Smart of them, Chris grinned. Tommy frowned. Then how come you went off the net? Windmills died. No power, the man shrugged. We'll leave you some batteries, Chris said. Tom nodded. But why were you the only farm not attacked? The guy looked at Chris like she was a very slow learner. Woman, you still don't know who the swamp runners are, do you? You kept your indentured workers, Chris repeated slowly, then saw where that led. The other farms didn't. Yep, the folks in the swamps are unemployed field hands. Yep, he kind of smiled. Tommy blinked rapidly for a long moment as his mouth slowly opened. So the raping, the stealing, the killing was all done by folks that had worked for the farm owners? The guy looked up at Tommy. Maybe, maybe not. Chris stooped down beside the farmer. He offered her a strand of grass. She sucked on it. There wasn't much taste. Probably not much food value. Then she'd eaten a full ration in the truck jostling along between farms. Lack of food was not her problem. People were. As Tommy sat down, his eyes wide with puzzlement, Chris shook her head. You can't tell me that a bunch of ex-welfare types who've been doing grunt work out in the fields here stole the idents, fenced them off world, and in some cases, sold entire farms. For a navy type, you're not too dumb, kid, the farmer smiled. Cops on Eden sweeping up welfare flakes might pick up a few extras. Punks, thugs, mafioso wannabes, troublemakers they'd like to be rid of. Problem child wakes up on the ship, already under boost. That's one that won't bother those cops again. Bright boy lands here, we put him to work along with the others. Maybe he works, maybe he sets up a floating crap game. Somebody always has something to risk. Then he brings in the alcohol, maybe some drugs too. <laughs> no matter how poor folks are, they seem to find money for that. The man shook his head. And when all hell comes calling, Chris took up the story. The likes of him can see their ticket out of here. Right. Collect some tough henchmen, some guns. Go find the folks starving in the swamp. Promise them a meal if they'll help you get back at the folks that put them down in the mud. You know the rest of the story. Tommy shook his head. But the raping. Not always just the big men and the henchmen. Some of the hands have a lot of anger but there's a few women I've taken in whose brothers or husbands tried to stop it. They got a bullet or beat up for the trying. Chris eyed her prisoners. Somehow, they seemed less loathsome. Think I have any kingpins or henchmen here? I don't know. Some of my folks still have family in the swamps. Maria, who was giving your prisoners water, has a boyfriend out there. Chris frowned at the farmer. He shook his head. Milo has a job here any time he wants it. Sad part is, he also has a kid brother who thinks being a gunman is what being a man is all about. Milo's trying to keep the kid out of trouble until he can talk him down. What about these? Tom waved at the prisoners. What will happen when we turn them into the authorities at Port Athens? Don't know. Even if they aren't murderers or rapists, they were running with them. The people that'll be sitting on the juries are gonna be desperate, scared, and mad. Doesn't make for a good combination where justice is concerned. So much for the search for truth, Tommy sighed. Chris nodded, but she was replaying her little skirmish in the swamp. I shot the gunman behind the roadblock tree first off, including the man with the megaphone. I got the first ones out of the water on both sides. And after that... The rest didn't fight much, Tommy nodded. Most seemed ready to break and run. What's that make our prisoners guilty of? Being as hungry as their victims. Looking the other way when the toughs get their jollies. Damn, 
and Santa Maria, no man touches a woman that doesn't want it. A man gets that wrong, and any man or woman in hearing will help him learn that lesson fast. Pain ran across Tommy's face as he shook his head. My priest taught me, a poor man has a right to steal a rich man's bread to feed a starving family. He didn't have much of an answer when I asked about poor stealing from the poor. Damn, Chris, this is a hell of a mess. But nobody touches a woman. No man doesn't answer a woman's call for help. He glanced at the trucks, now loaded only with prisoners. Damn, this is a mess you've gotten me in, Long Knife. Chris only half listened to Tommy's moaning about who was right and who was guilty. She had a bigger problem. She'd pissed off a lot of bad guys with guns. Now what do you do, smart girl? How are you getting back to town? The man asked. Up the road, Chris waved absentmindedly. Through Wildebeest Wallow? Chris pulled out her reader and shared her map with him. The road went fairly straight through a grove of trees, surprisingly well-kept trees, now that Chris looked at them. The farmer pointed at them with pride. That used to be a bit of swamp. We planted walnut trees in there to build up the land, change the acidity of the soil. In another couple of years, I can cut them down and double my acreage. Since there didn't seem to be a lot of standing water, I thought it would be a safe route home. The farmer shook his head. Been a lot of trucks going that way this afternoon. I think you kicked over a hornet's nest. If people like you and your food convoy can run around free hereabouts, won't be long before the police come looking for the likes of them. Maybe they can buy a ticket off planet. Maybe they don't want to. Maybe some of them think they've got enough money to buy this mud ball. I hear that squatters are already moving onto some of the farms, the ones that got shut up when they fought back. We didn't see anybody at the Sullivan place, Chris told him, mouth running while her thinking was still elsewhere. One of the McDowells found that their farm had been sold off planet to someone using their eye dents. Seems the history books are full of this year's bandit being next year's revolutionary and an established politician the year after that, Tommy observed dryly. Yeah, nobody's very demanding of a rebel leader's credentials, Chris agreed. But that was next year's problem. Right now, Chris had to survive today. How many riflemen would you say were headed for that grove of trees? Maybe 200, the farmer said. Every one they got. How many of those do you think are ringleaders and their bully boys? 30, maybe 40. Problem will be separating the two, Chris muttered. The rain started getting heavy again. The last few hours had been just gray and misty. She tapped her comm link. HQ, this is Ensign Longknife. I need to talk to the colonel. Wait, one, was the reply. The wait was a lot less than the full minute. Let me guess, Ensign. You want some more advice? Seems that way, sir. What's your situation? Chris reported on her earlier skirmish and what looked to be building up ahead of her. She emphasized the divided nature of the opposing force. I'd been hearing stories that some of the worst problems might be just hungry folks the local establishment here didn't view as deserving poor, the colonel drawled. You came up with some pretty cagey ideas here in town for feeding everyone, no questions asked. The level of violence went down as the number of full bellies went up. Think we can do the same out there? Doubt it, sir. The murder and rapes out here have people polarized but good. A lot of them just want payback. Like me. You've got yourself a tough tactical problem, Ensign, was his crisp reply. It was nice not to face one of Father's rants about responding with her emotions rather than thinking with her head. Doesn't help that I won't know where it is until it starts shooting at me, Chris answered staying on the present problem, not rehashing a past that couldn't be helped. I'd give my right arm just now for a stool pigeon. I figured you might be asking my advice at a time like this. Stool birds are too fragile for weather like this. But a big old spy eye can fly in a damn near hurricane. 
I ordered one out of storage on Wardhaven, almost a museum piece. It arrived last night. I'll have it over you in an hour. Thank you, Colonel. Chris breathed in half a prayer. Don't thank me until you've got yourself home. Any suggestions, sir? None that you haven't already thought of. Try not to get any of your people killed. Try not to kill any more civilians than you have to. You know the usual crap. Now, if you'll excuse me, I got a spy eye to launch. And I may be the only one here old enough to remember how to wind up the rubber band. Hancock, out. Chris glanced around slowly, reviewing her assets, and none too happy. Sleepy darts gave her the option to shoot them all and sort them out later. But the wind was kicking up. Low-powered sleepy darts would be blown all over the place and hit nothing. Face it, princess, this is going to be a live fire exercise. Hunching her shoulders against the rain, Chris stood. Tom, let's mount him up. Tom got to his feet, shook himself, glanced around. I think I'm glad this problem is yours, he muttered. As he strode toward the trucks, he began the usual patter. You heard the boss, gal? We're out of here. Truck leaders, mount your teams. It didn't take long. The civilians gathered for a celebration. Some of the recruits looked to have gotten invited. But when their leaders hollered, they came. Tom was standing beside the lead truck, watching as the other ones filled up when Chris joined him. So, what's it going to be? We going to use the colonel's spy eye to go around these guys? Or are we going to kill some more rapists? What would you think of a fight? Tom blew out a long breath. There's 200 of them. There's only 30 of us, and we showed what a great bunch of berserkers we are this morning. Still, my da would whip my butt if I didn't come when a woman hollered for help. But my grandmother would be most disappointed if I didn't come home. Tell me, Ensign Longknife, what are we going to do? The only thing we can do, fight the ones that want to fight. Let the rest run if they will. Even if they're rapists, even if they looked the other way. We need to break the back of the bad guys. I want to get us home safe. I can't afford to worry about anything else. If we wanted to get home safe, we'd go around this bunch, Tom pointed out. We've got to break them. Chris would not give on that. It will be easier doing it when they're all together. Tom shook his head. They'll massacre us. Half of us didn't get our damn safeties off. Most of the rest didn't have the stomach to shoot. At least this morning it was 30 of us against 20 of them. Now there's 200 of them. That was this morning. We've been there once. Now we're veterans. Tom looked at her like she was crazy. Or maybe I've just learned a few tough lessons. Listen, Tom. We have to do this. Tom looked at her for a long moment. Then, with a rattling sigh, he said, Didn't me da warn me? You take the king's coin, he gets you body and soul, and you do what you're told. Tom turned and went to his side of the truck. Chris pulled herself up onto the running board, tried to shake as much water as she could from her poncho, and settled into the place with a smile of encouragement for the three recruits in the back. They were wriggling out of their ponchos, getting ready for a long ride back to base. The woman glanced at Chris, noticed that she was not doffing her slicker. The recruit's eyes grew wide. The friendly chatter that had started in the back seat fell to silence as the men followed her glance to Chris. Oh, shit, the failed hero snorted. Marines, I want truck six up behind me, Chris spoke softly into her mic. That mean you're gonna have some targets for us, ma'am? We'll be stopping a few clicks down the road to talk about that, Chris advised everyone on net. Silence came back to her. The five trees stood alone beside the road, open fields giving Chris a good view of anyone approaching. Their bedraggled canopy gave some protection from the rain. Chris gathered her crew around her by truck teams. They came quietly. She waited until they stood around her. Then she told them to take a seat. She wanted them comfortable. Besides, it was harder to run when you were sitting down. Between us and the port, are about 200 bandits, Chris said bluntly. There were low whistles and bitter swearing at her announcement. The good news is that not all of them are armed, 
and most of the rest aren't really interested in opposing us. Thirty, maybe forty of them are looking for a fight. The others are just part of the crowd that's hungry and wants to eat. You saw this morning how hard our prisoners fought once their leaders were down. That got Chris several thoughtful nods. Chris quickly filled her team in on the makeup of their opposition. So, most of them are just hungry farmhands the farm owners here tossed out when things got hard, Courtney said. Most, not all. The guys who sold the idents off planet, the toughs that are their enforcers, those guys can't have us moving freely here. If we show everyone that we can, they lose, and civilization starts to win again on Olympia. Chris paused to let that sink in. Then she took a deep breath. I made a mistake this morning. I threw you into the middle of a firefight without preparing you for it. Some of you may have heard about the hostage rescue op I ran a few weeks ago. That got nods. Me and my team had four days to prepare for that. And most of her Marines were four- or six-year vets. No need to mention that. I should have given you more time to get ready, to familiarize yourself with your weapon. It's one thing to be issued a rifle. It's another thing to be comfortable with the idea of using it. That's why we stopped here. I'm assigning a Marine to each truck team of Navy recruits. I want the Marine and your petty officer to take you through all the switches and doodads on your rifle. Yeah, they did that in boot camp. But how many of you ever thought you'd need to use a piece of obsolete technology like this? She said, grinning as she hefted her rifle. I don't know about you, but I did some quick studying when I pulled the short straw and found myself stuck with a night drop and hostage rescue. That drew nervous laughs. Finally, I want each of you to fire a full clip of darts. There's nothing like the feel of a rifle actually kicking back against your shoulder, the sight of darts hitting what you aimed at. It lets you know you can really do this. Chris paced off two steps, made them move their heads to follow her. One last thing. I'm assigning the Marines and petty officers the responsibility for putting down the boss men among the bandits and their thugs. The job for the rest of you is to put rounds in the air, in the ground, knocking splinters out of trees. Show anyone willing to cut and run that now would be a good time to do just that. Put the fear of the Navy in them. You send the hungry ones running and the Marines and your petty officers will put down the ones that need it real bad. If we see someone not running, can we shoot them too? Have at them. Just anyone who shows you their back, let them run. Where can they run to, ma'am? I think the last farm would be glad to take them in. The troops glanced around at their other team members. Some actually had nervous smiles for one another. Quiet. We can do that. Yeah, that's not too hard. If they run, let them. That's okay. Chris let that sink in for a moment, then sent each truck team to its own corner of the small wood. Tom seemed actually happy to take the lead for truck one. Chris moved from one team to another, observing, encouraging, stomping firmly on one Marine who exuded the impression that his survival of the Corps basic training gave him the right to lord it over his Navy students. The next Marine had a better handle on training. Weapon skill was a light to be shared, not a hammer to belabor the student. Chris stood beside her hero wannabe as he sent rounds into a clump of weeds 200 yards out. Good shooting, she said. Not bad for a coward, he spat into the rain. I don't see a coward. I locked up this morning, didn't do a damn thing. How long did that shoot last? Nine, ten seconds? I don't know. Seemed like forever, the guy said, staring at his rifle. I checked my rifle's computer. 9.7 seconds from first shot to last. Didn't give a hero or coward much time to react. This time, I'll see that you get more time going in. Then you tell me which you are, coward or hero. You think so? I wouldn't have you wasting my ammunition if I didn't. How many rounds you shoot in boot camp? I was only halfway through, ma'am, when they pulled me off for this. Never did get to shoot. Damn. Chris suppressed a snarl at herself. I should have rechecked this crew's records before I took them on the road.
Now you have fired a rifle. What do you think of it? It's sweeter than any sim. Then keep shooting, Chris said, and continued her walk. By the time each recruit, including the Marines, had fired off a clip, there was an air of confidence mixing with the rain. As rifle practice finished up, the first spy-eye coverage of the problem woods came in. It showed a lot of thermal images and human heartbeats. At least this bunch of robber barons hadn't thought to invest in high tech. Thank God the colonel had arranged for the spy-eye. While the last rounds were fired, Chris and Tom studied the enemy's array. Sloppy, Chris concluded. They're expecting us to come right up the road. Yes, Tom agreed, but this bunch seems a bit smarter than the last. They haven't cut down a tree. They want us to drive into the trap before they start shooting. Chris shrugged. So, we make their trap into our trap. As she turned back to the trucks, her eyes fell on one of their dejected prisoners, leaning half out of the back, trying to catch water on his tongue. Tom, we're going into a fight. POWs cannot be subjected to hostile fire. Tie them to the trees here. If things work out, we'll come back and get them. Otherwise, I'll call that last farm, tell him to come pick them up. Any he wants to offer a job to, we'll call it even. Any he wouldn't hire, I'll pick up next week. Tommy eyed the prisoners for a moment, then brought his hand up in salute. Yes, ma'am. Now. Let's put it to some real bastards, Chris said, returning the salute.